You will come with me, old man. Oh, I'd be tickled to death to come with you, Zipnab said cheerfully, if you were going anywhere. But you're not. Your ship, you see. His gaze shifted to the sky. Exar's ship was lifting above the treetops, sailing away. The Lord was momentarily astounded. Then he swiftly cast a spell, a spell that should have taken him instantly on board. The runes flared on his body. He started to leap forward through time and space, but fell back as if he'd struck a wall. Sartan magic. He tried again, only to run into the invisible barrier. Furious, Exar rounded on the old man, set to cast a spell that would wither the flesh from the fragile bones. The imposing gentleman, dressed all in black, stepped out of the shadows. He was bloody and disheveled, his clothes torn, and he looked exhausted. But he took hold of Exar's wrist in his, gripped it with a strength that the Lord of the Nexus, with all his magic, could not break. Leave him alone, said the gentleman. He's not responsible. Your friend, the serpent, the one you know as Sangdrax, he escaped me. He's the one who is blocking your magic. He's the one stealing your ship. I don't believe you. The Lord's ship was now nothing more than a speck in the sky. He's taken your form, Lord of the Nexus, said the gentleman. Your people think Sangrax is you. They'll obey all his commands, and he'll probably repay them with death. If what you say is true, then he must have some urgent need for the ship. Exar said confidently, trying to calm himself, though he cast a swift and frowning glance at his disappearing vessel. The gentleman was speaking to Zifnab. You don't look well, sir. Not my fault, the old man said, pouting. He pointed an accusing finger at Exar. I told him I was Bond, James Bond. He didn't believe me. What else did you tell him, sir? The gentleman asked, looking severe. Nothing you weren't supposed to, I take it? Well, now, that depends said Zifnab, rubbing his hands together nervously, not meeting the gentleman's eye. We did have such a nice chat. The imposing gentleman nodded gloomily. That's what I feared. You've done damage enough for one day, sir. Time to go inside and have your warming drink. The human female will be happy to make it for you, sir. Of course she'd be happy to make her day, but she won't, Zifnab whined querulously. She doesn't know how. No one makes it the way you do. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm very sorry, sir, but I won't be able to fix your drink tonight. The gentleman had gone extremely pale. He managed a wan smile. I'm not feeling very well. I'll just take you to your bedchamber, sir. Once they were gone, Exar could give vent to his anger. He glared around the city's walls, walls that were suddenly prison walls. For though he could walk out of that gate with ease, not counting the titans, which were suddenly the least of his worries, he had no ship, no way to travel back through Death's Gate, no way to reach Haplo, either dead or alive. That is, if he believed what the old man had told him. Feeling weak and old and tired, unusual feelings for the Lord of the Nexus, Exar sat down on a bench in the strange gathering darkness that appeared to be falling on the citadel and nowhere else. Exar tried again to reach Marit, but there was no answer to his urgent summons. Had she betrayed him? Had Sangrax betrayed him? Would you believe my enemy? The whisper came from the night, startling Exar. He stared into the shadows, saw glowing there a single red eye. Exar rose. Are you here? Come out where I can see you. I'm not here in actual physical presence, Lord. My thoughts are with you. I had much rather my ship was with me, Exar said angrily. Bring my ship back to me. If you command, Lord, I will, Sangrax was humble. But may I present an alternate plan? I overheard the conversation between you and that old fool, who may not be as foolish as he would have us believe. Allow me to search for Haplo while you go on with your business here. Exar pondered. Not a bad idea at that. He had too much to do, too much at stake to leave now. His people were on Aberach, poised for war. He had to continue looking for the seventh gate, and he still needed to determine whether he had learned the art of bringing life to the dead. Several of those goals might be accomplished here. In addition, he would find out whether Sangrax was loyal. He was beginning to see the outline of a plan. If I agree to let you search for Haplo, how do I return to Abarak? Exar demanded, not wanting Sangrax to think he had the upper hand. Another ship is available to you, Lord. The Mench know its location. Probably inside the city somewhere, Exar reasoned. Very well, 
The Lord gave his permission magnanimously. I will let you know the moment I hear from Merritt. Meanwhile, do what you can to find him on your own. Remember, I want Haplow's corpse, and in good condition. I live only to serve you, Lord Exar, Sangrax said humbly. The single eye closed in reverence, and then the presence was gone. Excuse me, sir, came a voice speaking Elvin. Exar had been aware of the young elf's presence for some time, but absorbed in his mental conversation with Sangrax, he hadn't paid any attention. Now was the moment, however, to start putting his plan into action. The Lord of the Nexus gave an affected start of surprise, peered through the shadows. I beg your pardon, young man, I didn't hear you come up. What was your name again? Forgive me for asking, but I'm old and my mind wanders. Pathan, said the elf kindly. Pathan Quindinier. I came back to apologize for the way we behaved. We've all been under a lot of strain lately. And then, what with the dragon and that horrible serpent and Ziphnab? That reminds me, have you seen the old man lately? No, I'm afraid not, Ixar answered. I must have dozed off. When I woke up, he was gone. Pathan looked alarmed. He glanced around anxiously. Oh, and take him, the crazy old bugger. I wonder where he's got to. No good searching for him tonight, though. You must be tired and hungry. Please, come, share dinner with my sister and me. We, uh, usually eat with the others, but I don't suppose they'll be joining us tonight. Why, thank you, my boy. Exile reached out a hand. With assisting me, I'm somewhat feeble. Oh, certainly, sir. Pathan offered Exile his arm. The Lord of the Nexus clasped the elf close to him, and together, the elf supporting the Lord's faltering steps, they proceeded slowly along the streets toward the citadel. And while they were walking, Exar received a response to his summons. Merit, he said silently, I have been waiting to hear from you. Chapter 27 Lost Merit sat with her back against a chill stone wall, watching the human assassin keep watch over her. He was leaning back against the wall opposite, a pipe in his mouth and a most foul-smelling smoke issuing from it. His eyelids were closed, but she knew that if she so much as brushed a strand of hair out of her face, she'd see the black glitter of his deep sunken eyes. Lying on a pallet on the floor between the two, Haplo slept fitfully, uneasily, not the healing sleep of her kind. Beside him, another set of eyes kept careful watch, dividing their attention between her and the master. Hugh the Hand sometimes slept. The dog never did. Growing irritated at the unrelenting scrutiny, Marrot turned her back on both the watchers, and hunkering down began to hone her dagger. It didn't need honing, nor did it need the sigler redrawn. But the dagger gave her something to do besides pacing the chill floor, around and around, around and around, until her legs ached. Perhaps, though she didn't really expect it, if she quit watching them, the watchers might relax and grow careless. She could have told them they were worrying over nothing. She wasn't going to harm him, not now. Her orders had been changed. Haplow was to live. Knife sharpened, Marrot thrust it into a minute crack between two of the large blocks of white polished stone that formed the floors, walls, and domed ceiling of the strange room in which they'd been imprisoned. She slid the dagger along the crack, probing, testing for a weakness she knew wouldn't be there. Sartan runes were engraved on each block. Sartan runes surrounded her, were on the floor, everywhere she looked. The runes didn't harm her, but she avoided touching them. They made her nervous, uncomfortable, just as this room made her nervous and uncomfortable. And it was impossible to leave. She knew. She'd tried. The room was large, well lit, with a diffused white light that shone from everywhere at once, and nowhere in particular. A maddening sort of light. It was beginning to annoy her. There was a door, but it was covered with Sartan Sigler. And though again the runes didn't react when Marit came near... She was loath to touch the door they guarded. She couldn't read the Sartan writing. She'd never learned. Haplow could, though. She'd wait until he woke up to tell her what it said, since he was to live. Marrot made a vicious stab into the crack, levered the death of block in a completely futile attempt to wiggle the stone loose. It didn't budge. She was likely to break her dagger first. Angry, frustrated, and, though she refused to admit it, frightened, she snatched the dagger from the c and hurled it away. The blade skidded across the polished floor, caromed off the wall, and slid back to the center room. The assassin's eyes opened, two glittering slits. The dog lifted its head, regarded her warily. Marat ignored them both, turned her back on them. Is Haplow dead? No, Lord. I am afraid I failed in my... He is not dead. Has he escaped you? No, Lord. I am with him. Then why dead? A knife, she could have said. A cursed, sodden knife. He saved my life, she could have said. Saved it even though I tried to kill him. 
All these things she could have said. I have no excuse, Lord, was what she did say. I failed. Perhaps this task is too difficult for you, Marit. I have sent Sangrax to deal with Haplo. Where are you? Marit blushed again, hotly, at the memory of infilled reply. In a certain prison, Lord. Mm, prison? Are you certain? All I know, Lord, is that I am in a white room covered with sartan runes, and there is no way out. A sartan is here keeping guard on us. He is the one you describe, Lord, the one known as Alfred, a friend of Haplo's. This Alfred was the one who brought us here. Our ship was destroyed on Chalestra. The two are in this together, undoubtedly. Tell me what happened. He told the strange weapon with the sartan runes, the titan, the waters of Chalestra, the steering stone in her hands, the dragon snakes. We were brought here, Lord, by the Sartan. He brought you? How? He... he put foot in the gate. That's the only way I can describe it. I remember the water rising. The ship was breaking apart, our magic failing. I took hold of the steering stone. It was still dry, its magic still working. Images of the worlds flashed before my mind. I grasped the first I saw and clung to it, and death's gate opened for me. The water was washing over me, drowning me, drowning the magic... The gate began to close. The ship began sliding beneath the water. The dragon snakes were coiled around it. A serpent head through the wood dove straight for Haplo. I reached out, caught hold of him, and dragged him out of the creature's jaws. The horrible red eyes swiveled until they found me. The gate was cling fast, too fast for me to stop it. And then the gate stuck about halfway, as if thing had jammed it open. A bright light shone on me. Silhouetted against the light was the figure of a stooped and gangling man who was peering at us worriedly. He reached out his hands to Haplo. I hung on to him, and I was pulled through the gate. Just as it began to shut again, I fell and kept on falling. There had been something else, but it was a vague shadow on the fringes of her consciousness, and so she did not think it proper to mention it bizarre. It was unimportant anyway, nothing more than a voice, a kindly voice, saying to her, There now, I've got him. He's safe. You can let go. She remembered being relieved of a dragging weight and of sinking thankfully into sleep. What is the Sartan doing to you? Nothing, Lord. He comes and goes like a thief, creeping in and out of the room, he refuses to look at me or talk to me. The Sartan's only concern is for Haplo. And no, Lord, I have not spoken to the Sartan, or will I give him the satisfaction. True. It would make you look weak, vulnerable. What is this Alfred like? A mouse, a scared rabbit. I assume this is only his disguise, Lord, intended to lull me into a false sense of security. Undoubtedly you are right. I wonder one thing, though, wife. You saved Haplo's life on Telestra. You could have left him to die, it seems. Yes, I saved him, Lord. You wanted his corpse. No mention of the fact that the dragon snakes terrified her, that it had seemed likely she would die on Telestra along with Haplo. Exar trusted the dragon snakes. He knew them better than she. It was not her place to question. The dragon snakes would have brought him to me, Exar returned. But then I suppose you could not have known that. Describe this prison. She did so. An empty room made of polished white stone covered with sartan runes. And thus my magic will not work here, she said ruefully. I am surprised we are still able to communicate, husband. That is because such magic is internal. It does not attempt to reach into the possibilities. And thus the sartan magic does not affect it. As you say, Haplo will be able to read the sartan runes. He will know where you are. Or perhaps his friend will tell him. Haplo won't kill you, will he, since you tried to kill him? No, Lord, he will not kill me. It was well Exar could hear only words through the magic. He could not hear her sigh. Excellent. On second thought, I think it would be best if you stayed with him. Are you certain, Lord? Once I escape this place, I can find a ship. I know I can. I... No. Stay with Haplo. Report to me what he and his certain friends say to each other about this room, about Prion, about any of the other worlds. From now on, Marit, report to me everything Haplo says. Yes, Lord. She was now a spy, her final humiliation. But what am I to say to him? He'll wonder why I don't try to kill him. You slept with him. You bore his child. He loves you still. Do you need me to elaborate, my dear? No, she didn't. And that was how their conversation ended. Marit's stomach clenched. She was almost physically ill. How could Exar ask such a thing of her? To pretend to make love to Haplo. To ingratiate herself to him, cling to him, and while she was clinging, suck his blood like a leech. 
No, such an insidious scheme was dishonourable. No patron would agree to it. She was disappointed, bitterly disappointed in Exar, that he could even suggest such a repulsive... Her anger, her disappointment, seeped away. I understand. You don't think I would be pretending, she said softly to the absent Exar. I failed you. I saved Haplo's life. You think I am still in love with him, don't you, Lord? Otherwise you would never have asked me to do this. To be a way, another way, to convince Haplo that she was, if not exactly for him, at least no longer against him. Patron Law lifted her head, almost smiled, but checked herself with a stealthy glance at the Mensch assassin. He wouldn't do to look suddenly pleased with herself. She continued to sit quietly in the prison. She had no idea how long Alfred came and went. She watched him distrustfully. Hugh the Hand watched her distrust. The dog watched them all, with the exception of Alfred, distrustfully. And Alfred appeared extremely upset and unhappy about the whole thing. At length, bone-tired, Mara lay down to sleep. She had nearly drifted off when a voice jerked her to wakefulness. Haplo, how are you feeling? Hugh the Hand was asking the question. Marit shifted her position slightly so that she could see. Haplo was sitting up on his pallet, staring around in amazement. The dog, with a pleased bark, was on its feet, nosing its master eagerly. Haplo petted it, rubbed its muzzle and jowls. The animal's tail wagged furiously. How long have I been out? Haplo asked. Who knows? The hand answered with disgust. How can you tell in this place? I don't suppose you have any where we are now. Haplo glanced around again and frowned. I've seen some place like this before, but I can't remember. His gaze flicked over to Marit, held. He'd caught her staring at him, too late to try to pretend she was asleep. She stiffened, looked away. She was aware suddenly of her dagger lying in the middle of the floor, lying between them. Don't worry, Hugh the Hand grunted, following Haplo's gaze. Between the dog and me and Alfred, we haven't let her get close to you. Haplo propped himself up on one elbow. He was weak, far too weak for a patron who had been through the healing sleep. The wound on the heart rune, such a wound would have doomed him in the labyrinth. She saved my life, he said. Barrett could feel his eyes on her. She wished there was some place to hide in this damn room, some way to escape. She might even try the door, but she'd look a fool she couldn't break. Gritting her teeth, getting a tight hold on herself, sat up and pretended to be absorbed in lacing her boot. That what had just said was going to work to her advantage. The assassin grunted. Removing the pipe from his mouth, he knocked the bowl against the wall, dumped ashes on the floor. Haplosen shifted back to the human. Did you say Alfred? Yeah, I said Alfred. He's here, off somewhere getting food. He jerked a thumb at the door. Haplo took in his surroundings. Alfred. Now I remember what this place reminds me of. The mausoleum on Arianus. Marit, recalling Exar's command, listened carefully. The words meant nothing to her, but she felt a chill go over her. Mausoleum. It reminded her of Aberach, a world that was a mausoleum. Did Alfred say where we are? Hugh smiled, a terrible smile that tightened his lips, darkened his eyes. Alfred hasn't had much to say to me. In fact, he's been avoiding me. I'm not surprised. Haplo sat up straight, looked down at his hand, the hand that had picked up the cursed Sartan knife. It had been black, the flesh burned off. Now the arm was whole, uninjured. He looked over at her. Mallet knew what he was thinking as well as if he'd said it aloud. She was still close to him, and that irritated her. You track my thoughts like a wolfen tracks a wounded man, he'd said once, teasing her. What she had never told him was how closely he'd been able to track hers. At first she'd hungered for such closeness. One reason that she'd stayed with him so long, longer than any other man she'd ever been with before. But then she'd found herself liking him too much, counting on him, becoming dependent on him. And it was then she'd realized she was going to have his child. It was then she'd left. Bad enough knowing she'd lose him to the labyrinth, to have to face losing the child to be the one who leaves. Don't be the one left. It had become her credo. She looked at him and knew exactly what he was thinking. Someone has healed me. Someone has closed the circle of my being. He looked at her, wanting it to be her. Why? Why couldn't he realize it was over? The Satan healed you, she said to him, not me. Slowly and deliberately, she turned away again. 
which was all very well and all very dignified, but sometime soon she was going to have to explain that she wasn't out to kill him any more. Marit wove the runes, hoping to snare her dagger, which was still lying in the center of the floor. Her magic fizzled, petered out. The damn sartan magic in this dreadful room was unraveling her spells. Tell me what happened. Haplow had turned his attention back to Hugh the Hand. How did we get here? The human sucked on his pipe, which had gone out. The dog lay at Haplow's side, crowding as close as it could get, its eyes gazing anxiously into its master's face. Haplow gave it a reassuring pat, and it sighed and nestled even closer. I don't remember much, the hand was saying. Red eyes and giant serpents and you with your hand on fire. And terror. Being more afraid than I've ever been in my life. Or death. The assassin smiled wryly. The ship burst apart. Water filled my mouth and my lungs, and then the next thing I knew I was in this room on my hands and knees, heaving up my guts. And you were lying next to me, with your hand and arm like charred wood. And that woman was standing over you with her dagger, and the dog was about to go for her throat. And then Alfred came bumbling through the door. He said something to her in that strange language you people talk. And she seemed about to answer him when she toppled over. She was out cold. Alfred looked at you and shook his head. Then he looked at her and shook his head again. The dog had shut up by this time, and I'd managed to get onto my feet. I said, Alfred, and walked toward him. Only I couldn't walk very well. It was more of a lurch. The hand's smile was grim. He turned around and saw me and gave a kind of croak, and then he toppled over, and he was out cold. And then I must have passed out, because that's the last thing I remember. And when you came to? Aplo asked. Hugh shrugged. I found myself here. Alfred was fussing over you, and that woman was sitting over there watching, and she wasn't saying anything, and neither was Alfred. And I stood up and went over to Alfred. This time I made sure I didn't scare him. But before I could open my mouth, he was up like a startled gazelle and took off through that door, muttering something about food, and I was to keep watch until you came around. And that was a while ago, and I haven't seen him since. She's been here the whole time. Her name is Marit, said Haplow quietly. He was staring at the floor, running his finger around, but not touching, a certain sigil. Her name's Death, my friend, and you're the mark. Marit drew a deep, shivering breath. Might as well get it over. Not any longer, she said. Rising to her feet, she walked over, picked up her dagger from the stone floor. The dog leapt up, stood over its master protectively, growling. Hugh the Hand rose, too, his body supple, his movements swift. He said nothing, just stood there, watching her through narrowed eyes. Ignoring them both, Marit carried the dagger to Haplo. Kneeling down, she offered the dagger to him, hilt first. You saved my life, she said, cold, grudging. By patron law, that must settle any quarrel between us in your favor. But you saved my life, Haplo countered, looking at her with a strange intensity that made her extremely uncomfortable. That makes us even. I didn't... Marit spoke with scorn. It was your certain friend who saved you. What's she saying? Hugh the Hand demanded. She had spoken in the patron language. Haplow translated, adding, According to the law of our people, because I saved her life, any dispute between us is settled in my favor. I hardly call trying to murder you a dispute, Hugh said dryly, sucking on the pipe and eyeing Marit distrustfully. This is a ruse, don't believe her. Stay out of this, mensch, Marit told him. What do worms such as you know of honor? She turned back to Haplow. She was still holding the dagger up to him. Well, will you take it? Won't this put you in disfavor with Lord Exar? He asked, still looking at her with that penetrating intensity. She forced herself to keep her eyes on his. That's my concern. I cannot in honor kill you. Just take the damn dagger. Haplow took it slowly. He looked at it, turning it around and around in his hand, as if he'd never seen anything like it before in his life. It wasn't the dagger he was examining, it was her, her motives. Yes, whatever had once been between them was over. Turning around, she started to walk away. Marit, she glanced back. He held the dagger out to her. Here, you shouldn't go unarmed. Swallowing, jaw clenched, Marit stalked back, grabbed the dagger, slid it into the top of her boot. Hatler was about to add something... Marit was turning away so that she wouldn't have either to hear him or to respond, when they were all startled by a flash of rune light and the sound of a stone door creaking open. 
Alfred walked into the room, but when he saw them all staring at him, he started backing hastily out. Dog, Haplow ordered. Giving a full bark, the animal dashed forward. It caught hold of the sergeant's coattails and tugged the reluctant Alfred, tripping and stumbling, into the room. The door shut by him. Caught, Alfred cast a meek and unhappy glance at each of them, and then, with an apologetic smile and a slight shrug of his thin shoulders, he fainted. Chapter 28 Lost It took some time to restore Alfred, who appeared vastly reluctant to rediscover his consciousness. At length his eyes fluttered open. Unfortunately, the first thing he saw was Hugh the Hand looming over him. Hello, Alfred, the Hand said grimly. Alfred turned pale. His eyes rolled back in his head. The assassin reached down, caught hold of Alfred by his frayed lace collar. Faint again, and I'll choke you. No, no, I'm all right. Air, I need air. Let him up, Haplow said. Hugh the Hand released his grip, backed off. Alfred, gasping, staggered to his feet. His gaze fixed firmly on Haplow. I'm very happy to see you. Happy to see me too, Alfred, Hugh the Hand demanded. Alfred slid a swift glance in Hugh's direction, and was apparently sorry he'd done so because his gaze slid away again quite rapidly. Uh, certainly, Sir Hugh. Surprised? Surprised? Hugh bowled. Why are you surprised? Because I was dead that last time you saw me. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, now that I think of it, you were quite dead. Alfred flushed, stammered. You obviously made a, a miraculous re recovery. I don't suppose you'd know anything about that, do you? Me? Alfred raised his eyes to the level of Hugh's knees. I'm afraid not. I was rather busy at the time. There was the Lady Iridol's safety to worry about, you see. Then how do you explain this? Hugh the Hand ripped his shirt open. The sartan rune was visible on his breast, now glowing faintly, as if with pleasure. Look at it, Alfred. Look what you've done to me. Alfred raised his eyes slowly, reluctantly. He cast one stricken glance at the rune, then groaned and covered his face with his hands. The dog, whimpering in sympathy, trotted over and placed its paw gently on Alfred's over-large foot. Hugh the Hand glared in fury, then suddenly grabbed Alfred and shook him. Look at me, damn it! Look at what you've done! Wherever I was, I was content, at peace. Then you wrenched me back. Now I can't live, I can't die. End it! Send me back! Alfred crumpled, hung like a broken doll in Hugh's hands. The dog, squashed between the two, looked confusedly from one to the other, uncertain which to attack, which to protect. I didn't know I did it! Alfred was babbling, practically incoherent. I didn't know. You must believe me. I don't remember. You don't remember! Hugh the Hand punctuated each word with a shake that eventually drove poor Alfred to his knees. Haplow rescued the dog, which was in danger of being trampled, and then rescued Alfred. Let him alone, Haplow advised. He's telling the truth, as weird as that might sound. Half the time he doesn't know what he's doing, like changing himself into a dragon to save my life. Come on, Hugh, let him go. He's our way out. At least I hope he is. If we're trapped here, none of this is going to matter anyway. Let him go. Scarcely able to breathe around his rage, Hugh the Hand glowered, then finally threw the sergeant to the floor. Who's going to let me go? Turning on his heel, he walked to the door, flung it open, and left. Marrett, watching closely, noted with interest that the sergeant magic made no apparent attempt to stop the mensch. She considered following him just to escape this room herself, but instantly abandoned the idea. She couldn't leave Haplow. Her lord had commanded her to stay. Dog, go with him, Haplow ordered. The animal dashed off after Hugh the Hand. Haplow knelt down beside Alfred. Marrett took advantage of the confusion to fade quietly into the background, as much as she possibly could in this wide-open room. Alfred lay huddled on the floor in a heap, pitiful and pathetic. Marrett regarded him with scorn. This sartan didn't look as if he could raise bread dough, let alone raise the dead. Hugh the Hand must be mistaken. The sergeant was a middle-aged man with a bald crown and wispy hair straggling down on the sides of his head. He had a gangly, ungraceful body and large feet and hands, all of which appeared to think they belonged to someone else. He was clad in faded velvet breeches, a velvet coat that didn't fit, shabby hose, and a ruffled shirt decorated with tattered lace. Taking a frayed handkerchief from a torn pocket, Alfred began to mop his face. "'Are you all right?' Haplow asked gruffly with a kind of grudging concern. Alfred glanced up at him, flushed. Yes, thank you. He... he had every right to do that, you know. What I did, if 
I did it, and I truly don't remember doing it. It was wrong, very wrong. You recall what I said on Aberach about necromancy? He whispered the last word. When a life is brought back untimely, another dies untimely. I remember. But look, is there any way you can help him? Alfred hesitated a moment. He was about to answer no, it seemed. Then he sighed. His bony shoulders sagged. Yes, I think it would be possible. He shook his head. But not here. Then where? Do you remember the chamber on Aberach? The one they call the Chamber of the Damned? Yes, said Hapler, looking uncomfortable. I remember. I wanted to go back there. I was going to take Exar to prove to him what I meant about a higher power. Oh, dear, no! Alfred alarmed. I don't believe that would be at all wise. You see, I've discovered what that chamber is. Orla told me. Told you what? Haplow demanded. She was convinced that we had discovered the seventh gate, Alfred said softly in awed tones. Haplow shrugged. Yeah? So what? Alfred looked startled at this reaction. Then he sighed. I guess you wouldn't know at that. You see, when the Sardin sundered the world... Yes, yes, Haplow interrupted impatiently. Death's gate, the final gate. I've been through enough gates to last me a lifetime. What about this one? What makes it so special? That was where they were when they sundered it, Alfred said in a low voice. They were in the seventh gate. So Samma and Orla and the council got together in this chamber. More than that, Haplow, Alfred said gravely. They not only came together in the chamber, they imbued the chamber with magic. They tore apart a world and built four new ones from that chamber. Haplow gave a whistle. And it still exists, with all its magic, all its power. He shook his head. No wonder they put warding runes to prevent anyone's getting inside. According to Orla, Samma wasn't responsible for that, Alfred said. You see, when the magic was complete and the worlds were formed, he realized how dangerous this chamber could become. Worlds that could be created could also be destroyed. Precisely. And so he sent the chamber into oblivion. Why didn't he just destroy the chamber? He tried, Alfred said quietly, and he discovered he couldn't. The higher power stopped him? Alfred nodded. Afraid of what he'd tapped into, unable or unwilling to understand it, Sama sent the chamber away, hoping it would never be discovered. That was the last Orla knew of it. But the chamber was discovered by a group of Sartan on Aberach, a group desperately unhappy with what was happening to their own people. Fortunately, I don't believe they had any idea what they'd found. Yeah, all right, so we were in the seventh gate. What has any of this got to do with Hugh the Hand? I think that if he went into the seventh gate, he would be free. How? I can't be sure, Alfred answered evasively. Not that it matters anyway. We're not going anywhere. Haplow glanced around. Where the devil are we? And did you escape Sama? This place looks familiar, like that tomb on Arianus. I don't suppose we're back on Arianus. No, no, we're not on Arianus. Haplow waited patiently for the sergeant to continue. Alfred kept quiet. You do know where we are, Haplow asked dubiously. Alfred conceded the point with a reluctant nod. Then where are we? Alfred wrung his hands together. Let me think how best to explain. First, I must tell you that I didn't escape Sama. I'm not interested. Please, let me finish. Have you traveled through Death's Gate since it's been open? Yes, I went back to Arianus. Why? Images of each of the worlds flashed before your eyes, giving you a choice of where you want to go. Do you recall a world that was very beautiful? A world you've never visited, never seen? A world of blue skies, sunlight, green trees, vast oceans, an ancient, ancient world. Kaplow nodded. I saw that. I wondered at the time. That's where we are, said Alfred. The vortex. Kaplow looked around at the bare white marble. Blue sky. Sunshine. Wonderful. His gaze returned to Alfred. You're making even less sense than usual. The vortex, the center of the universe. Once it led to the ancient world, a world no longer in existence. True, but the images of it must have been accidentally retained or put there deliberately. A certain trap for someone traveling Death's Gate who shouldn't have been, Haplow said grimly. I damn near came here myself. Is this where I would have ended up? 
Yes, I'm afraid so. Although you'll find it's not bad once you get used to it. All our wants and needs are provided. The magic sees to that. And it's safe, perfectly safe. Hapler was looking around again. And to think I've been worrying about you in the labyrinth, picturing you dead or worse. And all the time you've been here, he waved his hand. Safe, perfectly safe. You were concerned about me? Alfred asked, his wan face brightening. Haplo made an impatient gesture. Of course I was concerned. You can't walk across an empty room without causing some sort of catastrophe. And speaking of empty rooms, how do we get out of this one? Alfred didn't reply. Lowering his head, he stared at his shoes. Haplo eyed him thoughtfully. Samma said he was sending you and Orla to the labyrinth. Either he made a mistake, or he wasn't quite the bastard he made out to be. He sent you both here. A thought seemed to occur to him. Where is Orla, anyway? Samma wasn't a bad man, Alfred said softly. Just a very frightened one. But he's not afraid any more. As for Orla, she left. She went to be with him. And you just stayed here? You didn't go with her? You could have at least gone back to warn the other Sartan on Chalestra. You don't understand, Haplo, Alfred said. I stay here because I have to. There is no way out. Haplo stared at him in exasperation. But you said all I left. Alfred began to sing the runes. His ungainly body was suddenly graceful, swaying and whirling to the rhythm of the song. His hands formed the sigla in the air. The melody was sad yet sweet, and Marit was suddenly reminded of the last time she'd held her baby in her arms. The memory hurt her, the song hurt her, and the pain made her angry. She was about to lash out to disrupt the magic spell he was casting, a spell that was undoubtedly meant to weaken her, when a portion of the stone wall disappeared. Inside the wall, lying in a crystal coffin, was a certain woman. Her face was quiet, her eyes closed. She seemed to smile faintly. Haplo understood. I'm sorry. Alfred smiled sadly. She is at peace. She left to join her husband. He shifted his gaze to Marit. His expression grew stern. Orla saw what happened to him. Saw how he died. He was executed for his crimes. Marit was defensive, defiant. He suffered as he made us suffer. He deserved what he got. More even, far more. Alfred said nothing. He cast a fond glance at the woman in the crystal coffin rested his hand on the window with a gentle touch. Then slowly his hand moved to another crystal coffin beside hers. This coffin was empty. What's that? Haplo demanded. Mine, Alfred said. When the time comes. You are right. This place is very much like Arianus. Too damn much, said Haplo. You've found another tomb. Perfectly safe, he snorted. Well, you're not crawling into it. You're coming with me. I'm afraid not. You're not going anywhere. I've told you, there's no way out. Alfred looked back at Orla, except her way. He's lying, Marit cried, fending off panic, fighting a sudden terrifying desire to tear at the solid stone with her bare hands. No, he's not lying. He's a certain he can't lie. But he's very good at not telling the truth, Haplo eyed Alfred. Death's Gate is around here somewhere. We'll go out through Death's Gate. We don't have a ship, Marit reminded him. We'll build one. Haplo kept his gaze on Alfred, who was once more staring at his shoes. What about it, Sarden? Death's gate? Is that the way out? The gate swings only one way, Alfred said in a low voice. Frustrated, not certain what to do, Haplo stared at the Sarden. Marit knew what to do. Leaning down, she slid the dagger from her boot. I'll make him talk. Leave him alone, Marit. You won't get anything out of him that way. I'll try not to damage your friend too much. You don't have to watch. Haplo stepped in front of her. He said nothing. He simply put his body between her and Alfred. Traitor! Marit tried to dodge around him. Haplo caught her, his movement quick and deft. He held on to her tightly. She was strong, perhaps stronger than he was at this moment, and she fought to escape. Their arms and hands locked, and as they held each other fast, a blue glow began to shimmer from each hand, each arm. The rune magic coming to life except that this magic wasn't acting either to attack or to defend. It was acting as it would when any two patrons touched. It was the magic of joining, of closing the circle. It was a magic of healing, of shared strength, shared commitment. It began to seep inside Marit. She didn't want it. She was empty inside, empty and hollow, dark and silent. 
She couldn't even hear her own voice anymore, just the echo of words spoken long ago coming back to her. The emptiness was cold, but at least it wasn't painful. She'd pushed out all the pain, given birth to it, cut the cord. But the blue glow, soft and warm, spread from Haplow's hand to hers. It began creeping into her. A tiny drop, like a single tear, fell into the emptiness. Haplow, you'd better come and see this. It was Hugh the Hand standing in the door. His voice was harsh, urgent. Distracted, Haplow turned. Marrett broke free of his grasp. He turned back to her, looking at her, and in his eyes was the same warmth she'd felt in the rune magic. His hand reached out toward her. She had only to take it. The dog came trotting up. Tail wagging, tongue lolling, it started toward her as if it had found a friend. Marrett threw her dagger at it. Her aim was rotten. She was upset, could barely see. The dagger grazed the animal along the left flank. The dog yelped in pain, flinched away from her. The dagger thudded against the wall somewhere near the assassin's right calf. Hugh put his foot on it. Alfred was staring in horror, so pale it seemed he might faint again. Marrett turned her back on them all. Keep that beast away from me, Haplo. By law, I can't kill you, but I can kill that damn dog. Come here, boy, Haplo called. He examined the animal's wound. It's all right, dog. Just a scratch. You were lucky. In case anybody's interested, Hugh the Hand said, I found the way out. At least I think it's a way out. You'd better come and look. I've never seen anything like it. Haplo glanced at Alfred, who had flushed bright red. What's wrong with it? Is it guarded? Magic? Nothing like that, the hand answered. More like a joke. I doubt it's a joke. The Sartan don't have much of a sense of humor. Someone did. The way out is through a maze. A maze, Haplo repeated softly. He knew the truth then, and Marat knew at the same moment Haplo knew. The emptiness inside her filled, filled with fear, fear that twisted and kicked inside her like a living thing. She was almost sick with it. So Samma did keep his word. Haplow said to Alfred. The Sartan nodded. His face was deathly white, his expression bleak. Yes, he kept it. He knows where we are? Hugh the Hand demanded. He knows, Haplow said quietly. He's known all along. The Labyrinth. Chapter 29 The Labyrinth They left the room of white marble and its crystal coffins, Following Hugh's lead, they traversed a narrow hallway carved out of grey, rough-cut rock. The corridor sloped straight and even, steadily downward. At its end, an arched doorway, also carved out of rock, opened into a gigantic cavern. The vault of the cavern's roof was high overhead, lost in shadows. A dull grey light, shining from a point far opposite the entrance, glistened off the wet surfaces of huge stalactites. Stalagmites thrust up out of the cavern floor to meet them, like teeth in a gaping mouth. Through gaps in the wet teeth, a river of black water swirled, flowing in the direction of the cheerless light. An ordinary enough cavern, Haplow looked at the arched doorway. Touching Marrett's arm, he silently called her attention to a mark scratched above it, a single sartan rune. Marrett looked at it, shuddered, leaned against the chill wall. She was shivering, her bare arms clasped tightly. Her face was averted, her hair hung over it, hiding it. Haplow knew that if he smoothed back that tangled mass of hair, touched her cheek, He'd feel tears. He didn't blame her. Once he would have wept himself. But now he felt strangely elated. This was, after all, where he'd intended to come all along. Marat couldn't read the Sartan rune language, but she could read that one sigil. All patrons could. They could read them, and they had come to hate and detest them. The first gate, said Haplow. We stand at the very beginnings of the labyrinth. Labyrinth, Hugh the Hand repeated. Then I was right. That is a maze out there. He gestured beyond the gate. Rows of stalagmites spread out into the darkness. A path, wet and sleek, led from the arch into the stalagmites. Haplow could see from where he stood the first fork in the path, two diverse courses slanting left and right, each wandering off amid rock formations that had not been naturally created, but had been formed by magic and fear and hate. There was one right way. All others led to disaster and they were standing at the very first gate. I had been in a few caves in my life, the hand continued. He gestured into the darkness with the stem of his pipe. But nothing like this. I walked out onto the path until I came to that first fork. Then I caught a glimpse of where it led. He rubbed his chin. The hair was beginning to grow back on his face and his head, a blue-black stubble that must have itched. 
I figured I'd better come back before I got myself lost. Getting lost would have been the least of your worries, said Haplow. The wrong turn in that maze leads to death. It was built that way on purpose. The labyrinth is more than a maze. It's a prison. And my child is trapped in there. Hugh the Hand removed his pipe from his mouth, stared at Haplow. I'll be damned. Alfred huddled in the back as far from the arched doorway as he could get and still remained near the group. You want to tell him about the labyrinth, Sutton? Or shall I? Alfred looked up briefly, an expression of hurt in his eyes. Haplow saw the pain, knew the reason for it, chose to ignore it. Alfred wasn't Alfred any more. He was the enemy. No matter that they were all in this together now, Haplow needed someone to hate, needed his hate as a strong wall to lean against for support, or he'd fall and maybe never get up. The dog had been standing beside Haplow near the open archway, sniffing the air and not liking what it smelled. It shook itself all over, padded to Alfred. The dog rubbed against the Sarton's leg, its plumy tail brushing back and forth slowly, gently. I understand how you feel, Alfred said. Reaching out, he gave the dog a timid pat on the head. I'm sorry. Haplow's wall of hate began to crumble. Fear started climbing up over the pieces. He gritted his teeth. Damn it, Alfred, stop apologizing. I've told you before, it's not your fault. The echo came, bounding back at him. Your fault, your fault, your fault. I know, I will. I'm s s s Alfred made a hissing sound like a spent tea kettle. Caught Haplow's eye and fell silent. The hand looked from one to the other. I don't give a damn whose fault it is. Somebody explain what's going on. Haplow shrugged. A long time ago there was a war between his people and mine. We lost and they won. No, Alfred corrected gently, sadly. Nobody won. At any rate, they shut us up in this prison and went off to find prisons of their own. Is that how you'd put it, Alfred? The Sarton did not answer. This prison is known as the Labyrinth. It's where I was born. It's where she was born. He gestured at Merritt. It's where our child was born, and where our child lives. If she lives, Merritt muttered beneath her breath. She had regained a certain amount of control. She was no longer shaking, but she did not look at them. Leaning against the wall, she kept her arms clasped about her tightly, holding herself together. It's a cruel place, filled with cruel magic that delights not only in killing, but in killing slowly, torturing, tormenting you until death comes as a friend. Footnote. One of the patron words for death is, in fact, the same as the word for friend. End of footnote. The two of us managed to escape with the help of our Lord Exar. But many don't, many haven't. Generations of our people have been born, have lived and died in the labyrinth. And there are none of our people now living, Haplow finished quietly, who started at the first gate and made it all the way through to the end. The assassin's expression darkened. What are you saying? Marat turned to him, anger burning her tears dry. It took our people hundreds of years to reach the final gate. And they did it by standing on the bodies of those who fell before them. A dying father points out the way ahead to his son. A dying mother hands her daughter to those who will carry the child on. I escaped, and now I'm back. She gulped a dry, wrenching sob. To face it all over again. The pain, the fear, and no hope of escape. We're too far away. Haplow wanted to comfort her, but he guessed his sympathy wouldn't be appreciated. Besides, what comfort could he offer? She spoke the truth. Well, no use standing around here. The sooner we start, the sooner we're finished, he said, and didn't realize the dark import of his words until he heard Marit's bitter laughter. I was coming on this journey with the intent of going back inside the labyrinth, he went on, deliberately brisk, businesslike. I just hadn't planned on entering from this direction, but I guess one way is as good as another, maybe the best. Now I won't miss anything. You were going back, Marit stared at him in wonder. Why? Her eyes narrowed. To escape Exar. No, Haplow answered. He didn't look at her. His gaze shifted to the cavern, to the gray light gleaming off the eddies in the dark water. I was going back to find you and our daughter. She seemed about to say something. Her lips parted. Then they closed over the words. Her eyes lowered. I am going in there now to search for our daughter, Haplow said. Will you go with me? Marit raised her head, her face pale. I... I don't know. I have to think... Marit... You don't have much choice. There's no other way out. According to the Sarton, she sneered. 
Maybe you trust him, but I don't. I have to think about it. She saw the pity on Haplow's face. Very well. Let him think she was afraid. Let him think she needed time to bolster her courage. What did it matter to her what he thought? Her body rigid, she stalked up the path toward the mausoleum. Coming level with Alfred, she glared at him until he cringingly fell back out of her way, stumbling over the dog as he did so. Barrett swept past him, disappeared up the corridor. Where's she off to? Hugh the Hand demanded, suspicious. Maybe one of us should go with her. Leave her alone. You don't understand. We both nearly died in there. Going back isn't easy. Are you coming? The Hand shrugged. Either that or spend eternity here. I don't suppose I could die of boredom. He cocked an eye at Alfred. No, I'm afraid not, said Alfred, thinking the question was serious. Hugh laughed, bitter and sharp. I'll go with you. What can happen to me? Good. Aplow's spirits lightened. He almost began to think they had a chance. We can use your skills. You know, when I first contemplated going back inside, I thought of you for a companion. Strange the way it's all worked out. What weapons do you carry? Hugh the hand started to answer, but Alfred interrupted. Uh, that won't matter he said in a small voice. What do you mean? It won't matter. Of course it matters. He can't kill, said Alfred. Haplow stared, struck dumb with astonishment. He didn't want to believe it, but the more he thought about it, the more sense it made, at least from a certain point of view. You understand? Alfred asked hopefully. Haplow intimated that he did, with a few brief and unrepeatable words. Well, I sure as hell don't, Hugh the Hand snarled. You can't be killed, you can't kill. It's as simple as that, said Haplow. Think about it, Alfred continued in a low voice. Have you killed anything, even a bug, since your, uh, return? Hugh stared, his face going sallow beneath the black sprouts of beard. That's why no one would hire me, he said harshly. Sweat glistened on his skin. Tryon wanted me to kill Bane. I couldn't. I was supposed to kill Stephen. I couldn't. I was hired to kill you. He gave Haplow a haunted look. And I couldn't. Damn it, I couldn't even kill myself. I tried, he stared at his hands, and I couldn't do it. He looked at Alfred, eyes narrowed. Would the Kenkari have known that? The Kenkari? Alfred was puzzled. Ah, yes, the elves who keep the souls of the dead. No, I don't believe they would have known. But the dead would, he added after a moment's thought. Yes, they would have known. Why? The Kenkari were the ones who sent me to kill Haplow, the hand said grimly. The Kenkari? Alfred was amazed. No, no, they would never kill anyone or hire it done. You may be certain you were sent for some other reason. Yes, said the hand, eyes glittering. I'm beginning to understand. They sent me to find you. Isn't that interesting, Alfred, Haplow added, regarding the Sarton intently. They sent Hugh the hand to find you. I wonder why. Alfred's eyes slid out from beneath both of their gazes. I can't imagine. Wait a minute, Haplow interrupted. What you said can't be right. You, the hand, did damn near kill me, and Merritt as well. He has some sort of magical weapon. Had, Hugh the hand corrected with grim satisfaction. It's gone, lost in the seawater. A magical weapon? Alfred shook his head. From the Kenkari? They are quite gifted in magic, but they would never use their magic to make weapons. No, Hugh the Hand growled. I got it from... Well, let's just say it came from another source. The blade was supposedly of ancient Sartan make and design. Your people used it during some long-ago war. Perhaps. Alfred looked extremely unhappy. Many magical weapons were made, I'm afraid, by both sides. I don't know anything about this particular one, but my guess is that the weapon itself was intelligent, could act on its own. It used you, Sir Hugh, simply as a bearer, a means of transport. That and your fear and will to guide it. Well, it's lost now, so it doesn't matter, Apro said. Lost in the waters of Chalestra. A pity we cannot flood the universe with such water, said Alfred quietly to himself. Apple looked into the cavern, into the dark water that flowed through it. He could hear the water now that he listened, hear it churn and gurgle and lap against the bordering rocks. He could imagine what horrid things swam in its foul currents, what dread creatures might crawl out of its dark depths. You're not coming with us, are you? Haplow said. No, said Alfred, staring at his shoes. I'm not. 
Almost sick with fear, Marit took her time returning to the white room, knowing she must compose herself before she spoke to Ixar. He would understand. He always understood. She had seen him countless times comfort those unable to go back into the labyrinth. He was the only one who'd ever done so. He would understand, but he would be disappointed. Marit entered the round room. The crystal coffins were no longer visible, covered over by Sartan magic, but she sensed their presence. And being around dead Sartan didn't give her as much pleasure as she might have imagined. Standing at the opposite end of the room from the coffins, as far away as she could get, she placed her hand on the sigil tattooed on her forehead and bowed her head. Exar, my lord, she murmured. He was with her immediately. I know where we are, lord, she said softly, unable to check a sigh. We are in the center of the labyrinth. We stand at the very first gate. Silence. Then Exar said, And will Haplo enter? He claims he will, but I doubt he has the courage. She doubted she had the courage, but she didn't mention that. No one has ever gone back before, Lord, except you. Still, what do we have if we stay here? Our own tombs. Marit recalled the face of the woman in the crystal coffin. She rested peacefully wherever she was. Her death had been an easy one. What reason does Haplo give for entering the labyrinth? Exar asked. Marit found it difficult to answer. She hesitated, felt him press her, an uncomfortable sensation. The, the child, Lord, she said at last, stammering. She'd almost said our child. Bah, what a paltry excuse. He must take me for a fool. I know his true reason. He has become ambitious, says Haplo. He has succeeded in seizing control of Arianus. Now he and that Sartan friend of his plan to try to subvert my own people, turn them against me. He will enter the labyrinth and raise his own army. He must be stopped. You doubt me, Merritt? He sensed his displeasure, almost anger, yet she couldn't help what she felt. I think he is serious. He has certainly never mentioned... Of course he wouldn't. Exar dismissed her admittedly weak arguments. Hapla was cunning and clever, but he will not succeed. Go with him, daughter. Stay with him. Fight to stay alive, and do not fear. Your time there will not be long. Sangrax is on his way to the labyrinth. Through me he will find you and Haplo. Sangrax will bring Haplo to me. Since you have failed. Marat heard the rebuke. She accepted it in silence, knowing she deserved it. But the image of the horrid dragon snakes she'd glimpsed on Celestra rose hideously in her mind. Firmly she banished the vision. Ixar was asking other questions. Haplo and the Sartan, what did they talk about? Tell me everything they have said. They spoke of Hugh the Hand, how the Sartan might be able to lift the curse of immortal life from the human. They talked of Abarach and a chamber there. It is called the Chamber of the Damned. Again, that wretched chamber! Exar was angry. Haplo talks of nothing else. He is obsessed with it. He once wanted to take me to it. I... A pause. A long, long pause. I have been a fool. He would have taken me, Exar murmured. His words were soft, brushing across her forehead like the wings of a butterfly. What did he say about this chamber? Did he or the Sartan mention something called the Seventh Gate? Yes, Lord. Barrett was astounded, awed. How did you know? A fool, a blind fool, he repeated bitterly, and then he was urgent, compelling. What did they say about it? Marit related all she could remember. Yes, that is it. A room imbued with magic, power. What can be created can be destroyed. Marit could feel Exar's excitement. It quivered through her like an electric jolt. Did they say where it was on Aberach? How to reach it? No, Lord. She was forced to disappoint him. Speak to him about this chamber further. Find out all you can. Where it is, how to enter. He grew calmer. But don't rouse his suspicions, daughter. Be circumspect, cautious. Of course, that is how they plan to defeat me. Haplo must never come to suspect. Suspect what, Lord? Suspect that I know about this chamber. Keep in contact with me, daughter. Or perhaps I should say, wife. He was pleased with her again. Marit had no idea why, but he was her lord, and his commands were to be obeyed without question. And she would be glad to have his counsel when they were in the labyrinth. But his next statement proved troubling. I will let Sangrax know where you are. That brought no comfort to her, though she knew it should. Only unease. Yes, Lord. Of course, I do not need to tell you. Mention none of what we have discussed to Haplo. No, Lord. He was gone. 
Mallard was alone, very much alone. That was what she wanted, what she'd chosen. He travels fastest who travels alone, and she'd traveled fast, very fast indeed, all the way back to where she'd started. The four and the dog stood at the entrance to the cavern, the entrance to the labyrinth. The gray light had grown not brighter, but stronger. Haplow judged it must be midday. If they were going, they should go now. No time was a good time to travel in the labyrinth, but any time during the daylight was better than at night. Marit had rejoined them. Her face was pale, but set, her jaw clenched. I will go with you, was all she'd said, and she'd said that much sullenly with reluctance. Haplow wondered why she'd decided to come. But he knew asking would do no good. Marit would never tell him, and his asking would only alienate him from her further. She had been like this when they'd first met, walled up inside herself. He had managed, with patience and care, to find a door, only a small one, but it had permitted him inside. And then it had slammed shut. The child. He knew now that was why she'd left him, and he thought he understood. Rue, she'd named the baby. And now the door was closed and shuttered, walled up. There was no way in. And from what he could tell, she'd sealed the only way out. Haplow glanced up at the Sartan sigil shining above the archway. He was entering the labyrinth, the deadliest place in existence, without any weapons except for his magic. But that, at least, wasn't a problem. In the labyrinth, there were always plenty of ways to kill. We should go, Haplow said. Hugh the Hand was ready, eager to get on with it. Of course, he had no idea of what he was walking into. Even if he couldn't die, and who knew? Against the labyrinth's cruel magic, the Sartan heart rune might not protect him. Marit was frightened, but resolved. She was going forward, probably because she couldn't go back. Either that, or she was still hoping to murder him. And the one person, the last person Haplow would have said he needed or wanted. I wish you'd come, Alfred. The Sartan shook his head. No, you don't. I'd only be in your way. I would faint. Haplow regarded the man grimly. You've found your tomb again, haven't you? Just like in Arianus. And this time I'm not going to leave. Alfred gazed fixedly downward. He must know his shoes very well by now. I've caused too much trouble already. He lifted his eyes, cast a quick glance at Hugh the Hand, lowered his eyes again. Too much, he repeated. Goodbye, Sir Hugh. I'm really very sorry. Goodbye? That's it? The Hand demanded angrily. You don't need me to end the curse, Alfred said softly. Haplow knows where to go, what to do. No, Haplow didn't, but then he figured it wouldn't matter anyway. They'd likely never get that far. He was suddenly angry, let the damn Sartan bury himself. Who cared? Who needed him? Alfred was right. He'd only be in the way, be more trouble than he was worth. Haplow entered the labyrinth. The dog cast one mournful look back at Alfred, then trotted along at its master's heels. Hugh the Hand followed. He looked grim, but relieved, always grateful for action. Marit brought up the rear. She was very pale, but she didn't hesitate. Alfred stood at the entryway, staring at his shoes. End of Side 6 To continue, change side selector switch and turn the cassette over. Haplow walked the path carefully. Coming to the first fork, he halted, examined both branches. One way looked much the same as the other, both probably equally bad. The tooth-like rock formations thrust out from all sides, blocking his view. He could see only upward, see what looked like dripping fangs. He could hear the dark water swirling onward into the heart of the labyrinth. Haplow grinned to himself in the darkness. He touched the dog on the head, turned the dog's head toward the entrance, toward Alfred. Go on, boy, Haplow commanded. Fetch. Chapter 30 The Citadel, Priam I don't like that horrid wizard, Pathan, and I think you should tell him to leave. Orn's ears, Aliatha, I can't tell Lord Exar to leave. He has as much right to be here as we do. We don't own this place. We were here first. Besides, we can't send the old gentleman out into the arms of the Titans. It would be murder. The elf's voice dropped, but not low enough that Exar couldn't hear what was being said. And he could prove useful. Help protect us if the Titans manage to break inside. You saw how he got rid of those monsters when he first came. Whoosh! Blue light's magic fire. As for that magic fire, this was the human male adding his small modicum of wisdom. The wizard might do the same to us if we make him mad. 
Not likely, Exar murmured, smiling unpleasantly. I wouldn't waste the effort. The Mensch were having a meeting, a private secret meeting, or so they supposed. Exar knew all about it, of course. He was seated at his ease in the Sartan Library in the Citadel. The Mensch were gathered down by the garden maze, a good distance away, but Exar clearly heard every word they were saying. What is it you don't like about him, Aliatha? The human female was asking. What was her name? Exar couldn't recall. Again, he didn't waste the effort. He gave me this lovely necklace, the human was continuing. See, I think it must be a ruby. And look at the cunning little swiddly mark cut into it. I got one too, said the elf Pathan. Mine's a sapphire, and it has the same squiggle. Lord Exar said that when I wore it, someone would be watching over me. Isn't it pretty, Aliatha? I think it's ugly, the elf female spoke with scorn. And I think he is ugly. He can't help how he looks. Something I'm certain you can understand, Roland. Aliatha interjected coolly. As to those gifts, he tried to give me one. I refused. I didn't like the look in his eye. Come on, Thea. Since when have you turned down jewels? As for that look, you've seen it a thousand times before. Every man looks at you that way, Tathan said. Then they get to know her, Roland muttered. Either Aliatha didn't hear him or she chose to ignore him. The old man only offered me an emerald. I've been offered better than that a hundred times over. And taken them up on their offers a hundred times over, I'll wager, Roland said more loudly this time. Come on, you two, stop it, Pathan intervened. What about you, Roland? Did Lord Exar give you one of these jewels? Me, Roland sounded amazed. Look, Pathan, I don't know about you elves, but among us humans, guys don't give necklaces to other guys. As to guys who accept jewelry from other guys, well... What are you saying? Nothing, Pathan. Rika intervened. Roland's not saying anything. He took the necklace. Don't let him fool you. I saw him asking Druger about the jewel, trying to get it appraised. What about it, Druger? How much are they worth? The gem is not of dwarf make. I cannot tell. But I wouldn't wear one. I get a bad feeling from them. The dwarf's voice was low and gruff. Sure you do, Roland scoffed. Such a bad feeling you'd gladly take every one of them for yourself. Look, Druger, old buddy, never try to swindle a swindler. I know all the tricks. It has to be dwarf-made. Your people are the only ones who dig deep enough below the leaf level to find jewels like this. Come on, tell me what it's worth. What does it matter what it's worth, Riga flared. You'll never get a chance to cash in on it. We're trapped in here for the rest of our lives, and you know it. The men sure fell silent. Exar yawned. He was growing bored, and this mindless chatter was starting to irritate him. He was beginning to regret giving them the magical gems which brought every word of what they said to him. Then suddenly he heard what he'd been wanting to hear all along. I guess that brings up the real reason for our meeting, Pathan said quietly. Do we tell him about the ship, or keep it to ourselves? A ship. Sangrax had been right. The Mensch did have a ship hidden around here. Exar shut the Sartan book he'd been attempting to read, concentrated on listening. What difference does it make? Aliatha asked languidly. If a ship really does exist, which I doubt, we can't reach it. We have only Cook's word on it, and who knows what she and her brats thought they saw out there. The Titans have probably smashed it to toothpicks anyway. No, Palin said after another moment's silence. No, they haven't, and it does exist. How do you know? Roland demanded, suspicious, because I've seen it. You can, from the top of the citadel, from the star chamber. You mean all this time you knew that the others were telling the truth about what they saw? That a ship was out there and still in good shape and you didn't tell us? Don't shout at me. Yes, damn it, I knew. And I didn't tell you for the simple reason that you would have acted stupid the way you're acting now, and rushed out like the others and gotten your fool head bashed in. Well, and so what if I did? It's my head. Just because you're sleeping with my sister doesn't make you my big brother. You could use a big brother. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Stop it, both of you, please. Riga, get out of my way. It's time he learned. You're all behaving like children. Aliatha, where are you going? You shouldn't go into that maze. It's... I'll go where I please, Riga. Just because you're sleeping with my brother. Imbeciles. Exar clenched his fists. For an instant, he considered transporting himself down to them, shaking the truth out of them, or perhaps choking it out of them. He grew calmer, however, and soon forgot about them, but not about what they'd said. You can see the ship from the top of the citadel, he muttered. 
I'll go up there and look for myself. The elf might well be lying, and they're not likely to come back soon. Exar had been meaning to take a look inside what the mensch referred to as the star chamber, but the elf, Payton, had the annoying habit of hovering around the room, treating it as if it were his own personal and private creation. He'd very proudly offered to give Exar a tour. Exar had been careful not to evince too much interest, much to Payton's disappointment. The Lord of the Nexus would examine the star chamber in his own good time by himself. Whatever certain magic happened in the star chamber was the key to controlling the Titans. That much was evident. It's the humming sound, Payton had said. I think that's what's drawing them. Obvious enough that even a mensch had seen it. The humming sound undoubtedly did have a startling effect on the Titans. From what Exar had observed, the humming sent them into some sort of trance. And when it stopped, they flew into a frenzy, like a fretful child who will only be quiet when it hears its mother's voice. An interesting analogy, Exar remarked, transporting himself to the star chamber with a spoken word of magic. He disliked climbing the stairs. A mother's soothing voice, a lullaby. The Sartan used this to control them, and while they were under this influence, they were slaves to the Sartan's will. If I could just learn the secret. Reaching the door that led into the star chamber, Exar peered cautiously inside. The machine was shut down. The blinding light was off. The machine had been running erratically ever since the Lord's arrival. The elf thought it was supposed to work this way, but Exar guessed not. The Lord of the Nexus knew little about machinery. He truly missed the child Bane at this moment. The boy had figured out how to work the Kixi Winsy. He could undoubtedly have solved the mystery of this far simpler machine. Exar was confident that he himself would solve it in time. The Sartan, as was their custom, had left behind innumerable volumes, some of which must contain something other than their constant whining, complaints about how tough things were, how awful their lives had become. He grew irritated every time he tried to read one. What with wading through books of useless twaddle, listening to the mensch bicker and quarrel, and keeping an eye on the titans who had once again massed outside the citadel's walls, Exar had found very little information to help him. Until now. Now he was beginning to get somewhere. He entered the star chamber, stalked over to the window, and stared outside. It took him several moments of intense searching to find the ship, partly hidden in the thick jungle foliage. When he located it, he wondered how he could have missed it. His eye was instantly drawn to it, the only ordered thing in a world of wild disorder. He examined it intently, excited, tempted. The ship was in plain view. He could whisk himself there at this moment, leave this world, leave the mensch, return to the labyrinth, return to find Haplo. Haplo, who knew the location of the seventh gate on Aberach, who wanted nothing more than to take his lord with him. Sartan runes. Exar narrowed his eyes, brought the ship into tighter focus. He could not be mistaken. The hull of the vessel, it was built to resemble some type of giant bird, was covered with Sartan runes. Exar cursed. The Sartan magic would keep him out as effectively as it had kept him out of the citadel. The mensch, he whispered. They had managed to enter the citadel. They could certainly enter the ship. That dwarf with his amulet and his puny little bit of Sartan rune magic. The mensch could get inside the ship, take Exar with them. The mensch would be thrilled to leave this place. But between the mensch and the ship, between Exar and the ship, was an army of titans. Exar cursed again. The creatures, hundreds of them, were camped outside the walls. Whenever the machine flared to life, they swarmed out of the jungle, surrounded the citadel, blind heads turned in the direction of the gate, waiting for it to open. This transfiction lasted as long as the humming and the brilliant starlight. When the machine shut off, the titans came out of the trance and attempted to break into the citadel. Their rage was truly frightening. The titans beat on the walls with their fists and tree-branch clubs. Their silent shouts reverberated in Exar's head until it almost drove him mad. But the walls held. Exar gave grudging thanks to the Sartan for that much at least. Eventually, worn out, the titans would shuffle back into the cover of the jungle and wait. They were waiting now. He could see them. Waiting to question the first living being who came out of the citadel, waiting to club him to death when they didn't get the right answer. This was maddening, truly maddening. I know now the location of the seventh gate. Back on Aberach. Haplo could lead me to it. He will lead me to it. Once Sangrax finds him. But what about Sangrax? Does Sangrax know? Has the dragon snake deliberately lied? Movement outside the door. A shuffling sound. Drat those snooping mensch. 
Couldn't they leave him alone an instant? A rune flared from his hand. The door dissolved. A startled-looking old man, clad in mouse-colored robes, with his hand raised to the now non-existent door handle, was staring into the room in amazement. I say, he said, what did you do with the door? What do you want? Exar demanded. This isn't the men's room. The old man glanced about in wistful expectation. Where did you come from? The old man shuffled into the room, still looking about hopefully. Oh, down the hall. Take a right at the potted palm. Third door on the left. I asked for a room with a bath, but... What are you doing here? Were you following me? I don't believe so. The old man considered the matter. Can't think why I would. No offense, old chap, but you're not exactly my type. Still, I suppose we should make the best of it. Two girls left at the altar, aren't we, my dear? Abandoned at the church door. The old man had wandered over near the well. A magical shove and Exar would be rid of this irritating fool for good. But Exar found what the old man was saying intriguing. What do you mean, abandoned? Dumped is more like it, said the old man with increasing gloom. So I won't get hurt. You'll be safe here, sir, he mimicked, scowling. Thinks I'm too old and frail to mix it up in a good brawl anymore. I'll show you, you hyperthyroid toad. He shook a scrawny fist in the general direction of nothing, then sighed and turned to Exar. What was the excuse yours gave you? Who gave me? Exar was playing along. I'm afraid I don't understand. Why, you're dragon. Geriatric, feeble, slow him down. I... Ah, uh, of course. The old man's vague expression grew disconcertingly sharp. I understand. Quite clever. Lured you here. Got you here. Left you here. And now he's gone, and you can't follow. Exar shrugged. The old man knew something. Now to keep him talking. Are you referring to Sangrax? Oh, Nabarach, you're too close. Clytus has already talked too much. He might say more. Sangrax is worried. Suggests Priam. Wasn't expecting my dragon, though. Opposing team, flip side, change of plans. Haplo trapped in labyrinth. You here, not perfect, but better than nothing. Takes ship and people. Leaves you lurch. Goes to labyrinth. Kills Haplo. Exar shrugged. Dead or alive, it doesn't matter to me. That's true, the old man pondered. So long as Sangrax brings you the body. But that, that's the one thing he won't do. Exar stared out the window. He stared long and hard out the window. Stared long and hard at the ship guarded by the Sartan runes, an army of titans between him and escape. He'll bring him, said Exar at last. No, he won't, the old man replied. Care to wager? Why wouldn't he? What would be his reason? To keep you and Haplo from reaching the seventh gate, the old man said triumphantly. So, Exar said, turning to face the old man, you do know about the seventh gate. The old man tugged nervously at his beard. The fourth race at Aqueduct. A horse, seventh gate, six to one, prefers a muddy track. Exar frowned. He advanced on the old man, stood so close that his breath disturbed the wispy gray hair. You will tell me. If you don't, I can make the next few minutes very unpleasant for you. Yes, I've no doubt you could. The vague look left the old man's eyes, leaving them filled with an inexpressible pain, a pain Exar could never hope to replicate. It wouldn't matter what you did to me, the old man sighed. I truly don't know where the seventh gate is. I never went there. I disapproved, you see. I was going to stop Sama if I could. I told him so. The council members sent their guards to bring me by force. They needed my magic. I am powerful, a powerful wizard. The old man smiled briefly, sadly. But when they came, I wasn't there. I couldn't leave the people. I hoped I might be able to save them. And so I was left behind, on earth. I saw it, the end, the sundering. The old man drew in a trembling breath. There was nothing I could do, no help, not for them, not for any of them. The deplorable but unavoidable civilian casualties. It's a question of priorities, Samma said. We can't save everyone, and those who survive will be better off. And so Samma left them to die. I saw, I saw... A tremor shook the old man's thin body. Tears filled his eyes, and a look of horror began to contort his face. A look so dreadful, so awful, that despite himself, Exar recoiled before it. The old man's thin lips parted, as if he would scream, but no scream came out. The eyes grew wider and wider, reliving horrors only he could see, only he could remember. 
the fires that devoured cities, plains, and forests, the rivers that ran blood red, the oceans boiling steam blotting out the sun, the charred bodies of the countless dead, the living running and running with nowhere to run to. Who are you? Exar asked, awed. What are you? The old man's breath rattled in his throat. Spittle flecked his lips. When it was over, Samar caught me, sent me to the labyrinth. I escaped. The nexus, the books, you read. Mine. My handiwork. The old man looked faintly proud. That was before the sickness. I don't remember the sickness, but my dragon tells me about it. That was when he found me, took care of me. Who are you? Exar repeated. He looked into the old man's eyes, and then Exar saw the madness. It dropped like a final curtain, dousing the memories, putting out the fires, clouding over the red-hot skies, blotting out the horror. The madness, a gift or a punishment? Who are you? Exar demanded a third time. My name? The old man smiled vacantly, happily. Bond. James Bond. Chapter 31 The Citadel Priam Aliatha flounced through the gate leading into the maze, her skirt caught on a bramble. Swearing, she tore it loose, taking a certain grim satisfaction in hearing the fabric rip. So what if her clothes were in shreds? What did it matter? She would never get to go anywhere, never get to do anything with anybody of interest ever again. Angry and miserable, she curled up on the marble bench, giving herself up to the luxury of self-pity. Outside the maze, through the hedgerows, she could hear the other three continuing to bicker. Roland asked if they shouldn't go in after Aliatha. Faithen said, no, leave her alone. She wouldn't go far, and what could happen to her anyway? Nothing, said Aliatha drearily. Nothing will happen, ever again. Eventually their voices faded away. Their footsteps trailed off. She was alone. I might as well be in prison, she said, looking at her surroundings. The green walls of the hedges with their unnaturally sharp angles and lines, strict and confining. Except prison would be better than this. Every prisoner has some chance of escape, and I have none. Nowhere to go but this same place. No one to see except these same people, on and on and on through the years, wearing away at each other until we're all stark raving mad. She flung herself down on the bench and began to cry bitterly. What did it matter if her eyes turned red, her nose dripped? What did it matter who saw her like that? No one cared for her. No one loved her. They all hated her. She hated them. And she hated that horrid Lord Exar. There was something frightening about him. Don't do that now, came a gruff voice. You will make yourself sick. Aliatha sat up swiftly, blinking back her tears and fumbling for what remained of her handkerchief, which, from being put to various uses, was now little more than a ragged scrap of lace. Not finding it, she wiped her eyes with the hem of her shawl. Oh, it's you, she said. Druger stood over her, gazing down at her with his black-browed frown. But his voice was kind and almost shyly tender. Aliatha recognized admiration when she saw it, and though it came from the dwarf, she felt comforted. I didn't mean that the way it sounded, she said hurriedly, realizing her previous words hadn't been exactly gracious. In fact, I'm glad it's you, and not any of the others. You're the only one with any sense. The rest are fools. Here, sit down. She made room for the dwarf on the bench. Druger hesitated. He rarely sat in the presence of the taller humans and the elves. When he sat on furniture made for them, his legs were too short to permit his feet to touch the ground. He was left with his limbs dangling in what was to him an undignified and childlike manner. He could see in their eyes, or at least he presumed he could see, that they tended to think less of him as a result. But he never felt that way around Aliatha. She smiled at him, when she was in a good humor, of course, and listened to him with respectful attention, appeared to admire what he did and said. Truth to tell, Aliatha reacted to Druger as she reacted to any man. She flirted with him. The flirtation was innocent, even unconscious. Making men love her was the only way she knew to relate to them, and she had no way at all to relate to other women. She knew Riga wanted to be friends, and deep inside, Aliatha thought it might be nice to have another woman to talk to, laugh with, share hopes and fears with. But early on in her life, Aliatha had understood that her older sister, Callie, unlovely and undesirable, had hated Aliatha for her beauty, at the same time loving her all the more fiercely. Aliatha had come to assume that other women felt the same as Callie, and admittedly most did. Aliatha flaunted her beauty, threw it into Riga's face like a glove, made of it a challenge. 
Secretly believing herself inferior to Rika, knowing she wasn't as intelligent, as winning, as likable as Rika, Aliatha used her beauty as a foil to force the other woman to keep her distance. As for men, Aliatha knew that once they discovered she was ugly inside, they'd leave her, and so she made a practice of leaving them first, except that now there was nowhere to go, which meant that sooner or later Roland would find out, and instead of loving her, he'd hate her, if he didn't hate her already. Not that she cared what he thought of her. Her eyes filled with tears again. She was alone, so desperately alone. Druger cleared his throat. He had perched on the edge of the bench, his toes just touching the ground. His heart ached for her sorrow. He understood her unhappiness and her fear. In a strange way, the two of them were alike, physical differences keeping them apart from the others. In their eyes, he was short and ugly. In their eyes, she was beautiful. He reached out, awkwardly patted her on the shoulder. To his amazement, she nestled against him, resting her head on his broad chest, sobbing into his thick black beard. Ruger's aching heart almost burst with love. He understood, though, that she was a child inside, a lost and frightened child, turning to him for comfort, nothing more. He gazed down at the blonde silken tresses mingling with his own coarse black hair, and he had to close his own eyes to fight back the burn of tears. He held her gently until her sobs quieted. Then, to spare them both embarrassment, he spoke swiftly. Would you like to see what I have discovered? In the center of the maze. Aliatha raised her head, her face flushed. Yes, I'd like that. Anything is better than doing nothing at all. She stood up, smoothing her dress and wiping her tears from her cheeks. You won't tell the others? Ruger asked. No, of course not. Why should I? Aliatha said haughtily. They have secrets from me, Pathan and Riga. I know they do. This will be our secret, yours and mine. She extended her hand. By the one dwarf, he loved her. Ruger took her hand. Small as his was, hers fit well inside it. He led her by the hand down the maze path until it grew too narrow for them to walk together. Releasing her, he admonished her to stay close behind him, lest she get lost in the myriad turns and twists of the maze. His injunction was needless. The hedges were tall and overgrown, often forming a green roof that blotted out all sight of the sky or anything around them, Inside it was greenly dark and cool and very, very quiet. At the beginning of their journey into the maze, Aliatha tried to keep track of where she was going. Two right turns, a left, another right, another left, then two more lefts, a complete circle around a statue of a fish. But after that she was confused and hopelessly lost. She kept so near the dwarf she nearly tripped him up, her long skirts constantly getting under his heels, her hand plucking at his sleeve. How do you know where you're going? she asked nervously. He shrugged. My people have lived all their lives in tunnels. Unlike you, we are not easily confused once we cannot see the sun or the sky. Besides, there is a pattern. It is based on mathematics. I can explain it, he offered. Don't bother. If I didn't have ten fingers, I couldn't count that high. Is the center much farther? Aliatha had never been strongly attracted to physical exertion. Not far, Druger growled. And there is a place to rest when we get there. Aliatha sighed. This had all started out to be exciting. It was eerie inside the hedges and fun to pretend that she might be lost, all the time enjoying the comforting knowledge that she wasn't. But now she was growing bored. Her feet were beginning to hurt. And they still had to go all the way back. Tired and ill-tempered, she now eyed Druger suspiciously. He had, after all, tried to kill them all once. What if he was bringing her down here for some nefarious purpose, far away from the others, no one would hear her scream. She paused, glanced behind, half toying with the idea of turning around and going back. Her heart sank. She had no idea which way to turn. Had it been to the right? Or maybe they hadn't turned at all, but taken the path in the middle? Druger came to a halt so suddenly that Aliatha, still looking behind, stumbled into him. I'm... I'm sorry, she said, steadying herself with her hands on his shoulders and then snatching her hands away hurriedly. He looked up at her, his face darkening. Don't be afraid he said, hearing the strain in her voice. We are here. He waved his hand. This is what I wanted to show you. Aliatha looked around. The maze had ended. Rows of marble benches set in a circle surrounded a mosaic of variously colored stones arranged in a starburst. In the center were more of those strange symbols like those on the pendant the dwarf wore around his neck. Above them was open sky, and from where she stood Aliatha could see the top of the citadel's center spire. She breathed a sigh of relief. At least now she had some idea of where she was. The amphitheater. 
though her knowledge wasn't likely to help her much in getting out of this place. Very pretty, she said, looking back at the starburst in the multicolored tile, thinking she should say something to keep the dwarf happy. She would have liked to rest. There was a calm, pleasant feeling to this place that urged her to linger, but the silence made her nervous, that and the dwarf staring at her with his shadowed dark eyes. Well, this has been fun. Thank you for... Sit down, said Ruger, gesturing to a bench. Wait. You have not yet seen what I wanted you to see. I'd love to, really, but I think we should be getting back. Payton will be worried. Sit down, please, Ruger repeated, and his brows came together in a frown. He glanced up at the citadel's spire. You will not have to wait long. Aliatha tapped her foot. As usual, when her will was thwarted, she was starting to get angry. She fixed the dwarf with a stern and imperious gaze that never failed to cut any man down to size, only this time it lost some of its effectiveness as it slanted down her nose instead of flashing upward from chilling eyes. And it was completely lost on Druger anyway. The dwarf had turned his back on her and walked over to a bench. Aliatha gave a final hopeless glance down the path and, sighing again, followed Druger. Plopping herself down near him, she fidgeted, looking back at the spire, sighed loudly, shuffled her feet, and gave every indication that she was not amused, hoping he'd take the hint. He didn't. He sat, stolid and silent, staring into the center of the empty starburst. Aliatha was about ready to try her luck in the maze. Getting lost in there wouldn't be nearly as bad as being bored to death out here. Suddenly the light from the star chamber on the top of the citadel began to glow. The strange humming sound began. A shaft of strong white light slanted down from the citadel's tower, struck the starburst mosaic. Aliatha gasped, rose from the bench, would have backed up except that the bench was behind her. As it was, she nearly fell. The dwarf reached out a hand, caught hold of her. Don't be afraid. People, Aliatha cried, staring. There are people there. The stage of the amphitheater, which had been empty, was now suddenly crowded with people, or rather with wisps of people. They weren't whole, flesh and blood, as she and Druger were. They were transparent shadows. She could see through them, to the other seats in the theater, to the hedgerow of the maze beyond. Her knees weakening, she sat back down on the bench and watched the people. They stood in groups, talking earnestly, walking slowly, moving from group to group, coming into her view and then passing out of it as they stepped into and then out of the shaft of light. People, other people, humans, elves, dwarves, standing together, talking together, apparently companionably, with the exception of one or two groups who seemed, by their gestures and posture, to be disagreeing about something. Groups of people gathered for only one purpose, so far as Aliatha was concerned. It's a party, she cried joyfully and leapt up from her seat to join them. No, wait, stop, don't go near the light. Druger had been viewing the scene with reverent awe. Shocked, he attempted to catch Aliatha as she darted past. He missed his hold, and she was suddenly in the center of the crowd. She might as well have been standing in a thick fog. The people flowed around her, flowed through her. She could see them talking but couldn't hear them. She was standing near them but couldn't touch them. Their eyes bright, they looked at each other, never at her. Please, I'm here, she pleaded in frustration, reaching out eager hands. What are you doing? Come out of there, Druger commanded. It is a holy place. Yes. She cried, ignoring the dwarf, talking to the shadows. I hear you. Can't you hear me? I'm right in front of you. No one answered. Why can't they see me? Why won't they talk to me? Aliatha demanded, facing the dwarf. They are not real, that is why, Ruger said dourly. Aliatha looked back. The fog people slid past her, over her, around her. And suddenly the light went out, and they were gone. Oh, Aliatha gasped, disappointed. Where are they? Where did they go? When the light goes, they go. Will they come back when the light comes back? Druger shrugged. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But generally, this time in the afternoon, I find them here. Aliatha sighed. She felt more alone than ever now. You said they aren't real. What do you think they are? Shadows of the past, maybe. Of those who used to live here. Druger stared into the starburst. He stroked his beard, his expression sad. A trick of the magic of this place. You saw your people there, said Aliatha, guessing what he was thinking. Shadows, he said again, his voice gruff. My people are gone, destroyed by the Titans. I am all that is left, and when I die, the dwarves will be no more. Aliatha looked back around the floor of the amphitheater, now empty, so very empty. No, Druger, she said suddenly. 
You're wrong. What do you mean, I am wrong? Kruger glowered. What do you know about it? Nothing, Aliatha admitted. But I think one of them heard me when I spoke. Kruger snorted. You imagined it. Don't you think I have tried? He demanded grimly. His face was haggard and ravaged by sorrow. To see my people, to see them talking and laughing. I can almost understand what they say. I can almost hear the language of my homeland once again. His eyes squeezed shut. He turned away from her abruptly, stalked back among the seats of the amphitheater. Aliatha watched him go. What a selfish beast I've been, she said to herself. At least I have Pathan. And Roland, though he doesn't count for much. And Riga's not a bad sort. The dwarf has no one. Not even us. We've done our best to freeze him out. He's come here to shadows for comfort. Truger, she said aloud. Listen to me. When I was standing in the starburst, I said, I'm right in front of you. And then I saw one of the elves turn and look in my direction. His mouth moved, and I swear he was saying, What? I spoke again, and he looked confused and glanced all around, as if he could hear me but couldn't see me. I know it, Druger. He cocked his head, looked back at her dubiously, but obviously wanting to believe. Are you certain? Yes, she lied. She laughed gaily, excited. How could I stand in a group of men and not be noticed? I don't believe it. The dwarf was glum again. He eyed her suspiciously, mistrusting her laughter. Don't be mad, Druger. I was only teasing. You looked so sad. Aliatha walked over to him. Reaching out, she touched the dwarf's hand with her own. Thank you for bringing me. I think it's wonderful. I... I want to come back with you again. Tomorrow, when the light shines. You do? He was pleased. Very well. We will come. But you will say nothing to the others. No, not a word, Aliatha promised. Now we should be getting back, Ruger said. The others will be worried about you. Aliatha heard the bitter emphasis on the last word. Druger, what would it mean if those people are real? Would it mean that we aren't alone, as we think? The dwarf stared back at the empty starburst. I don't know. He said, shaking his head. I do not know. Chapter 32 The Citadel, Priam The sudden flaring of the light in the star chamber drove Exar from the room. He managed to rid himself of the old Sartan, foisting him off onto the elf, who had come upstairs to talk nonsense. Figuring that the mensch and the madman would get along well together, Exar left them standing in front of the door to the star chamber, both of them staring inanely at the bright light seeping out from underneath. The old man was expounding on some theory concerning the workings of the chamber, a theory Exar might once have found interesting. Now the lord of the Nexus could not have cared less. He sought sanctuary in the library, the one place where he was certain the mensch would not bother him. Let the certain light shine from this star chamber and any others like it. Let it bring light and energy into Death's Gate. Let it light Abarach's terrible darkness, Thor Chalestra's frozen sea moons. What did Exar care? What if the old man was right? What if Sangrax was a traitor? Exar unrolled a scroll, flattened it out on the desk. The scroll was a Sartan work, portraying the universe as they had remade it. Four worlds, air, fire, stone, water, connected by four conduits. Conquering these worlds had seemed so simple in the beginning. Four worlds populated by mensch, who would fall before Exar's might like rotten fruit dropping from the tree. But one thing after another had gone wrong. The fruit on Arianus isn't all that rotten, he was forced to admit to himself. The mensch are ripe and strong and intent on clinging to the tree with tenacity. And who could have foreseen the titans on Priam? Not even I could have supposed the Sartan would be stupid enough to create giants, endow them with magic, and then lose control over them. And the magic-destroying sea on Celestra? How the devil am I to conquer a world where all some mensch has to do is throw a bucket of water on me to render me harmless? I need the seventh gate. I need it, or I might fail. Failure. In all his long life, the Lord of the Nexus had never permitted that word to enter his brain, had certainly never spoken it aloud. Yet now he was forced to concede it was a possibility. Unless he could find the seventh gate, the place where it all began, the place where, with his help, it would all end. Haplo would have shown me if I had let him. He came to the Nexus that last time for that purpose. I was blind, blind. 
Exar's fingers, like talons, clenched over the scroll, crushed the ancient parchment which crumbled to dust in his hands. I cared. That was my failing. His betrayal hurt me, and I should not have permitted such a weakness. Of all the lessons the labyrinth teaches, this is the most important. To care is to lose. If only I had been able to listen to him dispassionately, to cut to the core of his being with the cold knife of logic. He accomplished what I sent him to accomplish. He did what he was commanded to do. Tried to tell me I wouldn't listen. And now, perhaps, it is too late. Exar went over every word of Haplos, the spoken and the unspoken. The Sigler had been running consistently along the base of the wall ever since we left the dungeon. At this point, however, they left the base of the wall, traveled upward to form an arch of glowing blue light. I squinted my eyes against the brilliance, peered ahead. I could see nothing beyond but darkness. I walked straight for the arch. At my approach, the runes changed color. Blue turned to flaring red. The Sigler smoldered, burst into flame. I put my hand in front of my face, tried to advance. Fire roared and crackled. Smoke blinded me. The superheated air seared my lungs. The runes on my arms glowed blue in response, but their power did not protect me from the burning flames that scorched my flesh. I fell back, gasping for air. Runes of warding. I couldn't enter. These runes are the strongest that could possibly be laid down. Something terrible lies beyond that door. Standing before the archway, a preposterous, ungainly figure, Alfred began to perform a solemn dance. The red light of the warding runes glimmered, faded, glimmered, and died. We could go in now. The tunnel was wide and airy, the ceiling and walls dry. A thick coating of dust lay undisturbed on the rock floor. No sign of footprints or claw marks or the sinuous trails left by serpents and dragons. No attempt had been made to obliterate the Sartan Sigler. The guide runes shone brilliantly, lighting our way ahead. If it hadn't been too preposterous, Lord, I could have sworn I actually felt a sense of peace, of well-being that relaxed taut muscles, soothed frayed nerves. The feeling was inexplicable. The tunnel led us straight forward, no twists or turns, no other tunnels branching off this one. We passed beneath several archways, but none were marked with the warding runes, as had been the first. Then, without warning, the blue guide runes came to an abrupt halt, as if we'd run into a blank wall which we had. A wall of black rock, solid and unyielding, loomed before us. It bore faint markings on its smooth surface, certain runes. But there was something wrong with them, runes of sanctity, and inside a skull. Bodies, countless bodies, mass murder, mass suicide. Runes appeared running in a circle around the upper portion of the chamber. Any who bring violence in here will find it visited upon themselves. Why is this chamber sacred, Lord? What is it sacred to? I almost had the answer. I was so close. And then Haplo and his party were attacked by Clytus. Clytus knew the location of the chamber of the damned, or, as Exar now supposed he should start considering it, the seventh gate. Clytus had died in that chamber. Exar went over Haplo's report again and again in his mind. Something about a force opposing them, ancient and powerful. A table, an altar, a vision. The Council set the Sartan the task of contacting the other worlds to explain to them their desperate peril and beg them to send the aid promised before the Sundering. And what was the result? For months they did nothing. Then suddenly they came forward, prattling nonsense that only a child would believe. Of course, Exar realized, how utterly logical. These wretched Sartan on Aberach, cut off from their people for innumerable generations, had forgotten much of the rune magic, lost much of their power. A group of them, stumbling across the seventh gate, had suddenly rediscovered what had been lost. No wonder they had been intent on hiding it, keeping it for themselves, making up stories about opposing forces, ancient and powerful. Even Hapla had fallen for their lies. The Sartan hadn't known what to do with such power, but Exar did. If only he could find the chamber. Could he do so, perhaps, without Haplo? The Lord of the Nexus walked through Haplo's mind, as he had done on Haplo's return from Aberach. Exar recognized the dungeons where Haplo had almost died. He had escaped from the dungeons, run down a corridor guided by blue sartan rune lights. Which corridor? What direction? There must be hundreds down there. The Lord of the Nexus had explored the catacombs beneath the castle in Necropolis. It was a maze worthy of the labyrinth, a rat's warren of tunnels and corridors, some naturally formed, others burrowed into the rock by magic. 
It might take a man a lifetime to find the right one. But Haplow knew the right one, if he escaped from the labyrinth. Exar brushed the ashes of the scroll from his hands. And I am trapped here, unable to help. A ship within sight, a ship covered with certain runes. The mensch can break the runes. They broke them to enter here. But they'd never reach the ship alive because of the titans. I must... Alive? Exar drew in a deep breath, let it out slowly, thoughtfully. But who said the mensch need to be alive? Chapter 33 the labyrinth. The path through the cavern leading into the labyrinth was long and tortuous. It took them hours to traverse, inching their way slowly forward, each of them forced to test every step, for the ground would shift and slide beneath the feet of one person after another had passed over it safely. Is the damn rock alive? Hugh the Hand asked. I swear I saw it deliberately throw her off. Breathing heavily, Marrot stared down into the black and turbid waters swirling beneath her. She had been negotiating a narrow section of rock ledge that ran along the sheer wall of the cavern, when suddenly the ledge beneath her feet gave way. Hugh the Hand, following close behind her, caught her as she started to slide down the wet walls. Flattening himself out on the ledge, the assassin held fast to Marrot's wrist and arm until Haplo could reach them from the opposite side of the broken ledge. "'It's alive, and it hates us,' Haplo answered grimly, pulling Marrot up to the relative safety of the section of path on which he stood." Hugh the Hand jumped across the gap, landed beside them. This part of the trail was narrow and cracked, winding through a jumble of boulders beneath a curtain of stalactites. Maybe that was its last jab at us. We're near the exit. Only a few feet away was the cavern opening. Gray light, straggly trees, fog-damp grass. A heart-bursting dash would take them there, but they were all of them bone-weary, hurting, afraid. And this was only the beginning. Haplo took a step forward. The ground shivered beneath his feet. The boulders around him began to wobble. Dust and bits of rock fell in cascades from the ceiling. Hold still! Don't anyone move! Haplo ordered. They held still, and the rumbling ceased. The labyrinth, Haplo muttered to himself. It always gives you a chance. He looked at Marit, who was standing on the path beside him. Her face was scratched, hands cut and bleeding from her fall. Her face was rigid, her eyes on the exit. She knew as well as Haplo. What is it? What's the matter? It was Alfred, quavering. Haplo turned his head slowly. Alfred was behind, standing on the narrow ledge that had already tried to throw Marrot into the roiling black water. Part of that ledge was missing. He'd have to jump for it. And Haplo remembered clearly what a wonder Alfred was at leaping across chasms. His feet were wider than the ledge he would have to traverse. Hugh the Hand had already saved the clumsy and accident-prone Sarden from falling into two pits and a crack. The dog remained near Alfred, occasionally nipping at his heels to urge him along. Cocking its head, the dog whined unhappily. What's wrong? Alfred repeated fearfully when no one answered. The cavern's going to try to stop us from leaving, Marrot said coldly. Dear me, said Alfred, amazed. Can it, can it do such a thing? What do you think it's been doing? Caplo demanded irritably. Oh, but come now. Alfred took a step forward to argue the point. You make it sound as if... The ground heaved. A ripple passed through it almost, Haplo could have sworn, as if it laughed. Alfred gave a cry, wavered, twisted. His feet slid out from under him. The dog sank its teeth into his breeches and hung on. Arms flailing wildly, Alfred managed, with the dog's help, to regain his balance. Eyes closed in terror, he flattened himself against the rock wall, sweat trickling down his bald head. All inside the cavern was suddenly still. Don't do that again. Marrot ordered, grinding the words through clenched teeth. Blessed Sutton, Alfred murmured, his fingers trying to dig into the rock. Haplo swore. It was you, blessed Sutton, who created this. How the devil are we going to get out? You shouldn't have brought me, Alfred said in a trembling voice. I warned you I would only slow you down, put you in danger. Don't worry about me. You go on ahead. I'll just go back. Don't move, Haplo began, then fell silent. Ignoring him, Alfred had started to walk back, and nothing was happening. The ground remained still. Alfred, wait, Haplo called. Let him go, Marrot said scornfully. He slowed us up enough already. That's what the labyrinth wants. It wants him to go, and I'll be damned if I'll obey. Dog, stop him! The dog immediately caught hold of Alfred's flapping coattails, hung on. Alfred looked back at Haplo piteously. What can I do to help you? Nothing! You may not think so, but the labyrinth does. 
Strange as it may seem, Sarton, I've got the feeling that the labyrinth is afraid of you. Maybe because it sees its creator. No, Alfred shrank back. No, not me. Yes, you. By hiding in your tomb, by refusing to act, by keeping perfectly safe, you feed the evil. Perpetuate it. Alfred shook his head. Catching hold of his coattails, he began to tug at them. The dog, thinking it was a game, growled playfully and tugged back. At my signal, Aflo said beneath his breath to Merritt, you and Hugh the Hand make a run for the opening. Be careful. There may be something waiting for us out there. Don't stop for anything. Don't look back. Aflo, Merritt began. I don't want to. She faltered, flushing. Startled, hearing a different tone in her voice, he looked at her. To what? Leave me? I'll be all right. Touched, pleased by the look of concern in her eyes, the first softness he'd seen in her, he reached out his hand to brush the sweat-damp hair back from her forehead. You're hurt. Let me take a look. Eyes flaring, she pulled away from him. You're a fool. She flicked a disparaging glance at Alfred. Let him die. Let them all die. She turned her back on him, fixed her eyes on the cave's opening. The ground trembled beneath Haplow's feet. They didn't have much time. He held out his hand across the broken ledge. Alfred, he said quietly, I need you. Alfred lifted a haggard, drawn face, stared at Haplow in amazement. The dog, at a silent signal from its master, released its hold. I can't do this alone, Haplow continued. He held out his hand, held it steady. I need your help to find my child. Come with me. Alfred's eyes filled with tears. He smiled tremulously. How? I can't. Give me your hand. I'll pull you across. Alfred leaned precariously over the broken ledge, reached out his hand, bony, ungainly, the wrist protruding from the frayed lace of his two short cuffs. And, of course, he was blubbering. Haplow, I don't know what to say. The patron caught hold of the sergeant's wrist, clasped it tightly. The ground heaved and buckled. Alfred lost his footing. Run, Merritt! Haplow shouted and began to work his magic. At his command, blue and red Sigler burned in the air. He spun the runes into a blue glowing rope that snaked from his arm to wrap around Alfred's body. The cavern was collapsing. Risking a quick glance, Haplow saw Marrett and Hugh running madly for the exit. A rock plummeted down from the ceiling struck Marrett a glancing blow. The runes on her body protected her from harm, but the weight of the rock knocked her down. Hugh the hand picked her up. The two dashed on. The assassin looked behind him once to see if Haplow was coming. Marrett did not look. Hauling on the rope, Haplow swung the sarton, arms and legs dangling like a dead spider, across the gap to his side of the ledge. Just at that moment, the part of the ledge on which Alfred had been standing gave way. Dog, jump! Haplow yelled. The dog gathered itself and, as the rock slid out from beneath its feet, hurled its body into the dust-laden air. It slammed into Alfred, sent them both sprawling. Boulders fell across the path, blocking it, blocking their way out. Haplow picked the sarton up, shook him. Alfred's eyes were starting to roll back in his head. His body was going limp. If you faint, you'll die here, and so will I, Haplow shouted at him. Use your own magic, damn it. Alfred blinked, stared. Then he drew in a sucking breath, singing the runes in a quavering voice. He spread his arms and began to fly toward the exit, which was rapidly growing smaller. Come on, boy, Haplow commanded the dog and plunged ahead. His rune magic struck the boulders that blocked his path, burst them apart, sent them bounding out of his way. Alfred swooped up and out of the cavern opening. His arms flapping, feet stretched out behind him, he looked like a coat-tailed crane. A huge rock thundered down on top of Haplow, bowled him over, pinned his leg beneath it. The opening was closing. The mountain itself was sliding down on top of him. A tiny glimmer of grey light was all that remained. Haplow used his magic as a wedge, pried the boulder off his leg, lunged forward, thrusting his hand through the narrowing gap. The tunnel of light grew wider. Sartan runes flared around his hand, strengthening the glow of the patron runes. Pull him out, Alfred was shouting. I'll hold it open. Hugh the hand grabbed hold of Haplow, pulled him through the magic wrought tunnel. Haplow scrambled to his feet, began to run. The assassin and Alfred were at his side, the dog barking and racing in front of them. Alfred naturally stumbled over his own feet. Haplow didn't even pause, but swept the Sartan up and kept going. Marrett stood on a ridge, waiting for them. Take cover, Haplow shouted at her. An avalanche of rock and splintered trees roared down the mountainside. Haplow flung himself face forward on the ground, dragged Alfred down with him. The patron's rune magic sheltered him, and he hoped Alfred had sense enough to use his own magic for protection. Rock and debris bounced off the magical shields, crashed around them. The ground shook, and then suddenly all was quiet. 
Slowly, Haplow sat up. I guess you won't be going back now, Alfred, he said. Half the mountain had collapsed in on itself. Gigantic slabs of stone lay across what had been the cavern's entrance, sealing it shut, perhaps forever. Haplow stared at the ruin with a strange foreboding. What was wrong? He hadn't really planned to come back this way. Perhaps it was nothing more than the instinctive fear of having a door slammed shut at his back. But why had the labyrinth suddenly decided to seal off their exit? Marat unknowingly spoke his thoughts. That leaves us just one way out now. The final gate. Her words came back, a dismal echo bouncing off the ruined mountain. The final gate. Chapter 34 The Labyrinth I can't go on, Alfred gulped, sinking onto a flat rock. I have to rest. The last panicked dash and the fall of the mountain on top of him had been too much for the sergeant. He sat hunched over, wheezing and gasping. Marat cast a disdainful glance at him, then one at Haplow. Then she looked away. I told you, said her scornful gaze, you are a fool. Haplow said quietly, There's no time, Alfred, not now. We're exposed out in the open. We find cover, then we rest. Just a few moments, Alfred pleaded meekly. It seems quiet. Too quiet, Marat said. They were in a small grove of scrub trees that appeared from their stunted growth and twisted limbs to have waged a desperate struggle for life in the shadow of the mountain. A sparse smattering of leaves clung dejectedly to the branches. Now that the mountain had collapsed, the labyrinth's sun touched the trees for perhaps the first time. But the grey light brought no cheer, no comfort. The leaves rustled mournfully, and that, Marat noticed uneasily, was the only sound in the land. She drew her knife out of her boot. The dog jumped up, growled. Hugh the Hand eyed her suspiciously, ignoring the animal, ignoring the mensch. Marat said a few words to the tree in her own language, apologizing for harming it, explaining her dire need. Then she began to hack at a branch. Haplow, too, had apparently noted the silence. Yes, it's quiet, too quiet. That avalanche must have been heard for miles. You can bet someone is on their way to investigate, and I don't intend to be here when they arrive. Alfred was perplexed. But it was only an avalanche, a rock slide. Why would anyone care? Of course the labyrinth cares. It dropped a mountain on us, didn't it? Haplow wiped sweat and rock dust from his face. Barrett cut off the branch, began to strip away small twigs and half-dead leaves. Haplow squatted down on his haunches, faced Alfred. Don't you understand yet, damn it? The labyrinth is an intelligent entity. I don't know what rules it or how, but it knows. It knows everything. He was silent, thoughtful. But there's a difference about the labyrinth. I can sense it, feel it. Fear. Yes, agreed Alfred. I'm terrified. No, not our fear. It's fear. It's afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? Haplow grinned, though his grin was strained. Strange as it sounds, us. You, Sarton. Alfred shook his head. How many heretical Sarton were sent through the vortex? Hundreds? A thousand? Haplow asked. I don't know. Alfred spoke into the lace of his draggled shirt collar. And how many had mountains dropped on them? None, I'll wager. That mountain has been standing there a long, long time. But you, you enter the vortex and bam! And you can be damn sure that the labyrinth's not going to give up. Alfred looked at Haplow in dismay. Why? Why would it be afraid of me? You're the only one who knows the answer to that, Haplow returned. Marat, sharpening the point of the branch with her knife, agreed with Alfred. Why would the labyrinth fear a mensch, two returning victims, and a weak and sniveling sarton? Yet she knew the labyrinth, knew it as Haplow knew it. It was intelligent, malevolent. The avalanche had been a deliberate attempt to murder them, and when the attempt had failed, the labyrinth had sealed off their only route of escape. Not that it had been much of an escape route, with no ship to take them back through Death's Gate. Fear. Haplow's right, Marat realized, with a sudden heady elation. The labyrinth's afraid. All my life I've been the one who was afraid. Now it is. It is as scared as I ever was. Never before has the labyrinth tried to keep someone from entering. Time and again it permitted Exar to enter the final gate. The labyrinth even seemed to welcome the encounter, the chance to destroy him. It never shut the gate on Exar, as it tried to shut it on us. Yet not one of us, nor all of us combined, is nearly so powerful as the Lord of the Nexus. Then why? What does the labyrinth fear from us? 
Her relation faded, left her chilled. She needed to talk to Ixar, report to him what had occurred. She wanted his counsel. Chopping off another branch, she wondered how she could find an opportunity to slip off by herself. I don't understand any of this, said Hugh the Hand, glancing around nervously, his face darkening. And I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen how that damn cursed blade took on a life of its own. But I know fear. I know how it works in a man. I suppose it's no different than a bunch of intelligent rocks. Fear makes a man desperate, reckless. The assassin looked down his hands, smiled grimly. I grew rich off other men's fear. And it will make the labyrinth the same, Aplo said. Desperate, reckless. That's why we can't afford to stop. We've already spent too much time here as it is. The signal on his hands and arms were glowing a pale blue tinged with red. Barrett glanced at the tattoos on her body, saw the same warning. Danger was not near, but it wasn't far away either. Alfred, pale and shaken, rose to his feet. I'll try, he said gamely. Mallet traced a sigil of healing on the tree, then cut off another branch. Silently she handed the first crude spear she had made to Haplow. He hesitated, astonished that she should think of him, pleased that she was concerned. He accepted the spear, and as he took it, their hands touched. He smiled that quiet smile of his. The light in his eyes and that smile, which was so achingly familiar, seeped into Mallet's heart. But the only effect the light had was to illuminate the emptiness. She could see inside every part of her, see the bleak walls, barred windows, shuttered doors. Better the darkness. She turned away. Which direction? Hapo didn't answer immediately. When he did, his voice was cool, perhaps with disappointment. Or perhaps she was accomplishing her goal. Perhaps he was learning to hate her. The top of that ridge up ahead, he pointed. We shall be able to get a view of the countryside. Maybe find a path. There's a path? Hugh the Hand stared around in disbelief. What made it? This place looks deserted. It has been deserted probably for hundreds of years. But yes, there's a path. This is the labyrinth, remember? A deliberately crafted maze made by our enemies. The path runs all the way through it. The path leads the way out in more ways than one. There's an old saying, you abandon the path at your peril. You keep to the path at your peril. Wonderful, Hugh the Hand grunted. Reaching into the folds of his clothing, he drew out his pipe, regarded it with longing. I don't suppose there's such a thing as Stregno in this god-awful place. No, but when we reach one of the squatter villages, there's a dried leaf mixture that they smoke on ceremonial occasions. They'll give you some. Aplo grinned, turned to Marit. Do you remember that village ceremony where we... You'd better see to your sartin friend, she interrupted. She had been thinking of exactly the same time. His hand was on the door of her being, trying to force it open. She put her shoulder to it, barred his entry. He's limping. They had only traveled a short distance, and already the sartan was lagging behind. I seem to have twisted my ankle, Alfred said apologetically. It would have been more useful if he'd twisted his neck, Marit muttered scornfully. I'm dreadfully sorry, Alfred began. He caught Haplow's baleful glance and swallowed the rest. Why don't you use your magic, Alfred? Haplow suggested with elaborate patience. I didn't think there was time. The healing procedure... Haplow checked an exasperated exclamation. Not to heal yourself. You can float, fly, as you did just now when you flew out of the cavern. Or have you forgotten already? No, I didn't forget. It's just that you might even prove useful, Haplow went on quickly. He didn't want to give Alfred time to think. You can see what's ahead. Well, if you really believe it would help... Alfred still sounded dubious. Just do it, Haplow said through clenched teeth. Mallet knew what he was thinking. The labyrinth had left them in peace too long. Alfred went into his little dance, a hopping sort of dance on his sore foot. He waved his hands and hummed a tune through his nose. Slowly, effortlessly, he rose into the air, drifted gently forward. The dog, in a high state of excitement, gave a joyful bark and leapt playfully for Alfred's dangling feet as the sartan sailed overhead. Haplow, breathing aside, turned and started up the ridge. He was almost at the top when the wind hit, slamming into him like a doubled-up fist. The wind came out of nowhere, as if the labyrinth had sucked in an enormous breath and was blowing it back out. The blast sent Marit staggering. Hugh the hand at her side was cursing and rubbing his eyes, half blinded by wind-blown dust. Haplow stumbled, unable to keep his balance. Above them, Alfred let out a strangled cry. The wind caught hold of the floating sartan, arms and legs flapping wildly, 
he was being flung at incredible speed right into the mountain. Only the dog was able to move. It raced after Alfred, snapped at the man's flying coattails. Catch him! Haplow shouted. Drag him! But before he could finish, the wind smote him a blast from behind, knocked him flat. Hearing the urgency in its master's voice, the dog bounded high into the air. Teeth closed over fabric. Alfred sagged down. Then the fabric tore. The dog tumbled to the ground in a flurry of legs. The wind rolled the animal over and over. Alfred was blown away, and then suddenly he stopped. His body, his clothes, had become entangled in the limbs of one of the stunted trees. The wind fretted and whipped at him in frustration, but the tree refused to let loose. I'll be damned, said Hugh the Hand, wiping grit from his eyes. The branches reached up and grabbed him. Alfred hung from the tree limbs, dangling helplessly, gazing about in bewilderment. The strange wind had ceased blowing as suddenly as it had started, but there remained an ominous feeling in the air, a sullen anger. The dog dashed over to stand protectively beneath Alfred. The sartan was starting to sing and wave his hands. Don't! Haplow shouted urgently, scrambling to his feet. Don't move or say or do anything, especially not magic! Alfred froze. His magic, Haplow muttered. Then he began to swear beneath his breath. Every goddamn time he uses his magic, and what will happen to him if he doesn't? How can he get through the labyrinth alive without it? Not that he's going to get through alive with it. This is hopeless. Hopeless. You're right, he said bitterly to Marit. I am a fool. She could have answered him. The tree saved him. You didn't see it, but I did. I saw it catch hold of him. Some force is working for us, trying to help us. There is hope. If we've brought nothing else, we've brought hope. But she didn't say that. She wasn't certain hope was what she wanted. I suppose we'll have to get him down, growled Hugh the Hand. What's the use, Haplow demanded dispiritedly. I've brought him here to die. I've brought us all here to die. Except you. And maybe that's worse. You'll be forced to just keep on living. Marat edged close to him. Instinctively, she reached out a hand to comfort him and realized what she was doing. She stopped, confused. It seemed she was two different people, one hating Haplow, the other not hating him. And she didn't much trust either. Where am I in all this, she wondered angrily. What is it I want? That doesn't matter, wife. She could hear Exar's voice. What you want is not important. Your job is to bring Haplow to me. And I'll do it, she decided. Me, not Sangdrax. Hesitantly, Marit brushed her fingers against Haplow's arm. Startled at her touch, he turned. What the human said is true, Marit told him, swallowing. Don't you understand? The labyrinth's acting out of fear, and that makes us its equal. She moved closer to him. I've been thinking about my child, my daughter. I do sometimes, at night. When I'm all alone, I wonder if she is all alone. I wonder if she ever thinks of me as I think of her. If she wonders why I left her. I want to find her, Haplow. I want to explain. Tears filled her eyes. She hadn't meant that to happen. She lowered the lid swiftly so that he wouldn't see. But it was too late. And then because she wasn't looking at him, she couldn't move away from him fast enough to prevent his putting his arms around her. We'll find her, he was saying softly. I promise. Marat looked up at him. He was going to kiss her. Exar's voice was in Marat's head. You slept with him. You bore his child. He loves you still. This was perfect, what Exar wanted. She would lull Hapla into feeling secure around her. Then she would disable him, capture him. She closed her eyes. Haplow's lips touched hers. Marat shivered all over and suddenly shrank back, pulled away. You'd better go get your starting friend out of the tree. Her voice was sharp as the knife clutched tightly in her hand. I'll keep watch. Here, you'll need this. Marit handed him the knife, left him, not looking back. She was shaking all over, tremors tightening her arms and the muscles of her thighs, and she walked blindly, hating him, hating herself. Reaching the top of the ridge, she leaned against a huge boulder, waited for the shaking to cease. She permitted herself one swift glance behind to ascertain what Hapler was doing. He had not followed her. He had gone off, the dog trotting along at his heels to try to extricate Alfred from the treetop. Good, Marit told herself. The trembling was under control. She quelled her inner turmoil, forced herself to scan the area carefully, closely, searching for telltale signs of an enemy. She felt calm enough to talk to Exar, but she didn't get the chance. Chapter 35 The Labyrinth Alfred dangled helplessly from the top of the tree. 
A sturdy limb running up the back of his frock coat supported him like a second, and in Alfred's case, firmer, backbone. The sergeant's legs and arms waved feebly. There was no way he could get himself down. The dog paced beneath, mouth open and a tongue lolling grin, as if it had treed a cat. Haplow, arriving on the scene, stared upward. How the devil did you manage that? Alfred spread his hands. I... I really haven't any idea. Twisting his head, he struggled to peer over his shoulder. If... if it didn't sound too strange, I'd say the tree caught me as I went flying past. Unfortunately, it now appears reluctant to let me go. I don't suppose there's any chance of that back seam on your coat ripping, Haplow called. Alfred shifted his weight experimentally, began to sway back and forth. The dog, cocking its head, was fascinated. It's a very well-made coat, Alfred returned with an apologetic smile. The dressmaker to Her Majesty Queen Anne fashioned the first one for me. I became quite fond of it, and so I've, well, I've made them myself from the same pattern ever since. You made it? I'm afraid so. Using your rune magic? I've become rather good at tailoring, Alfred answered defensively. Raising people from the dead and tailoring, Haplow muttered. Just what I need. The signal on his body continued to glow faintly, but now they had begun to itch and burn. The danger, whatever it was, was drawing nearer. He peered up at the ridge. He couldn't see Marit, but then he shouldn't be able to see her. He guessed she had hidden herself in the shadow of a large rock. I don't remember the damn tree being this tall, Hugh the Hand remarked, craning his neck to see. You could stand on my shoulders and we still wouldn't be able to reach him. If he'd unbutton his coat and free his arms from the sleeves, he'd drop down. Alfred was considerably alarmed at the suggestion. I don't think that would work, Sir Hugh. I'm not very adept at things of that sort. He's right there, Haplow agreed grimly. Knowing Alfred, he'd end up hanging himself. Can't you? Hugh the Hand glanced at Haplow's blue glowing skin. Magic him down? Using the magic drains my strength, just as running or jumping drains yours. I'd rather conserve it for important things like surviving, not little things like getting sartan out of trees. Haplow tucked the dagger into his belt, walked over to the base of the tree. I'll climb up there and cut him loose. You stay down here and be ready to catch him. Hugh the Hand shook his head, but couldn't suggest any other option. Removing the pipe from his mouth, he slid it safely into his pocket and took up a position directly underneath the dangling Alfred. Haplow climbed the tree, tested the limb holding the sartan before crawling out on it. He had been afraid by the look of it that the branch wouldn't hold his weight, but it was stronger than he'd supposed. It bore his weight and Alfred's easily. Caught him as he went flying past, Haplow repeated in disgust. Still, he'd seen stranger things, most of them involving Alfred. It's, it's an awfully long fall, Alfred protested in a trembling voice. I could use my magic. Using your magic's what got you here in the first place, Haplow interrupted, crawling gingerly out onto the limb, flattening himself in order to distribute his weight evenly. The branch sagged. Alfred gasped in terror, waved his arms, and kicked his feet. The limb creaked ominously. Hold still, Haplow ordered in irritation. You'll bring us both down. He slid his dagger between the coat and the branch, began to cut through the seam. What? What do you mean? My magic got me into this. Alfred asked, closing his eyes tightly. That wind didn't pick up any of the rest of us and try to impale us on a mountain. Just you. And the mountain didn't start to collapse until you began to sing those damn runes of yours. But why? Like I said, you tell me, Haplow grunted. He was about halfway through, cutting slowly, hoping to let Alfred down as easily as possible, when he heard a low whistle. The sound went through him like a bolt of hot iron, burning him, piercing him. What an odd-sounding bird, said Alfred. It's not a bird. It's Marit, our signal for danger. Haplow gave the knife a jerk, slipped the coat seam in one long, jagged tear. Alfred had time for one wild yell. Then he was plummeting through the air. Hugh the Hand stood stolidly, feet planted firmly, body braced. He caught Alfred, broke the sartan's fall, but the two went over together in a heap. Haplow, from his vantage point in the tree, looked to the ridge. Marit detached herself from the boulder long enough to point to her left. She gave another low whistle and added a series of three cat-like howls. Tiger men. Marit raised her hands, spread all ten fingers wide, then repeated this gesture twice. Haplow swore softly. A hunting pack, at least twenty of the fierce beasts who were not really men at all, but were known as such because they walked upright on two strong hind legs and used their front paws complete with prehensile thumbs like hands. Footnote. 
Tiger men are taller than most humans, with thick fur pelts and long tails. They can run on back legs or drop down on all fours, are capable of leaping incredible distances, and are as much at home in trees as on the ground. They are adept at using weapons, but prefer killing with fang and claw, dragging down their prey and sinking their teeth into the neck, ripping up the throat. They know rune magic, using it primarily to enhance their weapons. They kill for sport as well as food. End of footnote. They could therefore use weapons and were skilled with one known as a cat's paw, intended to cripple rather than kill. A disc-shaped piece of wood with five sharp stone claws attached. The cat's paw was either thrown or flung from a sling. Its magic was weak against patron magic, but effective. No matter what part of a sigler-covered body it struck, the cat's paw inserted its claws through the small breaks in the tattoos, bit deep into muscle, and clung there tenaciously. Often hurled at the legs of a victim, the cat's paw, tearing into a calf muscle or thigh, felled the prey with deadly efficiency. Tiger men prefer their meat fresh. Haplow cast a fleeting glance behind him at the ruined mountain, knew before he looked that it was useless. No hope of crawling back into that cave. He scanned the horizon, then noticed that Marrot was waving to him, urging him to hurry. Haplo slid down the tree. Hugh the Hand was picking Alfred up, attempting to help him stand. The sarton crumpled like a rag doll. Looks like in the fall he did something to his other ankle, Hugh the Hand said. Haplo swore again, louder and more graphically. What's all that hand waving and shrieking about? the assassin asked, looking in Marrot's direction. She was no longer visible, having retreated behind the boulder again to keep the tiger men from seeing her. Although, if what Haplow suspected was true, they didn't need to see her. They knew what they were looking for and probably where to find it. Tiger men are coming, Haplow said shortly. What are they? You have house cats on Arianus? He with a hand nodded. Imagine one taller, stronger, faster than I am, with teeth and claws to match. Damn, Hugh looked impressed. There's a hunting pack, maybe twenty of the beasts. We can't fight them. Our only hope is to outrun them. But where we're going to run to is beyond me. Why don't we just lie low? They couldn't have spotted us yet. My guess is they know we're here. They've been sent to kill us. Hugh the Hand frowned skeptically, but didn't argue. Reaching into his pocket, he fished out his pipe, stuck it between his teeth, and stared down at Alfred, who was rubbing his injured ankles and trying to look as if the massage was helping. I'm really very sorry, he began. Haplow turned away. What do we do about him? The Hand asked in a low voice. He can't walk, much less run. I could carry him. No, that would weigh you down. Our only chance is to run and keep running until we drop. Tiger men are fast, but only in short bursts. They're not good at long distances. A low and urgent whistle from Marrot emphasized the need for haste. Haplo glanced over at the dog, then back at Alfred. You've ridden Dragon back, haven't you? Oh, yes, Alfred perked up. In Arianus. Sir Hugh would remember. It was when I was tracking Bane. But Haplo wasn't listening. He pointed at the dog, began speaking the rune softly. The animal, aware of something involving it was about to happen, was on its feet, its tail, its entire body, seeming to wag with excitement. Blue Sigler flared from Haplow's hand, flashed through the air, and twined about the dog. The rune sparkled over its body like the electric zingers of the Kixie when gone mad. The dog began to grow in size, expanding, enlarging. It came to Haplow's waist, then its muzzle was level with his head, and then it was looking down at its master, tongue lolling, bathing them all in a rain of slobber. Hugh the Hand gasped and staggered backward. Shaking his head, he rubbed his eyes. When he looked again, the dog was even bigger. I've had drunken hallucinations that weren't this bad. Alfred sat on the ground, stared up at the magically transformed animal with a doleful expression. Halting the magic, Haplo started toward the injured Sarton. Alfred made a pathetic attempt to stand, scrabbling backward up a convenient boulder. I'm much better, truly I am. You go on ahead, I... His protestations were cut short by an exclamation of pain. He would have fallen, but Haplow planted his shoulder in the sarton's middle, lifted him, and tossed him onto the back of the dog before Alfred knew precisely what had happened, where he was, or which end of him was up. Once he figured all these out, he realized he was sitting on the back of the dog, now the size of a young dragon, and he was well above the ground. Giving a low moan, shutting his eyes, Alfred flung his arms around the dog's neck and hung on for dear life, nearly choking the animal. Haplow managed to pry loose the sarton's death-like grip, at least enough to let the dog breathe. Come on, boy, he said to the animal. He looked over at the assassin. You all right? Hugh the Hand gave Haplow a quizzical glance. You people could take over the world. Yeah, said Haplow. Let's go. He and the assassin set off at a run. 
The dog, with Alfred clinging and groaning and keeping his eyes shut, trotted easily along behind. Haplow, keeping low, crept up the side of the ridge to join Merritt. He left the others at the bottom, awaiting his signal before proceeding. What have we got? he asked softly, though by now he could see for himself. Off to his left, a large group of tiger men was crossing the plain below. They loped along at a leisurely pace on two legs. They didn't pause to look around, but kept coming, and there were at least forty. This is no ordinary hunting pack, Haplow said. No, Merritt agreed. There are too many of them. They are not fanning out, not stopping to sniff the air. And they're all armed. All heading straight in this direction, and us with our backs against the mountain. Haplow scanned the vast plain in discouragement, and no help down there. I'm not so sure, Barrett said, sweeping her hand to her right. Look over there, on the horizon. What do you see? Haplow looked, squinted. Gray clouds hung low. Fingers of mist dragged over the tops of a distant stand of fir trees. The jagged peaks of snow-capped mountains could be seen when the mist lifted. And there, above the dull green of the firs, about halfway up the side of one of the mountains... I'll be damned, Aplo breathed. A fire! Now that his attention was drawn to the brilliant spot of orange, he wondered that he hadn't noticed it immediately, for it was the only splotch of color in the dismal world. He let hope, kindled by the flame, warm him an instant, then quickly stamped it out. A dragon attack, he said. It has to be. Look how far it is above the treetops. Mara shook her head. I've been watching the fire while you were down there fooling with the sarton. It burns steadily. Dragon flame comes and goes. It may be a village. I think we should try for it. Haplow looked at the tiger men, steadily decreasing the distance between themselves and their prey. He looked back at the flame, which continued to burn steadily, brightly, almost defiantly, lighting the gloom. Whatever decision they made would have to be made soon. Heading for the fire would carry them down the ridge, into the plains, clearly into view of the tiger men. It would be a desperate race. Hugh the Hand crawled up on his belly beside Haplow. What is it? he grunted. His eyes widened at the sight of the cats moving purposefully toward them, but he said nothing beyond another grunt. Haplow pointed. What do you make of that? A beacon fire, Hugh the Hand said promptly. There must be a fortress near here. Haplow shook his head. You don't understand. Our people don't build fortresses. Mud and grass huts easily put up, easily abandoned. Our people are nomads for reasons like that. He glanced at the tiger men. Hugh the Hand chewed thoughtfully on the pipe stem. It sure as hell looks like a beacon fire to me. Of course, he added dryly, removing the pipe. In a place where house cats are as big as men and dogs are as big as trees, I could be mistaken. Beacon fire or not, we have to try for it. There's no other choice, Marit insisted. She was right. No other choice. And no more time to stand here arguing about it. Besides, if they could just make the forest safely, that might discourage their pursuers. The tiger men didn't like the forests, the territory of their long-time foes, Wolfen and Snogs. Wolfen and Snogs, other threats they'd have to face. But one way of dying at a time. They'll spot us the moment we break cover. Run down the ridge and across the plains. Make straight for the trees. If we're lucky, they won't follow us into the forest. Not much use in setting an order of march. Try to keep together. Haplow looked around, brought the dog forward with a gesture. Alfred opened his eyes, took one look at the band of tiger men moving toward them, gave a groan, and shut his eyes again. Don't faint, Haplow told him. You'll fall off, and I'll be damned if I'm going to stop and put you back on. Alfred nodded, clutched the dog's fur even more tightly. Haplow pointed toward the woods. Take him there, boy, he ordered. The dog, realizing this was serious work now cast a baleful glance at the tiger men, and then stared at the forest with fixed determination. Haplow drew in a deep breath. Let's go. They plunged down the side of the ridge. Almost instantly, wild cat screams rose on the air. Horrible sounds that raised the hair on the back of the neck sent shivers through the body. Fortunately, the ridge was made of granite, solid and hard, and they were able to scramble down it swiftly. Moving at an angle away from the tiger men, the small band reached the level plains ahead of their pursuers. The ground was now smooth and flat. Whatever type of vegetation had once covered it appeared to have been deliberately cut down, allowing them to run unobstructed. The thought occurred to Haplow, bounding swiftly over the dark black dirt, that he might have been dashing across lush farmland perched high in the moss beds of Priam. The idea was ludicrous, of course. His people were hunters and gatherers, fighters and roamers, not farmers. He put the thought out of his mind, put his head down, and concentrated on pumping his legs. The level ground was an advantage to Haplow and his group, but it was also a distinct advantage to the tiger men. 
Taplo, glancing behind, saw that the creatures had dropped to all fours, their powerful limbs galloping with ease over the dirt and plant stubble. Their slant eyes glittered green. The glistening fangs in their panting mouths were spread wide in grins of bloodlust and the thrill of the chase. The dog had raced on ahead, Alfred bumping and jouncing, his legs flung up and back and sideways. The dog easily outdistanced those on foot. Casting a worried backward glance at its master, it started to slow, waited for him to catch up. Go on, Haplow shouted. The dog, though seemingly unhappy about leaving him behind, did as it was told. It sped for the woods. A clunk at Haplow's left side caused him to look down. The wicked, sharp edges of a cat's paw shone white against the soil. The weapon had fallen short of its mark, but not by much. He increased his speed using his magic to enhance his body's strength and stamina. Marrett was doing the same. Hugh the Hand was keeping up gamely when suddenly he pitched forward and lay face down in the dirt. Blood dribbled from a wound on his head. A cat's paw lay at his side. Haplow veered off course to help. Another cat's paw whined through the air. Haplow ignored it. The assassin was out cold. End of Side 7 To continue, turn the cassette over. Marit, Haplow called. She glanced back, first at him, then at their pursuers gaining on them. She made a swift motion with her hand that said, Leave him, he's finished. Haplow had his hand under Hugh's left shoulder, was dragging the unconscious man to his feet. Marit appeared at the human's right side. Something struck Haplow in the back, but he paid little attention to it. A cat's paw, but it had landed the wrong way, claws outward. Join the circle, he told Marit. You're crazy, she retorted. You'll get us all killed. And for what? A minch. Her tone was bitter, but when she looked at Haplow, he was startled and warmed to see grudging admiration in her eyes. Catching hold of Hugh the hand, she whispered the runes beneath her breath. The blue and red glow from her body flowed over the human as Haplow's magic flowed over him from the other side. Hugh the hand began to stumble forward, legs acting at the magic's command, not his own. He ran in a sleepwalking stupor, reminding Haplow of the automaton back on Arianus. Their combined magic kept the human going, but only at a cost to both the patrons. The forest appeared to be farther off than it had at the beginning of their mad dash. Haplow could hear the tiger men close behind them now, hear the thud of their paws in the dirt, the low growls and whines of pleasurable anticipation of the kill. No more cat's paws were thrown. Haplow wondered why at first, then realized grimly that the beasts had decided their crippling weapons were no longer necessary, the prey was obviously wearing out. Haplow heard a snarl. Marit screamed a warning. She let Hugh fall. A heavy weight hit Haplow from behind, dragged him down. Fetid breath on his face sickened him. Claws tore at his flesh. His defensive magic reacted. Blue rune fire crackled. The tiger man howled in pain. The weight on top of Haplow lifted. But if one tiger man had caught him, others wouldn't be far behind. Haplow levered himself up with his hands, struggled to regain his feet. He could hear Marit's shrill battle cries, caught a glimpse of her jabbing at one of the tiger men with a wooden spear. Haplow drew his dagger as another tiger man struck him, this time from the side. He and the tiger man went down, rolling over and over, Haplow stabbing with the knife, the tiger man tearing at the patron's unprotected face with ripping claws. A loud booming bark, roaring like thunder, erupted from overhead. The dog had dropped off Alfred, returned to join the fray. Grabbing hold of the tiger man on top of Haplow, the dog yanked the beast off and began to shake it back and forth, hoping to break its spine. And suddenly, astonishingly, Haplow heard calls and yells coming from the forest. Arrows whistled above him. Several of the tiger men shrieked and slumped to the ground. A group of patrons emerged from the trees. Hurling spears and javelins, they drove the tiger men away. Another flight of arrows sent the beasts fleeing back across the plains in thwarted rage. Haplow was dazed and bleeding. The cuts on his face burned like fire. Marit, he said, trying to find her in the confusion. She stood over the body of a tiger man, her bloodied spear in her hand. Seeing her unhurt, Haplow relaxed. Several patrons had hold of Hugh the Hand, and although obviously perplexed at the sight of a man bereft of tattoos, they were carrying him gently but hastily into the shelter of the woods. Haplow wondered wearily what they must think of Alfred. A woman knelt down beside Haplow. Can you walk? We caught the tiger men by surprise, but a pack that large will soon get its courage back. Here I will lend you my help. The woman reached for Haplow's hand to assist him to his feet, perhaps to share her magic with him. But someone moved in front of the woman. Marit's hand clasped his. 
Thank you, sister, said Mallet. He has help already. Very well, sister, said the woman with a smile and a shrug. She turned to keep an eye on the tiger men who had retreated but were prowling about at a safe distance. Hapler, with Marit's assistance, rose stiffly to his feet. He'd fallen with one knee bent at an angle, and when he tried to put his weight on it, pain shot through his leg. Reaching up his hand, he gingerly touched his face, drew his fingers back, red with blood. You were lucky the claws just missed your eye, Marit told him. Here, lean on me. Hapler's injury wasn't serious. He could have managed to walk on his own, but he didn't particularly want to. He draped his arm over Marit's shoulder. Her strong arms encircled him, supported him. Thanks, he said softly, for this, and she cut him off. We're even now, she returned. Your life for mine. And though her voice was chill, her touch was gentle. He tried to see into her eyes, but she kept her face averted from his. The dog had transformed back to its normal size, was gambling happily at his side. Looking ahead into the forest, Haplow saw Alfred standing on one foot like an ungainly bird, peering out at them, wringing his hands in anxiety. The patrons had carried Hugh the hand into the woods. He had regained consciousness, already attempting to sit up, waving off both their aid and their baffled and curious inspection. We would have made it safely, Marit said abruptly. If you hadn't stopped to help the mensch, it was foolish. You should have left him. The tiger men would have killed him. But according to you, he can't die. He can die, said Haplow, accidentally putting his injured leg to the ground. He winced. He comes back to life, and the memory comes back as well. The memory is worse than the dying. Pausing a moment, he added... We're a lot alike, he and I. She was silent, thoughtful. He wondered if she understood. They had almost reached the edge of the woods. Stopping, she looked sideways at him. The haplow I knew would have left him. What was she saying? He couldn't tell by her tone. Was it oblique praise? Or denunciation? Chapter 36 The Labyrinth The tiger men set up a howl of disappointment when the patrons entered the woods. If you and your friends can manage to go on a little farther without healing, the woman told Haplo, we should push ahead. The tiger men have been known to follow prey into the forest before now, and in such large numbers they won't give up easily. Haplo looked around. Hugh the Hand was pale. Blood covered his head, but he was on his feet. He couldn't understand the woman's words, but he must have guessed their import. Seeing Haplo's questioning glance, the assassin nodded grimly. I can make it. Haplo's gaze shifted to Alfred. He was walking on two feet as well as he ever walked on two feet, which meant that even as Haplow looked at him, Alfred tripped over an exposed tree root. Regaining his balance, he smiled. His hands fluttered. When he spoke, he spoke human, as did Hugh the Hand. I took advantage of the confusion when they went out to help you while no one was looking. I, well, the idea of riding on the dog again, I thought it would be easier. You healed yourself, Haplow concluded. He also spoke human. The patrons were watching them. They could use their magic to understand the mensch language, but they weren't doing it, probably out of politeness. They wouldn't need their magic in order to understand certain language, however, a language based on the runes. While they might not like it, they would have no difficulty recognizing it. Yes, I healed myself, Alfred replied. I deemed it best, save time and trouble, and unfortunate questions, Haplow said softly. Alfred glanced sideways at the other patrons and flushed. That, too... Paplo sighed, wondered why he hadn't thought of this sooner. If the patrons discovered Alfred was a Sarton, their ages-old enemy, an enemy that they'd been taught to hate from the moment they could understand what hatred was, there was no telling what they might do to him. Well, Haplo would try to keep up the pretense that Alfred was a mensch, like Hugh the Hand. That would be difficult enough to explain. Most patrons living in the labyrinth would have never heard of any of the so-called lesser races. They all would have heard of the Sarton. Alfred was looking sideways at Marit. I won't betray you, she replied scornfully. At least not yet. They might take out their wrath on the rest of us. With a scathing glance at the Sarton, she left Haplow's side. Several of the other patrons were moving on to act as scouts for the trail ahead. Marit joined them. Haplow dragged his thoughts back to the immediate dangerous circumstances. Keep near Hugh, he ordered Alfred. Warn him not to mention anything about Sarton. We don't want to give them ideas. I understand. Alfred's gaze followed Marit, walking with several of the patron men. I'm sorry, Haplo, he added quietly. Because of me, your people have become your enemies. Forget it, Haplo said grimly. Just do as you're told. Here, boy. Whistling to the dog, he began to limp on down the trail. 
Alfred fell back to walk beside Hugh the Ham. The patrons left the two strangers alone, though Haplow noticed that several patrons took up places behind, their eyes on Hugh and Alfred, their hands never far from their weapons. The woman, the leader of what Haplow assumed was a hunting party, joined him, walked along beside. She was burning with questions. Haplow could see the glittering light in her brown eyes, but she would not ask them. It was for the headman of the tribe to question a stranger, even the strangest of strangers. I am called Haplow he said, touching briefly the heart rune on his left breast. He wasn't required to tell her his name, but he did so out of courtesy and to indicate his gratitude for her rescue. I am Kari, she replied, smiling at him, touching her own heart rune. She was tall and lank, with the hard-muscled body of a runner. Yet she must be a squatter. Otherwise, what was she doing leading a hunting party? It was lucky for us you came when you did, Haplow remarked, limping along painfully. Kari did not offer to assist him, to do so would have been an insult to Marit, who had made it clear that she had some sort of interest in Haplow. Kari slowed her own pace to match his. She kept quiet watch as they walked, but she didn't appear particularly concerned that they were being followed. Haplow could see no indication from the sigla on his skin that the tiger men were trailing them. It was not luck, Kari replied calmly. He was sent to find you. The headman thought you might be in trouble. Now it was Haplow's turn to burn with questions, but... Out of politeness, he dared not ask them. It was the headman's prerogative to explain his reasons for doing something. Certainly the rest of the tribe would never consider offering explanations of their own, putting their words into another's mouth. The conversation lagged a bit at this point. Haplow glanced about with a nervousness that was not all feigned. Don't worry, said Kari. The tiger men are not following us. It wasn't that, Haplow answered. Before we met them, we saw flames. I was afraid that perhaps a dragon was attacking a village nearby. Kari was amused. You don't know much about dragons, do you, Haplow? Haplow smiled and shrugged. It had been a nice try. All right, so it isn't dragon fire. It is our fire, Kari said. We built it. Haplow shook his head. Then apparently you're the ones who don't know much about dragons. The blaze can be seen a long way off. Of course, Kari continued to be amused. It is meant to be seen. That's why we light it on the tower. It is a welcome fire. Haplow frowned. Forgive me for saying this, Kari, but if your headman has made this decision, it seems to me that he must suffer from the sickness. Footnote. Probably a reference to labyrinth sickness, a form of insanity affecting patrons brought on by the terrors and hardship of life in the labyrinth. End of footnote. I'm surprised you haven't been attacked before now. We have been. Kari said nonchalantly. Many, many times. Far more in past generations than these days, of course. Very few things in the labyrinth are strong enough or daring enough to attack us now. Past generations? Haplow's jaw sagged. Who in the labyrinth could speak of past generations? Few children knew their own parents. Oh, occasionally some large squatter tribe might date itself back to a headman's father, but that was rare. Generally the tribes were either wiped out or scattered. Survivors joined up with were absorbed into other tribes. The past, in the labyrinth, went back no further than yesterday, and one never spoke of a future. Haplow opened his mouth, shut it again. To ask any more would be insulting. He'd already overstepped the bounds as it was, but he was uneasy. He glanced more than once at the telltale sigler on his skin. None of this made sense. Were they being lured into some sort of elaborate trap? We are, he reminded himself, in the very heart, at the very beginning of the labyrinth. Come, speak freely, Haplo, Kari said, sensing his discomfort, perhaps his suspicion. What question is in your mind? I've come here for a purpose, he said to her. I'm looking for someone, a little girl. Her age would be seven, maybe eight gates. She is called Rue. Kari nodded calmly. You know her? Haplow's pulse quickened with hope. He couldn't believe it. He had found her already. I know several, Kari answered. Several? But how... Rue is not an uncommon name in the labyrinth, Kari said with a wry smile. I... I suppose not, Haplow mumbled. To be honest, he'd never thought about it, never considered the possibility that there might be more than one child in the labyrinth named Rue. He was not used to thinking of people in terms of names. He couldn't recall his parents' names or the name of the headman and the tribe that had raised him, even Marit. She had been the woman to him when he thought about her. The lord of the Nexus was just that, his lord. Haplow looked down at the dog trotting along next to him. 
The animal had saved his life, and he'd never bothered to give it a name. It wasn't until he had passed through death's gate, wasn't until he had entered the worlds of Mensch, that he'd really become conscious of names, come to think of people as separate beings, important beings, distinct and individual. And he wasn't the only one who had a problem with names. Haplow slid a glance back at Alfred, traipsing down the path, stumbling over any obstacle that presented itself, tripping over smooth ground if nothing else was available. What's your true name, Sarton? Haplow wondered suddenly. And why haven't you ever told anyone? The path had covered a long distance. Haplow's leg was giving him increasing trouble, causing him increasing pain before Kare finally called a halt. The grey gloom was darkening, night was coming. It was dangerous to travel through the labyrinth at any time, but far more dangerous after dark. They had reached a clearing in the forest near a stream. Kari examined it, consulted with her party, then announced that they would camp here for the night. Heal yourselves, she told Haplo. We have food for you. Then sleep in peace. We will keep watch. The patrons brought them hot food, cooking it over a small fire that they built in a clearing. Haplo was astounded at their boldness, but said nothing. To have registered any sort of protest would have been to question Kari's authority, something that, as a stranger and one who had been rescued by her, he had no right to do. He was relieved to note that they were at least sensible enough not to allow the blaze to smoke. Once her guests were served, Kari asked courteously if there were other comforts she could provide for them. Your two friends do not speak our language, she said, with a glance at Hugh and Alfred. Are their needs different from ours? Is there anything special we can bring them? No. Haplow replied, thank you. He had to give her credit. That, too, had been a nice try. Kari nodded and left. She set the watch, posting lookouts on the ground and in the trees. Then she and the rest of her people sat down to eat. She did not ask Haplow and the others to join her circle. This could be taken for a bad sign. One didn't share food with one's enemy. Or again, it might be courtesy, an assumption that since the two strangers did not speak the language, they would be more comfortable alone with their companions. Marit returned, silently joined them. She kept her eyes on her meal, a mixture of dried meat and fruit wrapped and cooked in grape leaves. The dog shared Haplow's meal, then flopped over on its side, and with a tired sigh, fell sound asleep. What's going on, Haplow? Hugh the Hand questioned, keeping his voice low. These people may have saved our lives, but they don't seem over-friendly. Are we their prisoners now? Why are we hanging around with them? Haplow smiled. It's nothing like that. They're uncertain of us. They've never seen people like you two, and they don't understand. No, we're not their prisoners. We could leave any time we wanted, and they'd never say a word. But it's dangerous traveling in the labyrinth, as you've seen. We need to rest, heal our wounds, build up our strength. They'll escort us to their village. How do you know you can trust them? The hand demanded. Because they're my people, Aplo returned quietly. Hugh the hand grunted. That little murderer Bane was one of my people. So was that accursed father of his? It's different with us, said Haplow. It's this place, this prison. For generations, ever since we were sent here, we've had to work together to simply survive. From the moment we're born, our lives are in someone else's keeping, either father or mother or maybe complete strangers. It doesn't matter. And it continues like that throughout our lives. No patron would ever hurt or kill or... or... betray his lord, Marit asked. She flung her food to the ground, jumping to her feet, startling the sleeping dog to wakefulness. She stalked off. Haplow started to call her back, faltered and fell silent. What could he say? The other patrons had stopped talking to stare at her, wondering what was wrong, where she was going. Marit grabbed a water skin and walked down to the small stream where she made a pretense of filling it. There were no stars or moon in the labyrinth, but the firelight reflected off the leaves of the trees, glanced off the surface of the stream, providing enough light to see by she took care to keep within the light. To do otherwise was to invite trouble. The other patrons went back to the meal and their talk. Kari followed Marit with her eyes, then turned a cool, thoughtful gaze on Haplo. He was cursing himself for a fool. What had he been thinking about? My people, so superior. He was beginning to sound like a sartan. Well, the late Sama, at least. Certainly not Alfred, a sartan who had difficulty feeling superior to dirt worms. So what's your point? Hugh the hand asked, filling in the awkward silence. Nothing, Kaplow muttered. Never mind. Maybe they did, in fact, have to worry about these patrons. We were sent to find you. The tiger man had been sent to find them, too. And Haplow was lying to his people, deceiving them, bringing the ancient enemy into their midst. 
A patron male who had accompanied Mara during the day went to the stream, started to sit down beside her. She turned her shoulder to him, averted her face. Shrugging, the patron walked off. Haplow stood up painfully, limped down to the stream. Marit was sitting alone, shoulders hunched, knees drawn up, her chin resting on her knees. Rolling herself into a ball, Haplow had once teasingly described this position. Hearing his footsteps, she glanced up, frowning, ready to repel any intrusion. Seeing that it was him, she relaxed somewhat, did not drive him away, as he had more than half expected. I came for some water, he said stupidly. She made no comment. The inane remark certainly didn't deserve one. He bent down, cupped his hand, drank, though he wasn't really thirsty. He sat down beside her. She did not look at him, but stared into the water, which was clear and cold and fast-running. I asked about our daughter, he said. There are several girls in the village about her age named Rue. I don't know why, but I didn't expect that. She said nothing, stared at the water. Picking up a stick, she thrust it into the stream. The water altered course, swirled around it in whirls and ripples, kept going. I hate this place. She said abruptly, I loathe it, fear it. I left it, but I never really left it. I dream of it always. And when I came back, I was frightened, but a part of me, a part of me... She swallowed, frowned, shook her head angrily. Felt as if you'd come home, he finished for her. Her eyes blinked rapidly. But I haven't, she said in a low voice. I can't. She glanced over her hunched shoulder at the patrons gathered together. I'm different. Another moment's silence, then she said, That's what you meant, wasn't it? About you and me being alike? Haplo knew exactly what she was thinking, feeling. Now I'm beginning to understand how the Sartan came to name Death's Gate. When we passed through Death's Gate, you and I both died, in a way. When we try to come back here, come back to our old life, it isn't possible. We've both changed. We've both been changed. Haplo knew what had changed him. He wondered very much what had happened to change Marit. But I didn't feel like this when I was in the Nexus, Marit protested. That's because being in the Nexus isn't truly leaving the labyrinth. You can see the final gate. Everyone's thoughts are centered in the labyrinth. You dream about it, as you said. You feel the fear. But now you dream about other things, other places. Did Hugh the Hand dream? Did he dream about that haven of peace and light he'd described? Was that what made it so hard, so very hard, to come back? And what did Marit dream? Whatever it was, she obviously wasn't going to tell him. In the labyrinth, the circle of my being encompassed only myself, Haplow went on. It never really included anyone else, not even you. She looked over at him. Just as yours never really included me, he added quietly. She looked away again. No names, Haplow continued. Only faces, circles touched, but never joined... She shivered, made a sound, and he stopped talking, waited for her to say something. She kept silent. Hapler had hit some vital part of her, but he couldn't tell what. He went on talking, hoping to draw her out. In the labyrinth, my circle was a shell, protecting me from feeling anything. I planned to keep it that way. But first the dog broke the circle, and after that, when I went beyond Death's Gate, other people just sort of seeped inside. My circle grew, expanded. I didn't intend it. I didn't want it. But what choice did I have? He was either there or die. I've known fear out there worse than any fear in the labyrinth. I healed a young man, an elf. I was healed by Alfred, my enemy. I've seen wonders and horrors. I've known happiness, hurt, sorrow. I've come to know myself. What changed me? I'd like to blame it on that chamber. That chamber of the damned, Alfred's seventh gate. A brush with the higher power, or whatever it was. But I don't think that was the cause. It was Limbeck and his speeches and Jara calling him a druz. It was the dwarf maid Grundle and the human girl Alaki who died in my arms. Haplow smiled, shook his head. It was even those four irritating, quarreling mench on Priam, Patham, Riga, Roland and Aliatha. I think about them. Wonder if they've managed to survive. Haplow touched the skin of his forearm. The tattoos were glowing faintly, indicating danger, but a danger that was far away. You should have seen how the mench stared when they first saw my skin start to glow. I thought Grundle's eyes were going to roll out of her head. Now, among my own people, I feel the way I did among the mench. I'm different. My journeys have left their mark on me. 
and I know that they must be able to see it. I can never be one of them again. He waited for Mallory to say something, but she didn't. She jabbed the stick into the water and huddled away from him. Obviously, she wanted to be alone. Standing up, he limped back to his bed to heal himself, as far as possible, and try to sleep. Exar, Mallory pleaded silently after Haplow had gone. Husband, Lord, please help me, guide me. I'm so afraid, so desperately afraid. And alone. I don't know my own people any more. I'm not one of them. Do you blame me for that? Exar questioned mildly. No, Marit answered, poking the stick into the stream. I blame Haplow. He brought the Menshir and the Sartan. Their presence puts us all in danger. Yes, but it may work for us in the end. You say you are at the very beginning of the labyrinth. This village, from what you describe, must be an incredibly large one, larger by far than any I ever knew existed. This suits me well. I have formed a plan. Yes, Lord. Marit was relieved, vastly relieved. The burden was to be lifted from her shoulders. When you reach the village, wife, this is what you will do. It was now extremely dark. Haplow could barely find his way back to the group. Hugh the Hand looked up at him hopefully, a hope that died when he saw that Haplow's hands were empty. I thought you had gone to get us something more to eat. Haplow shook his head. There is nothing more. We have a saying, the hungrier you are, the faster you'll run. The hand growled, and, scowling darkly, he went to the stream to fill his stomach with water. He moved silently, stealthily, as he always moved, as he had trained himself to move. Mallet didn't hear him coming, apparently, and when he drew near, she gave a violent start. A guilty start, the hand told Haplow later, describing the incident. And I could have sworn I heard her talking to someone. Haplow brushed it off. What else could he do? She was hiding something from him, of that he was certain. He longed to be able to trust her, but he couldn't. Did she feel the same about him? Did she want to trust him, or was she only too happy to hate him? Marit walked over to join the circle of patrons, tossing down her water skin among them as an offering. Perhaps she was out to prove that she, at least, was still one with her people. Carly looked over at Haplow, extending an invitation. He could have joined them if he had wanted, but he was too tired, too sore to move. His leg ached, and the scratches on his face burned like fire. He needed to heal himself to close the circle of his being as best he could, considering the circle was torn and would be forever. He scraped together a bed of dried fir needles and lay down. Hugh the Hand sat down beside him. I'll take the first watch, the assassin offered quietly. No, you won't, Haplow told him. To do so would be an insult. It would look as if we didn't trust them. Lie down, get some rest. You too, Alfred. The Hand thought he was going to argue. Then he shrugged and stretched himself out on the ground, propped up against the curved bowl of a tree. Anything says I've got to fall asleep, he asked, crossing his legs and taking out his pipe. Haplow smiled tiredly. Just don't make it look too obvious. He petted the dog, which had curled up beside him. It raised its head lazily, blinked at him, went back to its dreams. Hugh the Hand stuck the pipe between his teeth. I won't. If anyone asks, I'll say I'm troubled with insomnia. Eternal insomnia. He cast a dark glance at Alfred. The sergeant flushed, his face reddening in the glow cast by the fire. He had been attempting to find himself a place to sleep, but first he'd struck his head on a buried rock. Then he'd apparently sat down on an anthill, because he suddenly leapt to his feet and began slapping at his legs. Stop it, Haplow commanded irritably. You're drawing attention to yourself. Alfred collapsed hastily to the ground. A faint expression of pain crossed his face. He reached underneath him, removed a pine cone, and tossed it away. Catching Haplow's disapproving glance, the sergeant hunkered down in the dirt and attempted to look comfortable. Surreptitiously, his hand slid underneath his bony posterior, removed another pine cone. Haplow closed his eyes, began the healing process. Slowly, the pain in his knee receded. The burning cuts on his face closed. But he couldn't sleep. Eternal insomnia, as Hugh the Hand had put it. The other patrons set the watch, doused the fire. Darkness closed over them, lit only by the softly glowing sigla on the skin of his people. Danger was around them, always around them. Mallet did not return to her group, nor did she stay with the other patrons, but chose a place to sleep about halfway between both. Hugh the Hand sucked on the empty pipe. Alfred began to snore. The dog chased something in a dream. And just when Haplow had decided that he couldn't sleep, he slept. Chapter 37 the Citadel, Priam. 
Exar had reached a decision. His plans were formed. Now he set about putting them into action. He had arranged with Merritt for the patrons of the labyrinth to deal with Haplow, keep him safe until Sangdrax reached him. As for Sangdrax, Exar had concluded that the question of the dragon snake's loyalty was not a factor. After much thought on the matter, Exar was confident that Sangdrax's primary motivation was hatred. The dragon snake hated Haplow, wanted revenge. Sangdrax would not rest until he had sought out Haplow and destroyed him. That would take some time, Exar reasoned. Even for someone as powerful as Sangdrax, the labyrinth was not easily traversed. By the time the dragon snake had his coils wrapped around Haplow, Exar would be there to see to it that his prize was not damaged beyond usefulness. Exar's immediate problem was the killing of the mensch. Given the Lord's power and skill in magic, the murder of two elves, two humans, and a dwarf, none of them overly intelligent, should not be a concern. The Lord of the Nexus could have destroyed them all simultaneously with a few gestures in the air and a spoken word or two. But it was not the manner of their dying that worried him. It was the condition of the corpses after death. He studied the mensch under various circumstances for a day or two, and concluded that even dead they would never be able to stand up to the titans. The elven male was tall but thin with fragile bone structure. The human male was tall with good bones and muscle. Unfortunately, this male appeared to be suffering from pangs of thwarted love, and consequently had let his body go to ruin. The human female was stocky but muscular. The dwarf, though short in stature, had the strength of his race and was the best of a bad lot. The elven female was hopeless. It was essential, therefore, that the mensch in death should be better than they were in life. Their corpses had to be fit and strong, and, most important, they had to be endowed with a strength and stamina the wretches did not currently possess. Poison was the best way to murder them, but it needed to be a special concoction, one that would kill the body and at the same time make it healthier. A most intriguing dichotomy. Exar began with a flask of ordinary water. Working the rune magic, considering the possibilities, he altered the water's chemical structure. At last he felt confident that he had succeeded. He had developed an elixir that would kill, not immediately, but after a short period, say an hour or so, during which the body would begin a rapid acceleration of muscle and bone tissue, a process that would later be further enhanced by the necromancy. The poison had one drawback. The bodies would wear out far faster than ordinary corpses. But Exar did not need these mensch long. They had only to buy him enough time to reach the ship. The elixir finished, including the final additive of a pleasing flavor of spiced wine, Exar prepared a feast. He concocted food, then placed the poisoned wine in a large silver pitcher in the center of the table, and went to invite the mensch to a party. The first one he came across was the human female. He could never recall her name. In his most charming manner, Exar asked her to join him that evening for a dinner of the most wonderful delicacies, all compliments of the Lord's magical talent. He urged her to bring the others, and Riga, excited by this break in their dull routine, hastened to do just that. She went hunting for Pathan. She knew, of course, where to look for him. Opening the door to the star chamber, she peered inside. Pathan, she called, hesitant about entering. She hadn't gone into the chamber since the time the cursed machine had nearly blinded her. Could you come out here? I have something to tell you. Uh, I can't leave right at the moment, sweetheart. I mean, well, it might be a while. But, Pathan, it's important. Riga took a tentative step inside the doorway. Pathan's voice was coming from an odd direction. It will have to wait. I'm not really able... I've gotten myself in a bit of a... Can't quite figure out how to get down, you see. Riga couldn't see, at least not at the moment. Irritation overcoming her fear of the light, she walked into the star chamber. Hands on her hips, she glared around the room. Pathan, quit playing games this instant. Where are you? Up, up here. Pathan's voice drifted down from above. Astonished, Riga tilted her head, stared in the direction indicated. Name of the ancestors, Pate, what are you doing up there? The elf, perched on the seat of one of the enormous chairs, peered back down at her. He looked and sounded extremely uncomfortable. I came up here to, um, well, see what it was like from up here. The view, you know. Well, how is it? Riga demanded. Pathan winced at the sarcasm. Not bad, he said, glancing around and feigning interest. Really quite nice. View my ass, Riga said loudly. I can't, dear, not from this angle. If you could bend over... You climbed up there to try to figure out how the damn chair works, Riga informed him. And now you can't get back down. What did you have in mind? Pretending you're a titan? Or maybe you thought the machine would mistake you for a titan? Not but what it might, 
You've got all the brains of one. I had to try something, Riga. Peyton excused himself plaintively. It seemed like a good idea at the time. The Titans are the key to this machine. I just know it. That's why it's not working properly. If they were here, we'd all be dead, Riga inserted grimly. And there'd be nothing to worry about, least of all this stupid machine. How did you get up there? Going up was easy. The chair legs are sort of rough with lots of footholds, and elves were always pretty fair climbers, and... Well, just come down the same way. I can't. I'll fall. I tried once. My foot slipped. I was barely able to hang on. I could just picture myself pitching head first into that well. Pathan clutched the edge of the air seat. You can't believe how deep and dark that well looks from up here. I'll bet it goes clear into the center of Priam. I can imagine myself falling and falling and falling. Don't think about it, Riga told him irritably. You're only making it worse. It can't get much worse, Pathan said miserably. Just looking down, I feel like I might throw up. His face did have a greenish tinge. This whole business makes me feel like I might throw up, Riga muttered, taking a step or two backward just to be out of range. She eyed him thoughtfully. The first thing I'm going to do, if and when I ever get him out of here, is lock the door to this damn room and throw away the key. What did you say, dear? I said, what if Roland tosses up a length of rope? You could secure it to the arm of the chair, then shinny down it. Do you have to tell your brother? Payton groaned. Why can't you do it? Because it's going to take a strong arm to throw the rope that far, Riga returned. Roland will never let me live this down, Payton said bitterly. Look, I've got an idea. Go ask the wizard. Eh? came a quavering voice. Someone call for a wizard? The old man wandered into the room. Seeing Riga, he smiled, doffed his decrepit hat. Here I am. Glad to be of service. Bond's the name. James Bond. The other wizard, Peyton hissed. The useful one. Great Scott, the old man froze. It's Dr. No. He's found me. Don't be afraid, my dear. He reached out trembling hands. I'll save you. I can't get Lord Exar, Riga was explaining to Payton. That's what I came to tell you. He's busy planning a party. We're all invited. A party! How wonderful! The old man beamed. I'm quite fond of parties. Have to get my tucks out of mothballs. A party, Payton repeated. Yes, that would be great fun. Aliatha loves parties. We'll get her away from that strange maze where she spends all her time now. And get her away from the dwarf, Riga added. I haven't said anything because, well, she is your sister, but I think there's something sort of odd going on there. What are you implying? Payton glared down at Riga. Nothing, but it's obvious that Druger adores her. And let's face it, she's not really choosy about men. Oh, yes. After all, she did fall for your brother, Payton said viciously. Riga flushed in anger. I didn't mean... The old man, following Riga's gaze upward, gave a violent start. I say, it is, Dr. No... No, Payton began. You see, Ziphnab yelled, triumphant. He admits it. I'm Payton, Payton shouted, leaning farther over the edge of the chair seat than he'd intended. Shuddering, he slid hurriedly backward. The fool is stuck up there, Riga explained in icy tones. He's scared to come down. I'm not either, Payton retorted sullenly. I have the wrong shoes on, that's all. I'll slip. You're sure he's not no? The old man asked nervously. Yes, he's not, no. I mean, no, he isn't. Never mind. Riga was starting to feel dizzy herself. We've got to get him down. Do you have any spells? Dandy spell, the old man said immediately. Fire, fire, fireball, that's it. We set the chair legs on fire, and when they burn up... I don't think that will work, Payton protested loudly. The old man snorted. Of course it will. The chair goes up in flames, and pretty soon the seat doesn't have a leg to stand on, and whoosh, down she comes. Go get Roland, Payton said in resigned tones, and take him with you, he added with a dark glance at the old man. Come on, sir, said Riga. Trying not to laugh, she guided the old man, protesting out of the star chamber. Yes, I do think it would be fun to set the chair on fire. I wouldn't even mind setting Payton on fire, but maybe some other time. Perhaps you could go help Lord Exar with the party arrangements. Party, the old man said, brightening. I do love a good party. And hurry, Payton's voice cracked in panic. The machine's starting up. I think the starlight's about to come on. As Payton had said, Aliatha had been spending most of her time with Druger in the maze. And as she had promised, she had told no one about her discovery. She might have, if they'd been nice to her. Aliatha rarely troubled herself with the bother of keeping secrets. But the others, including Roland, especially Roland, were all just as idiotic and juvenile as always. 
Pathan's involved with that stupid machine of his, Aliatha told Druger as they traversed the maze. Riga's involved with trying to uninvolve Pathan with the stupid machine, and as for Roland, who knows or cares what he's doing? She sniffed. Let them hang around with that horrid, ugly exar. You and I have found interesting people, haven't we, Druger? Druger agreed. He always agreed with everything she said, and was more than willing to take her into the maze any time she wanted to go. They had gone the very next morning when the star machine was on, but as Druger had warned her, the fog people weren't around. Aliatha and the dwarf waited for a long time, but no one came. The starburst mosaic and the amphitheater remained deserted. Aliatha, bored, wandered around the mosaic, staring down at it. Why, look, Druger, she said, kneeling, isn't this pattern the same one that's on the city gate? Druger bent over to examine it. Yes, it was the same pattern, and in the center of the ruins was an empty place, the same as the empty place on the city gate. Druger fingered the amulet he wore around his neck. When he placed that amulet in the empty place, the gate opened. His fingers grew cold, his hand shivered. He backed away from the starburst hurriedly and glanced at Aliatha, fearing she had noticed, would have the same idea. But Aliatha had already lost interest. The people weren't here. The place was, for her, boring. She wanted to leave, and Drugal was quite ready to leave with her. That afternoon, however, the two came back. The light from the star machine was on and shining brightly. The people were walking around the same as before. Aliatha sat and watched them in mingled frustration and joy, tried to listen to them. They're talking, she said. I can see their mouths move. Their hands move when they talk, help shape their words. They're real people. I know they are. But where are they? What are they talking about? It's so irritating not to know. Druger fingered his amulet, said nothing. But her words stuck in the dwarf's mind. The two returned to the maze the next afternoon, and the afternoon after that. The dwarf now began to view the fog people the way Aliatha viewed them, as real people. He began to notice things about them. He thought he recognized some of the dwarves from the day previous. Elves and humans looked alike to him. He couldn't tell whether they were the same or not. But the dwarves, one in particular, he was certain had been there before. This dwarf was an ale merchant. Ruger could tell by the plaiting of his beard it was knotted in the guild braids and by the silver mug. Hanging from a velvet ribbon around the dwarf's neck, the mug was used to offer customers a taste of his brew, and apparently his ale was good. The dwarf was well-to-do, to judge by his clothes. Elves and humans greeted him with respect, bowing and nodding. Some of the humans even dropped down on one knee to talk with the dwarf, putting themselves at his eye level, a courtesy Druger had never in his life imagined a human offering a dwarf. But then he'd never in his life had much to do with humans or elves, for which he'd always been grateful. I've named that elf right there, Lord Gorgo, Aliatha said. Since the fog people wouldn't talk to her, she'd started talking about them. She'd begun to give them names and imagine what their relationships were to each other. It amused her, in fact, to stand right next to one of the shadowy men and discuss him with the dwarf. I knew a Lord Gorgo once. His eyes stuck out just like that poor man's eyes stick out. He does dress well, though, much better than Gorgo, who had no taste in clothes. That woman he's with, frightful. She must not be his wife. Look how she's clutching him. Low-cut dresses appear to be the fashion there, but if I had her bosoms, I'd button my collar up to my chin. What very handsome human males they have there, and walking about as freely as if they owned the place. These elves treat their human slaves very carelessly. Why, look, Druger, there's that dwarf with the silver mug. We saw him yesterday, and he's talking to Lord Gorgo, and here's a human coming up to join them. I believe I shall call him Rolf. We had a slave once named Rolf who... But Druger had stopped listening. Taking hold of the amulet, the dwarf left the bench where he'd been sitting, and for the first time ventured out into the midst of the people who seemed so real and were so false, who talked so much and were so silent. Druger, you're here with us! Aliatha laughed and whirled in a dance, her skirts billowing around her. Isn't it fun? Her dance ceased. She pouted. But it would be more fun if they were real. Oh, Druger, sometimes I wish you'd never brought me here. I like it, but it makes me so homesick. Druger, what are you doing? The dwarf ignored her. Removing the amulet from around his neck, he knelt down in the center of the starburst and placed the amulet in the empty spot, just as he had placed it in the same empty spot in the center of the city gate. He heard Aliatha scream, but the sound was distant, far distant, and he wasn't certain he was even hearing it at all. 
A hand clapped him on the back. You, sir! A voice boomed, speaking to Orban. A silver mug waved in front of Druger's nose. You'll be a stranger to our fair city, I'm wagering. Now, sir, how would you like a taste of the finest ale in all of Priam? Chapter 38 The Labyrinth Haplo woke the next morning, healed and rested, and lay quietly for long moments listening to the sounds of the labyrinth. He had hated this place while he was trapped here. It had taken from him everything he had ever loved. But it had given him everything he had ever loved as well. Only now did he realize it. Only now did he come to admit it. The tribe of squatters that had taken him in when he was a boy, after his parents had been killed, he couldn't remember any of their names, but he could see their faces in the pale gray light that was little more than a brightening of the darkness, but was morning to the labyrinth. He hadn't thought about them in a long time since the day he'd left. He'd put them out of his mind then, as he'd assumed they must have put him out of their minds. Now he knew better. The men who'd rescued that frightened little boy might still think about him. The old woman who'd housed and fed him must wonder about him, wonder where he was, what had happened to him. The young man who'd taught him the art of inscribing the sigler on weapons might be interested to know that his teaching had proved valuable. Haplow would have given a great deal now to find them, to tell them, to thank them. I was taught to hate, he mused, listening to the rustle of small animals, the bird calls he'd never truly heard until now, never truly forgotten. He rubbed the jowls of the dog, which was snoozing with its head on its master's chest. I was never taught to love. He sat up suddenly, disturbing the dog, which yawned, stretched, and dashed off to annoy foraging squirrels. Mallard lay by herself, apart from Haplow and his group, apart from the other patrons. She slept as he remembered seeing her sleep, curled up in the same tight ball. He remembered sleeping beside her, his body wrapped around hers, his stomach pressed against her back, his arms cradling her protectively. He wondered what it might have been like sleeping with her and the baby, the child between them, sheltered, protected, loved. To his astonishment, his eyes burned with tears. Hastily, embarrassed and half angry at himself, he rubbed the moisture dry. A stick snapped behind him. Haplow started to turn, but before he could hoist himself up, Hugh the Hand had leapt to his feet, was confronting Kari. It's all right, Hugh, Haplow said, standing up. He spoke human. She let us know she was coming. True enough, Kari had stepped on the stick on purpose, courteously calling attention to her nearness. These you term mensch, don't they require sleep? She asked Haplow. My people noticed your friend was awake all night. They have no rune magic to protect them, Haplow explained, hoping she hadn't taken offense. We have been through many dangers. He, that is, they, Haplow had to remember to include Alfred, are naturally nervous being in such a strange and terrifying place. And why have they come to this strange and terrifying place, was the question on Kari's lips. Haplow could hear the words as surely as if she'd spoken them, but to ask such a question was not her duty. She gave Hugh the hand a pitying look, spoke a few words in patron to Haplow, and handed over a chunk of hard bread. What was that all about? The hand wondered, glowering darkly after Kari. Haplow grinned. She says that you must be able to run like a rabbit, otherwise you'd never have lived this long. Hugh the hand wasn't amused. He glanced around grimly. I'm amazed anything lives long around here. There's a bad feeling to these woods. I'll be glad to get out of them. He stared morosely at the lumps of colorless dough Haplow held in his hands. That breakfast? Haplow nodded. I'll pass. Pipe in his mouth, the assassin wandered over to the stream. Haplow glanced to where Marit had been sleeping. She was awake now, doing what a patron always did first thing in the morning, checking old weapons, making new ones. She was eyeing a spear, a full-sized one with a sigler engraved rock head. It was a fine weapon, most likely a gift from one of the patrons. Haplow recalled the man who had met her by the stream. Yes, he'd been carrying a spear like that. Very fine, Haplow said, coming up to her. Well made. Marit jumped up, her hand tightening reflexively around the haft of the spear. I'm sorry, he said, startled at her reaction. I didn't mean to scare you. Marit shrugged, cold, nonchalant. I didn't hear you coming, that's all. This horrible place she said abruptly, glancing around. I'd forgotten how much I hate it. Taking out a knife, another present probably, she began improving a sigil carved on the spear's head. She had not once looked directly at him. I hate it, she repeated in a low voice. This may sound strange, said Haplow, but I was thinking this morning 
that it was sort of good to be back. My memories aren't all bad. Impulsively, he reached out to her. Her head snapped back. She whipped around. Her hair, flying, struck him, stung his face. She held the spear between them. We are even now. I saved your life. I owe you nothing. Remember that. Spear in hand, she walked off. Several of Kari's group were heading out, going to scout the path ahead. Marit joined them, took her place beside the man who had given her the spear. Confused, Haplo stared after her. Yesterday she had claimed him as hers, warned Kari away from him. Last night she'd talked to him. She had been glad, or so he had thought, to have him near her. All was ended. All was suddenly different. What had happened between then and now? Haplo couldn't guess. Kari and her people were breaking down their crude camp, preparing to travel. The birds had fallen silent. The only sounds were the angry chattering of three squirrels up a tree, throwing nutshells at the dog, barking beneath. Haplo looked at his skin. The sigler glowed softly. Danger, not near, but not far. Never far. He gnawed at a piece of bread. It filled the stomach. That was about all he could say for it. Could... could I have some of that? Alfred was standing beside him, eyeing the bread. Haplo practically threw it at him. Alfred fumbled, caught it, nibbled at a corner. He started to say something, but Haplo interrupted. Here, stupid dog, he whistled. Stop that noise. The animal, hearing the sharp and unaccustomed note of rebuff, fell immediately silent. Head down, it trotted back meekly, wondering what it had done wrong. Aren't you hungry? Alfred ventured. Haplo shook his head. You really should eat. You're in danger here, Haplo said grimly. Alfred looked alarmed, nearly dropped the bread. He glanced fearfully around him, probably expecting to see packs of tiger men swarming through the trees. Instead, he saw only Hugh the Hand, stripped to the waist, plunging his head and shoulders into the rushing stream. Nearby, Kari and her group were ready to move out. Kari waved to Haplo, motioned for him and his friends to join them. He waved back, indicating that she was to go on ahead. Kari looked at him dubiously, frowning. It wasn't wise to split up. He knew that as well as she. But then, he thought bitterly, he wasn't really part of her group anyway. He smiled reassuringly, held his hand up, palm out, to indicate that he would be all right, that they'd catch up in a moment. Kari shrugged and left. What you said about danger, I don't understand. Alfred began. You should go back. Back where? Alfred stared, helpless, confused. To the vortex. You the hand will go. Hell, you couldn't pry him loose from you. You'd stand a pretty fair chance of making it, I think. The tiger men, if they're still around, will be tailing us. But the vortex is destroyed. Not for you, Sarton. I've seen your magic. You killed the king dragonsnake. You raised the dead. You could probably lift up the pieces of that damn mountain and put it back together again. Alfred protested. You said I wasn't to use my magic. You saw what happened. I think the labyrinth will let you, especially if it knows you're leaving. Alfred flushed. His head down, he glanced at Haplo sideways. You... you said you needed me. I lied. I don't need you. I don't need anyone. What I came to do was hopeless anyway. My child is dead, murdered in your damn prison. Go on, Sarton, get out. Not Sarton. My name is... Don't say Alfred. Haplow was suddenly furious. That isn't your name. Alfred's a mensch name you took when you decided to hide out by becoming a mensch. No one knows what your real name is, because it's a Sarton name and you've never trusted anybody enough to tell them, so just... It is Corrin. What? Haplow blinked, pulled up short. My name is Corrin, Alfred repeated quietly. I'll be damned. Haplow mulled over what he knew of Sarton rune language. That means to choose, or something like that. Alfred smiled faintly. Chosen. Me, chosen. Ludicrous, isn't it? The name doesn't mean anything, of course. It's quite common among Sarton. Almost every family has, uh, had a boy they named Corrin hoping for a self-fulfilling prophecy. You see why I never told you? It wasn't that I didn't trust you. I didn't want you to laugh. I'm not laughing, Haplo said. Alfred looked very uncomfortable. You should be. It's really quite amusing. He with a hand, shaking the water off his head and shoulders, walked back up from the stream. He stopped to stare around the empty clearing, probably wondering what had happened to the others. You didn't think that name of yours was so amusing when you woke up and found yourself alone in that mausoleum, did you, Corrin? Haplow asked quietly. Halford was red again, then pale. His hands trembled. He dropped the bread to the extreme gratification of the dog. Sinking onto a tree stump, Alfred sighed, his breath rattling in his throat. 
You're right. Chosen. Chosen to live when everyone I had ever loved had died. Why? For what? They were all so much better, so much more worthy. Alfred looked up, his pale face hard, his trembling hand clenched. I hated my name then. I hated it. I was happy to take the name I bear now. I planned to forget the other one. And I succeeded. I had forgotten it until I met you. Alfred sighed again. He smiled sadly. Hapo looked back at the assassin, made him a sign. Hugh swung himself easily up into the branches of a tree, gazed ahead in the direction the other patrons had taken. He motioned back, raised one finger. So Kari was keeping an eye on them. She'd left one of the group to wait for them. Courtesy again. She was concerned, didn't want them to get lost. Haplo snorted. Alfred was prattling on, obviously deeply relieved to talk. Whenever you spoke to me, Haplo, even though you called me Alfred, I kept hearing Corin. It was frightening, and yet it felt good to me all at the same time. Frightening because I didn't understand, yet good. You reminded me of my past, my distant past, when my family and friends were still alive. How could you do this, I wondered. Who are you? At first I thought you might be one of my people, but I knew immediately that wasn't right. Yet you obviously weren't a mensch. And then I remembered. I remembered the ancient history. I remembered the stories about the... Forgive me, the old enemy. That night on Arianus, when we were imprisoned in the vat, I cast a spell on you, put you to sleep. Haplo stared, astonished. A spell on me? You? Alfred flushed. I'm afraid so. It was only a sleep spell. You wore the bandages around your hands to hide the tattoos. I crept over, lifted one of the bandages, and I saw... So that's how you knew. Haplo motioned for the assassin to join them. I wondered. And as fascinating as this trip down memory lane has been, Corin, it doesn't change the fact that you're in danger and you should leave. But it does, Alfred said, standing up so swiftly that he startled the dog. It bounded to its feet with a whuff. Ears up, hackles raised, wondering what was wrong. Now I know what my name means. It's just a name, damn it. It doesn't mean anything. You said so yourself. But it does mean something to me. You have taught me, Haplo. You even said it, not chosen, past tense, but to choose, present tense. Everyone else has always made my choices for me. I faint, Alfred spread his hands helplessly, or fall down, or... He cast a guilty glance at Hugh the Hand. When I do take action, I forget. Alfred stood up very straight, very tall. But now that's different. I choose to be here, Haplo. You said you needed me. You made me ashamed. You had the courage to come into this dreadful place. For what? For ambition? For power? No, you came for love. The labyrinth is afraid. Yes, but not of me. It's afraid of you, Haplo. You have brought into it the one weapon it doesn't know how to fight. Reaching down, Alfred timidly petted the dog, stroked its silky ears. I know it's dangerous, and I'm not certain how much help I can be, but I choose to be here, he said softly, not looking at Haplo. I choose to be here with you. They're watching us, said Hugh the Hand, coming up from behind. In fact, four of them have started back in this direction. They're all armed. Of course, it could be that they like us so much they can't bear to let us out of their sight, but I doubt it. The hand took the pipe out of his pocket, studied it thoughtfully. Putting it into his mouth, he spoke through his teeth. She betrayed us, didn't she? Yes, said Haplo, looking far back the way they'd come, far back to the ruined mountain. Chapter 39 The Citadel, Priam Roland, Riga, and Pathan stood outside the star chamber. Bright light welled out from under the door. Both Pathan and Roland were rubbing their eyes. Can you see yet? Riga asked anxiously. Yeah, said Roland bitterly. Spots, if you've blinded me, elf... It'll go away, Peyton was surly. Just give it time. I told you not to look down, Roland snarled. But no, you have to go stare into that damn well and pass out. I did not. My hands slipped. As for the well, Peyton shivered. It's fascinating in a creepy kind of way. Sort of like your sister, Roland sneered. Peyton aimed a blow in the human's general direction. Missing, slamming his fist into a wall, he groaned and began to suck on his bleeding knuckles. Roland's just teasing, Pate, said Riga. He doesn't mean anything. He's so in love with her himself he can't see straight. I may never be able to see anything, Roland retorted. As for my being in love with that slut... Slut! Pate hurled himself bodily at Roland. Apologize! 
The two went down in a heap, rolling around, pummeling each other. Stop it! Riga stood over them, screaming and occasionally kicking the one who happened to roll nearer her. Stop it, both of you! We're supposed to be going to the party! Her voice died away. Exar had appeared at the bottom of the stairs, leading to the star chamber. Arms crossed over his chest. He was staring up at them, the expression on his face dark and grim. Party! Riga repeated nervously. Phaethon! Exar's here! Get up, Roland, come on! You look like idiots, both of you. Still not able to see too well, but hearing the note of tension in Riga's voice, Phaethon left off hitting, staggered to his feet. His face burned with shame. He could imagine what the old man must be thinking. You knocked a tooth loose, Roland mumbled. His mouth was bloody. Shut up, Riga hissed. The after effects of the bright light were wearing off. Phaethon could see the wizard now. Exar was trying to look as if he found them amusing, but though the lines around his eyes were crinkled in a tolerant smile, the eyes themselves were colder and darker than the well in the star chamber. Staring into them, Phaethon had the same sort of queasy feeling in his stomach. He even found himself taking an involuntary step backward, away from the edge of the staircase. Where are the other ones? Exar asked, voice pleasant, benign. I want all of you to come to my party. What other ones? Riga asked, hedging. The other female, and the dwarf, Exar said, smiling. You ever notice how he never seems to remember our names? Roland said out of the corner of his mouth to Phaethon. You know, Riga gulped, Aliatha was right. He is ugly. She reached out, clasped hold of Phaethon's hand. I really don't want to go to this party. I don't think we have much choice, Phaethon said quietly. What excuse could we offer? Tell him we just don't want to go, Roland said, edging behind Phaethon. Me tell him? What's wrong with you telling him? Phaethon snapped. I don't think he likes me. Where is your sister, elf? Exar's brows came together over his nose. And the dwarf? I don't know. I haven't seen them. We'll go look for them, Phaethon offered hurriedly. Won't we? Yeah, right now. I'll help. Roland and Riga and the elf clattered down the stairs. At the bottom they stopped. Exar stood before them, blocking their way. The two humans shoved Phaethon to the front. Uh, we're just going to find Aliatha, my sister, Phaethon said faintly, and the dwarf, Druger, the dwarf. Exar smiled. Hurry, the food will grow cold. Right. Phaethon wormed his way around the wizard and bolted for the door. Riga and Roland were right behind him. None of them stopped running until they were out of the main building, standing on the wide marble steps that overlooked the empty and deserted city below. The citadel had never appeared quite so empty or so deserted as it did now. I don't like this, Riga said, her voice shaking. I don't like him. What does he want with us? Hush, be careful, Nathan warned. He's watching us. No, don't look. He's up there, on a balcony. What are we going to do? What can we do, Roland demanded. We go to his party. Do you want to make him mad? Maybe you don't remember what he did to those titans, but I do. Besides, how bad can it be? I say we're all jumping in our own shadows. Roland's right. It's only a party. If the wizard wanted to do anything bad to us, and there's no reason why he should, then he could do it from where he's standing. I don't like the way he looked at us, Riga said stubbornly, and he seems too eager, excited. At his age and with his looks, he probably doesn't get invited to a lot of parties, Roland suggested. Phaethon glanced at the dark-robed figure standing still and silent on the balcony. I think we should humor him. We'd better find Druger and Aliatha right away. If they've gone into that maze, you won't find them at all, much less right away, Riga predicted. Phaethon sighed, frustrated. Maybe you two should go back, and I'll try to find Aliatha. Oh, no, Roland said, latching onto Phaethon firmly. We're all going. Well, Phaethon began, I suppose then that we should split. Look, there's Aliatha now, Riga cried, pointing. The broad step they stood on overlooked the back of the city. Aliatha had just appeared around the corner of a building, her tattered dress a bright spot of color against the white marble. Good. That only leaves Druger. And surely the old man won't mind if we're missing the dwarf. Something's wrong with her, Roland said suddenly. Aliatha! He went dashing down the stairs, racing toward Aliatha. She had been moving toward them, running toward them, in fact. Phaethon tried to remember the last time he'd ever seen his sister run. But now she had stopped and was leaning against the wall of a building, her hand pressed over her breast as if in pain. Aliatha, Roland said, coming up to her. Her eyes were closed. Opening them, she looked at him thankfully, and with a sob reached out to him, nearly fell into his arms. He clasped her, held her fast. What's wrong? What's the matter? Druger, Aliatha managed to gasp. 
What did he do to you? Roland cried, clutching her fiercely. Did he hurt you by the ancestors of... No, no, Aliatha was shaking her head. Her hair floated around her face in an ashen blonde, shimmering cloud. She gasped for breath. He's disappeared. Disappeared? Payton came up, Riga alongside. What do you mean, Thea? How could he disappear? I don't know. Aliatha lifted her head, her blue eyes wide and frightened. One minute he was there, next to me, and the next... She put her head against Roland's chest and began to cry. He patted her on the back, looked questioningly at Payton. What's she talking about? Beats me, said Payton. Don't forget Exar, Riga inserted quietly. He's still watching us. Was it the Titans? Thea, don't go getting hysterical. Too late, he said, eyeing her. Aliatha was sobbing uncontrollably. She would have fallen but for Roland. Look, something terrible must have happened to her. He lifted her tenderly in his arms. She doesn't normally come apart like this, not even when the dragon attacked us. Peyton had to agree. He was now growing anxious and upset himself. But what should we do? Riga took charge. We've got to get her calmed down long enough for her to tell us what happened. Take her back into the main building. We'll go to the stupid party, get her a glass of wine to drink. If something dreadful did happen, like the Titans broke in and snatched Druger, then Lord Exar should know about it. He may be able to protect us. Why would the Titans come in and snatch Druger? Payton asked. A perfectly logical question, but one which went unanswered. Roland couldn't hear him over Eliath's gulping sobs, and Riga gave the elf a disgusted look and shook her head at him. Get her a glass of wine, she repeated, and the three returned in a procession back to the main building. Exar met them at the door, frowned at the sight of the hysterical elven woman. What is wrong with her? She's had some sort of shock, Payton said. Riga had elected him spokesperson with a jab in his back. We don't know what's wrong because she's too upset to tell us. Where is the dwarf? Exar asked, frowning. At this, Aliatha gave a strangled scream. Where is the dwarf? That's a good one. Covering her face with her hands, she began to laugh wildly. Peyton was growing more and more worried. He had never seen his sister this upset over anything. He's been going into the maze, Riga chimed in nervously. We thought a glass of wine. Both realized they were talking at once and fell silent. Exar gave Riga a sharp look. Wine, he said. His gaze went back to the elf woman. You are right. A glass of wine will improve her spirits immensely. All of you must take one. Where did you say the dwarf was? We didn't, Phaethon returned somewhat impatiently, wondering why this emphasis on Druger. If we can just get Aaliyah to calm down, perhaps we'll find out. Yes, Exar said softly. We will calm her down, and then we will find out all we need to know. This way. He sidled around behind them, extended his arms. This way. Peyton had seen human farmers walking their fields at harvest time, sweeping their scythes through the tall grain, cutting it down with broad strokes. Exar's arms were like those scythes, sweeping the small group up, cutting them down. Peyton's instinct was to bolt. He forced himself to go along with the others, however. What's there to be afraid of, he asked, feeling foolish. He wondered if the other two shared his apprehensions and cast them a quick glance. Roland was so worried about Aliatha, he would have walked right off a cliff without knowing it. But Riga was obviously nervous. She kept peering over her shoulder at Exar as he urged them forward with those scythe-blade arms. He shepherded them toward a large circular room that might have formerly served as either a banquet hall or a meeting room. A round table stood in the center. The room was beneath the star chamber, and it was one place in the deserted citadel that none of the mensch ever entered. At the arched doorway, Peyton came to a sudden stop, so sudden that Exar bumped into him, the old man's gathering arm encircling him. Riga halted beside Peyton and, reaching out her hand, plucked her brother's sleeve, alerting Roland to their whereabouts. What is it now? Exar's voice had an edge to it. We... we don't go in here, Peyton said. This room doesn't want us in here, Riga added. Nonsense, Exar snapped. It's only a room. No, it's magical, Peyton said in a low, awed voice. We heard voices, and the globe... He paused, stared. It's gone, Riga gasped. What is? Exar was mild again. Tell me. Why, there used to be a crystal globe hanging over the table. It had four strange lights inside. And when I went over to look at it, I put my hand on the table and suddenly I heard voices. They spoke in a strange language. I couldn't understand them. But they didn't seem to want me in here, so I left. And we've never been back since, Vika said, shivering. 
But now the globe is gone. Peyton looked hard at Exar. You moved it. Exar appeared amused. I moved it. And why would I do such a thing? This room is no different from any other in the Citadel. I found no globe, heard no voices. But it does make an excellent place for a party, don't you agree? Come, please, come inside. No magic, I assure you. Nothing will harm you. Look at all that wonderful food, Roland gasped. Where did all that come from? Well, Exar said modestly, perhaps a little magic. Now, please, come, sit, eat, drink. Put me down, Aliatha commanded in a perfectly calm, if somewhat tear-ragged voice. Roland jumped, almost dropped her. He'd been staring at the food. We have to go back, Aliatha wriggled in his arms. Put me down, you don't, don't you understand? We have to go to the maze. Druger went with them. We have to make him come back. Druger went where? With who? Phaethon demanded. Put me down! Aliatha glared at Roland, who, his face grim, dumped her unceremoniously on the floor. I hope you don't think I enjoyed that, he said coldly, and walked over to the delicacy-laden table. Where's the wine? In a pitcher, Exar gestured, his gaze on Aliatha. Where did you say the dwarf was, my dear? She cast him a haughty glance, turned her back on him, spoke to Peyton. We were in a maze. We found the theater. There are people there, lots of people, elves and humans and dwarves. Quit kidding, Thea, Peyton flushed, embarrassed. Where's the wine? Roland mumbled, his mouth full. I'm serious, Aliatha cried, stamping her foot. They're not real people. They're only fog people. We can see them when the starlight comes on. But, but now, her voice quivered. Drugas, one of them, he's changed into fog. She grabbed hold of Peyton's arm. Just come, will you, she insisted angrily. Maybe after we have some food... Peyton attempted to placate his sister. You should eat something toothier. You know how you see things on an empty stomach. Yes, Exar hissed the word unpleasantly. Eat, drink. You will all feel much better. I found the wine pitcher, Roland called. But it's empty. The wine's all gone. What? Exar whipped around. Roland held out the empty pitcher. See for yourself. Exar snatched the pitcher, glared inside. A small amount of reddish liquid sloshed around in the bottom. He sniffed at it. He raised his gaze to the four, who shrank back, alarmed at his fury. Who drank this? From beneath the table came a thin, strident voice, raised in song. Goldfinger! Exar's face blanched, then went red with outrage. Reaching beneath the table, he caught hold of a protruding foot, tugged on it, dragged the foot out. The rest of the old man came along with it, sliding on his back, singing happily to himself. You drank the wine. All the wine. Exar could barely talk. Ziphnab gazed up at him with watery eyes. Lovely bouquet. Exquisite color. Slightly bitter finish, but I suppose that must be due to the poison. He lay on his back, began singing again. You only live twice. Poison. Pathan caught hold of Riga, who clutched at him. Roland choked on the food, spit it out all over the floor. He's lying, said Exar harshly. Don't believe the old fool. This is a prank. The lord of the Nexus bent down swiftly, put his hand on the old man's chest, began to mutter and move his fingers in a strange pattern. But suddenly the old man's face contorted in pain. He let out a horrible cry. His hands clawed at the air, his body twisted and twitched. Reaching out, he grabbed hold of the hem of Aliatha's skirt. Poison, he meant for you, Ziphnab gasped. His body curled in on itself. He writhed in agony. Then he stiffened, shuddered. A final convulsive scream, and the old man lay still. His eyes were open, wide and staring. His hand was locked firmly onto Aliatha's skirt. He was dead. Horror-stricken, Peyton stared at the corpse. Roland was off in a corner, heaving his guts out. Exar's eyes swept over them, and Peyton saw the gleam of the scythe blade sweeping past, mowing them down. It would have been a painless death, Exar said, swift, simple. But this fool has changed all that. You must die, and you will die. Exar reached out his hand toward Aliatha. She stood terrified, unable to move, her dress caught in the corpse's grip. Aliatha had a dim impression of Pathan leaping in front of her, knocking aside the wizard's hand. Wanting only to escape this horrible place, this terrible man, the hideous corpse, Aliatha tore her skirt from the dead man's hand and ran panic-stricken from the chamber. Chapter 40 The Labyrinth what do you mean? She's betrayed us. 
Alfred asked nervously. Marrett's told them you're a sergeant, Haplow answered, and that I brought you into the labyrinth. Alfred gave the matter careful thought. Then she's only really betrayed me. I'm the one putting you in danger. He thought longer, brightened. You could tell them that I am your prisoner, that... His words died out at the sight of Haplow's grim expression. Marrett knows better. She knows the truth. And I've no doubt she's told them. I just wonder, Haplow added somberly, staring into the forest, what else she's told them. Are we just going to stand here? Hugh the Hand demanded, scowling. Yes, said Haplow quietly. We're just going to stand here. We could run, Haplow pointed. A good idea. I've been trying to convince Corin here to... Alfred, the sergeant corrected meekly. Please, that is my name. I, I don't know that other person. And no, I'm not going back. I go where he goes, said Hugh the Hand. The Fatrons were in sight now and moving closer. We can fight. No, said Haplow, not pausing, not even considering. I won't fight my own people. Bad enough. He stopped. Let it hang. They're taking their own sweet time. Maybe you made a mistake about her? Haplow shook his head. They know we're not going anywhere. His mouth twisted in a grim smile. Besides, they're probably trying to figure out what to do with us. Hugh the Hand gave him a puzzled look. You see, Haplow explained, they're not used to taking another patron prisoner. There's never been any need. He looked around at the gray sky, the dark trees. When he spoke, it was softly to himself. This was always a terrible place, dangerous, deadly. But at least we were united, one against it. Now what have I done? The patrons, led by a stoic Kari, surrounded the three. Serious charges have been leveled against you, brother, she said to Haplow. Her gaze went to Alfred, who flushed clear up his bald scalp and managed to look extremely guilty. Kari frowned, glanced back at Haplow. Probably she was expecting him to deny everything. Haplow shrugged his shoulders, said nothing. He began walking. Alfred, Hugh the Hand, and the dog followed. The patrons closed ranks behind them. Marrett was not among them. The group moved silently through the forest, the patrons ill at ease, uncomfortable. When Alfred fell, as he did repeatedly, circumstances and his surroundings combining to make him clumsier than usual, the patrons waited grimly for him to regain his feet. They did not offer help, nor would they permit Haplow or Hugh to go near the Sarton. At first they'd regarded him with grim-faced enmity, but now, after he'd tumbled headlong over a tree root, walked into a bog, and nearly brained himself on an overhanging limb, they began exchanging questioning glances among themselves, even as they redoubled their watchfulness. It could, of course, all be an act designed to lull them into complacency. Haplow recalled thinking exactly the same thing himself the first time he'd met Alfred. Boy, did they have a lot to learn. As for the human assassin, the patrons treated him with disdain. Most likely they had never heard of Mensch. Haplow himself had not learned of the existence of these lesser races until Exar informed him. Footnote, Exar learned of the existence of the Mensch in the Nexus, reading the literature left behind by the Sarton. End of footnote. But Marat would have told them that Hugh the Hand lacked the rune magic, was therefore harmless. Haplow wondered if she had thought to tell them that this man could not be killed. When his fellow patrons looked at Haplow at all, which was rarely, they were shadow-eyed and angry. Again he wondered uneasily what Marat had told them, and why. The trees began to thin out. The hunting party was nearing the edge of the forest, and at this point Kari called a halt. Before them stretched a vast open field of short-cropped, waving grass. Haplow was astonished to see signs that some animal had been grazing in the area. If these were mensch, he would have guessed they were raising sheep or goats. But these weren't mensch. They were his people, and they were runners, fighters, not shepherds. He would have liked very much to ask Kari, but she wouldn't answer any question of his now. Wouldn't so much as tell him whether it was day or night. Across the grass, about a hundred paces away, a river of dark water churned and hammered through steep banks. And beyond that, Haplow stared. Beyond the river, with its black and ugly water, was built a city. A city in the labyrinth. He couldn't believe it, but there it was. Blinking didn't cause it to disappear. In a land of squatters, nomads who spent their lives trying to escape their prison, was a city. Built by people who weren't trying to escape. People who were settled, content. Not only that, but they'd lit the beacon fire, the call to others. Come to us, come to our light, come to our city.
Strong buildings made of stone, covered with rune markings, stood stolidly on the side of a gigantic mountain, on the top of which burned the beacon fire. Probably, Haplow guessed, these buildings had started as caves. Now they extended outward, the floors of some resting on the roofs of others. They marched down the mountainside in an orderly manner, gathered together at the bottom. The mountain itself seemed to stretch out protective arms around the city built on its bosom. A large wall made of the mountain's stone encircled the city. Rune magic inscribed on the wall enhanced its defenses. My goodness, said Alfred. Is, is this usual? No, not usual. Marit was here. She was obviously not pleased at being here, but with the dangerous river crossing to be made, out in the open, a prey to any enemy, she'd been forced to wait for the rest of the party. She stood apart from the others, her arms crossed over her chest. She did not look at Haplow, pointedly avoided looking at him. He would have liked to talk to her. He took a step toward her, but several patrons moved to block his way. They appeared uncomfortable. Perhaps never in their lives had they feared or distrusted one of their own. Haplow sighed, wondered how he could make them understand. He raised his hands, palms outward, indicating he meant no harm, that he would obey their rules. But the dog was under no such constraints. The trip through the forest had been a boring one for the animal. Whenever it had sniffed up something interesting, prepared to set off in pursuit, its master had called it sharply to heel. This would have been bearable if the dog had been made to feel that its presence was appreciated. But Hapler was preoccupied, wrapped in dark and gloomy thoughts, and refused to pat the dog's head or acknowledge its friendly licks. If it hadn't been for Alfred, the dog would have considered this trip a waste of footpath. The Sarton, as usual, had proved highly diverting. The dog had recognized that it was going to be responsible for steering Alfred safely through the forest. Certain minor disasters couldn't be helped. The dog can only do so much. But the animal successfully averted several major catastrophes, such as pulling Alfred out of the tangles of a loathsome blood vine and knocking him flat when he would have otherwise walked into a spike-lined pit, a trap set by roving snogs. At last they had reached level, unobstructed ground, and while the dog knew that this didn't necessarily mean Alfred was safe, the Sartan was, for the moment, standing perfectly still. If anyone could get himself in trouble standing still, it was Alfred, but the dog considered that it might relax its vigil. The patrons gathered at the edge of the forest, while several of their number fanned out to make certain that they would be safe crossing the river. The animal looked at its master, saw, with regret, that nothing could be done for him beyond a licked reminder that a dog was here and available for comfort. An absent-minded pat was the animal's reward. The dog glanced about for a new diversion and saw Marit, a friend, someone not seen in a few hours, someone who, by the looks of her, needed a dog. The dog trotted over. Marit stood in the shadow of a tree, staring at nothing that the dog could see. But what she was doing might have been important, and so the dog padded up softly so as not to disturb her. The dog pressed its body against Marit's leg, looked up at her with a joyful grin. Startled, Marit jumped, which made the dog jump, too, causing both to fall backward, eye each other warily. Oh, it's you, Marit said, and while not understanding the words, the dog understood the tone, which, while not exactly welcoming, wasn't unfriendly either. End of Side 8. Change Side Selector Switch. This book is continued on the next cassette. The woman sounded lonely and unhappy, desperately unhappy. The dog, forgiving her for startling it, once again came forward, tail wagging, to renew old acquaintance. Go away, she said, but at the same time her hand caressed the dog's head. The caress changed to a desperate clutch. Her fingers dug painfully into the animal's flesh. This was not very comfortable, but the dog restrained a yelp, sensing that she was in pain herself, and that somehow this helped. The animal stood calmly at the woman's side, letting her maul its ears and crush its head against her thigh, wagging its tail slowly and gently, giving its presence since it could give nothing more. Haplow lifted his head, looked over at them. Here, dog, what are you doing? Don't bother her, she doesn't like you. Keep close to me. Marit's fingers that stopped their painful kneading were soft and stroking. But suddenly she jabbed sharp nails into the dog's flesh. Now nah, it yelped. Get, Marit said viciously, pushing the animal away. The dog understood. It always understood. If only it could impart such understanding to its master. We can cross now. It's safe, Kari reported. Safe enough, at any rate. Made of a single narrow span of rock, carved with runes, the bridge across the river was no wider than a man's foot. Slick with the spray of the turbid water rushing far below, the bridge was part of the defenses the patrons had established around their city. Only one person could cross at a time, 
and that with the utmost care. One slip and the river would claim its victim, drag him down into its bone-chilling, black and foaming rapids. The patrons, accustomed to the crossing and bolstered by their natural magic, ran over the bridge with ease. Once on the other side, several headed for the city, probably alerting the headmen to their coming. Marat crossed over in one of the first groups, but, Haplow noticed obliquely, she waited on the shore. Kari came up to Haplow. She and three other patrons were spread out along the riverbank, keeping watch on the woods behind them. Have your people crossed now, she said. Tell them to hurry. She looked down at the sigler on her skin, on Haplow's. Both glowed blue, brighter. Hugh the Hand, pipe in his mouth, frowned down at the narrow bridge, examined it closely. Then, shrugging, he strolled across with nothing more than a wobble or two, a pause to ascertain his footing. The dog trotted along behind, pausing midway to bark at something it thought it saw in the water. And that left Haplow and Alfred. I... I have to... to... The Sarton stared at the bridge and stammered. Yes, you have to, Haplow replied. What's the matter with him? Kari asked irritably. He is afraid of... Haplow shrugged, left the rest of the sentence unsaid. Kari could fill in the black. She was suspicious. He possesses magic. Didn't Marat tell you about that, too? Haplow knew he sounded bitter, but he didn't particularly care. He can't use his magic. The last time he did, the labyrinth caught it, used it on him. The way the Caedon will catch a thrown spear, use it on the one who threw it. Damn near killed him. He is our enemy, she began. That's strange, Haplow said quietly. I thought the labyrinth was our enemy. Kari opened her mouth, shut it again. She shook her head. I don't understand this, any of this. I will be glad to turn you over to Hedman Vasu. You had better find some way to get your friend across. Where Alfred stood, staring with wide, frightened eyes at the narrow bridge. Kari and her three companions kept an uneasy watch on the forest behind them. The other patrons waited for them on the opposite shore. Come on, Haplow urged. It's just a river. No, it isn't, Alfred said with a shuddering glance at the rushing water. I get the feeling it hates me. Haplow paused, startled. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, the river might very well hate him. He considered telling Alfred a comforting lie, but knew Alfred wouldn't believe him. The truth was probably better than whatever Alfred might dredge up out of his imagination. This is the river of anger. It winds through the labyrinth, runs deep and fast. According to legend, this river is the one thing in the labyrinth we patrons created. When the first of our people were cast into this prison, their rage was so terrible that it spewed forth from their mouths, became this river. Alfred stared at him in horror. The water is deathly cold. Even I, protected by my rune magic, could only survive in it a short time. And if the cold doesn't kill you, the water will batter you to death on the rocks, or the weeds will drag you down and hold you underneath the water until you drown. Alfred had gone white. I can't. You cross the fire sea, said Haplow. You can cross this. Alfred smiled faintly. A tinge of color returned to his pale cheeks. Yes, I did cross the fire sea, didn't I? Crawl on your hands and knees, Haplow advised, prodding Alfred toward the bridge, and don't look down. I crossed the fire sea, Alfred was repeating to himself. Reaching the narrow span, he blanched, gulped, and, drawing in a deep breath, placed his hands on the wet stone. He shivered. And you'd better hurry, Haplow advised, leaning over to speak in his ear. Something nasty is gaining on us. Alfred stared at him, his mouth open. He might have thought Haplow was just saying this to urge him on, but the sergeant saw the blue glow on the patron's skin. Nodding dismally, Alfred squinched his eyes tight shut, and by feel alone started crawling across. What's he doing? Kari demanded, amazed. Crossing the bridge? With his eyes closed? He doesn't manage all that well with his eyes open, Haplow said dryly. I figure this gives him a chance. It's going to take him the rest of the day. Cowdy observed after a tense few moments spent watching Alfred inching his way along. And they didn't have the rest of the day. Haplow scratched at his hand. The rune glow, warning of danger, was growing brighter. Kari peered back into the forest. The patrons on the opposite shore watched with dark expressions. Several people had arrived coming from the direction of the city. In their midst was a young man, probably near Haplow's age. Absorbed in mentally urging Alfred along... Happily would not have noticed one man among the rest, except that this particular man was markedly unusual. Most patrons, male and female alike, are lean and hard-muscled, from lives spent either in running or in fighting to survive. This man's sigler-covered flesh was soft, his body rounded, shoulders heavy, stomach protruding. 
but by the deferential way the other patrons treated him, Haplow guessed that this was the headman, Vasu, a name that meant bright, beneficent, excellent. Vasu came to stand on the shoreline, watching, listening with slightly inclined head, as several patrons explained what was happening. He gave no commands. Kari was by rights in charge here. It was her group. In this situation, the headman was an observer, taking control only if things began to fall apart. And so far, everything was going well. Alfred was making progress, better than Haplow had dared hope. The bridge's rock surface, though wet, was rough. The sergeant was able to dig his fingers into cracks and crevices and pull himself along. Once his knee slipped. Catching himself, he managed to hang on. He straddled the bridge with his legs. Eyes tightly shut, he gamely kept going. He was halfway across when the howl rose from the forest. Wolfen, said Kari with a curse. The howling sounds made by the wolfen are eerie and unnerving. The howl is bestial, but there are words in it, singing of torn flesh and warm blood and cracked bones and death. One howl rose from the forest. Others answered it. Alfred, startled and alarmed, opened his eyes. He saw the black water boiling below. Panic-stricken, he flung himself flat, clung to the bridge, and froze. Haplo swore, Don't faint, damn it, just don't faint! Wolfen, don't howl. Don't make their presence known unless they are ready to attack. And by the sounds, it was a pack of them, far too many for Kari and her small band to fight alone. Vasu made a swift gesture with his hand. The patrons ranged along the bank, taking aim with bow and arrow and spear, prepared to cover their crossing. Calling to Alfred to keep moving, Hugh the Hand edged down near the bridge as far as he dared, ready to pull the sergeant to shore. Haplow jumped on his end of the bridge. You'll never make it, Kari cried. The bridge's magic only permits one person to cross at a time. I will take care of this. She raised her spear, aimed it at Alfred. Haplow grabbed her arm, stopped her throw. She wrestled away from him, glared at him. He's not worth the lives of three of my people. Get ready to cross, Haplow told her. He started forward, but at the same time the dog leapt past Hugh the Hand, landed on the bridge, and headed for the sarton. Haplow paused, waited. The magic would certainly thwart him, but it might not affect the dog. Behind him he could hear the wolfen crashing through the underbrush. The howls were growing louder. Alfred lay on his belly, staring down in horrible fascination at the water, unable to move. The dog ran lightly over the bridge. Reaching Alfred, the animal barked once, tried to rouse him from his stupor. Alfred didn't even seem to hear it. Frustrated, the dog looked to its master for help. Kari lifted her spear. Across the water, Vasu made a sharp, peremptory motion with his broad hand. His collar! Haplow shouted. Grab the collar! Either the dog understood, or it had reached the same conclusion. Digging its teeth firmly into Alfred's collar, the dog tugged. Alfred moaned, grasped the bridge even more tightly. The dog growled deep in its throat. Collar or flesh, which will it be? Gulping, Alfred let go of his desperate hold. The dog, edging its way backward across the narrow span, dragged the limp and unresisting Sarton along with it. Hugh the Hand and several patrons waited at the far end. Catching hold of Alfred, they hauled him up safely onto the shore. Go! Kari ordered, her hand on Haplow's shoulder. She was in charge. It was her privilege to be the last one to cross. Haplow didn't waste time arguing, but hastened over the bridge. When he was clear, the other patrons followed behind him. The wolfen broke from the forest just as Kari set her foot on the span. The wolfen barked in dismay at the sight of their prey escaping, and dashed after Kari, hoping to catch one at least. A rain of spears and arrows, enhanced by the rune magic, flew across the river and halted their pursuit. Kari reached the other side safely. Marit stood waiting for her, pulled the woman up onto the bank. The wolfen ran onto the bridge. The sigla on the rock flared red. The wet stone burst into magical flame. The wolfen fell back, snarling and snapping. They paced the bank, staring at their prey with yellow, hungry eyes, but they dared not cross the river. Once Kari was safe, Hapla went to see how Alfred was doing. Vasu also walked over to take a look. The headman moved with grace for such a flabby and ungainly man. Reaching the Sarton's side, the patron chieftain stared down at his prisoner. Alfred lay on the bank. He was the color of something that had been in the river several days. He shook until his teeth rattled. His limbs twitched and jerked with leftover terror. Here is the ancient enemy, Vasu said, and it seemed he sighed. Here is what we have been taught to hate. Chapter 41 The Citadel, Priam Run, Aliatha! Roland shouted and jumped in front of Ixar. 
The lord of the Nexus caught the human by the throat and flung him to one side as if he'd been one of the elves' magical talking dolls. Exar called on the possibilities, worked the rune magic. Within the blinking of an eye, every arched doorway that led into and out of the circular chamber was walled up, sealed shut. This done, Exar glanced around, then began to curse bitterly. He'd trapped three mench in the chamber, only three. The elf female had escaped. But perhaps Exar reflected this is all for the best. She will lead me to the dwarf. Exar turned back to his captives. One of them, the elf male, was staring down at the dead body of the old man at the empty pitcher lying on the floor beside him. The elf raised his head, turned a horrified face to Exar. You poisoned the wine? You meant for us to drink it? Of course I did, Exar returned testily. He had no time for mench inanities. And now I will have to take your lives in a manner far less suitable to my needs. However, there are compensations. He nudged the corpse with his toe. I have an extra body. I hadn't counted on that. The mensch huddled together, the human female kneeling over the human male, who was lying on the floor, his throat torn and bleeding as if claws had raked it. Don't go anywhere, said Exar with fine sarcasm. I'll be back. He used the rune magic to escape the sealed room, went after the elf female and the dwarf, and, most importantly, the dwarf's sartan amulet. Run, Aliatha! Roland's warning pounded in her heart, throbbed in her ears, and above the words she could hear the footsteps of the terrible wizard. Run, Aliatha, run! Consumed by fear, she ran. She could hear the dread footfalls behind her. Lord Exar was pursuing her, and it seemed to her that he too was whispering Roland's last words to her. Run, Aliatha, he was urging her. His voice was terrifying, laughing at her, mocking. It impelled her to run faster, kept her from being able to think coherently. She ran to the one place where instinct told her she might be safe, the maze. Exar discovered Aliatha easily. He watched her dash down the street in a flurry of torn silken skirt and tattered petticoat. He pursued her at his leisure, driving her as he might have driven sheep. He wanted her terror, wanted panic. Half mad, she would unwittingly lead him to the dwarf. Too late, Exar realized his mistake. He realized it when he saw the maze, saw Aliatha racing for it, saw the certain runes that surrounded the entrance. Aliatha vanished inside. Exar halted outside, glared balefully at the certain runes, and considered this latest difficulty. The three trapped inside the circular chamber stared at the bricked-up walls, at each other, at the corpse of the old man, lying twisted and cold on the floor. This isn't real, Riga said in a small, tight voice. This isn't happening. Maybe you're right, Peyton said eagerly, and hurled himself at the brick wall that had once been a door. He smashed into it, groaned in pain, and slid to the floor. It's real enough, all right. A bleeding gash in his forehead proved it. Why is Exar doing this to us? Why, why kill us? Riga quavered. Aliatha! Roland sat up, blinked dazedly. Where's Aliatha? She escaped, Riga said gently, thanks to you. Roland, gingerly touching his bleeding throat, managed to smile. But Exar went after her, Peyton added. He looked at the magic brick walls, shook his head. I don't think she stands much of a chance. Roland was on his feet. There must be a way out. There isn't, Peyton said. Forget it, we're finished. Roland ignored him, began hammering on the bricks and shouting, Help! Help us! You ninny, Peyton scoffed. Just who do you think's going to hear you? I don't know, Roland turned on him savagely. But it beats the hell out of standing here, whining and waiting to die. He turned to the wall and was about to beat on it again, when the imposing gentleman, dressed all in black, stepped through the bricks as if he were walking through the erstwhile door. Excuse me, sir, he said deferentially to the astounded Roland, but I thought I heard you call. Might I be of assistance? Before Roland could answer, the imposing gentleman saw the corpse. His face paled. Oh, dear, sir, what have you done now? The gentleman knelt beside the body, felt for a pulse. Finding none, he looked up. His expression was terrible, stern, fay. Peyton, alarmed, caught hold of Riga, pulled her close. The two stumbled backward into Roland. The imposing gentleman stood up and kept standing. His body grew taller and taller, rose higher and higher. His frame filled out. An enormous scaled tail thrashed in anger. Reptile eyes flared in fury. 
The dragon's voice shook the sealed room. Who has killed my wizard? Aliatha ran through the maze. She was lost, hopelessly lost, but she didn't care. In her terror-frazzled mind, the more lost she was, the better her chances of losing Exar. She was so frightened, she didn't realize he was no longer pursuing her. The hedges tore at her dress, caught her hair, scratched her hands and arms. The stones on the path bruised her tender feet. A stabbing pain tore at her side every time she drew a breath. Footsore, dazed, she was forced by sheer exhaustion to stop her panic-stricken dash. She sank down onto the path, gulping and sobbing. A hand touched her. Aliatha shrieked, fell backward into the hedge. But it wasn't the black robes and cruel face of Ixar that loomed over her. It was the black-bearded and concerned face of the dwarf. Druga? Aliatha couldn't see very well through a blood-tinged haze. Was the dwarf real, or still one of the fog people? Yet the touch of his hand had been real. Aliatha! Druga bent down, his expression anxious. He didn't try to touch her again. What is the matter? What has happened? Oh, Druga! Aliatha timidly reached out her hand, gingerly touched his arm. Finding him solid and substantial, she clutched at him frantically, grabbing onto him with strength born of hysteria, nearly dragging him off his feet. You're real. Why did you leave me alone? I was so frightened. And then, then Lord Exar, he... Did you hear that? She turned, stared fearfully behind her. Is he coming? Do you see him? She struggled to stand. We have to run. Get away. Kruger was not accustomed to dealing with hysteria. Dwarves are never hysterical. He knew something dire had happened. He needed to find out what. He had to get Aliatha calmed down, and he didn't have time to coddle her, as was his instinctive tendency. He was momentarily at a loss, but a memory from his past, recently revived by his mind-shattering experience, came to his aid. Dwarven children are noted for their stubbornness. A dwarven baby not getting its way will sometimes hold its breath until it turns blue and loses consciousness. On such occasions, the parent will throw water into the child's face. This causes it to gasp and voluntarily draw in a breath. Kruger didn't have any water, but he did have ale brought with him to prove that where he had been wasn't an illusion. He uncorked the clay bottle and tossed ale into Aliatha's face. Never in her life had such a thing happened to Aliatha. Dripping and sputtering, she returned to herself with a vengeance. All the horrors she had witnessed and experienced were deluged, drowned in a flood of foul-smelling brown liquid. She was quivering with rage. How dare! Lord Ixar! said Druger, latching on to the one thing she'd said that made sense. Where is he? What did he do to you? His words brought back everything, and at first Druger feared he'd gone too far. Aliatha began to shake. The dwarf held up the clay bottle. Drink, he ordered, and tell me what has happened. Aliatha drew in a deep breath. She detested ale, but taking the bottle, she swallowed some of the cool liquid. The bitter taste made her gag, but she felt better. With many fits and starts and ramblings, she told Druger all she had seen, all she had heard. Druger listened, his expression grim, his hand continually stroking his beard. They're probably all dead by now, Aliatha choked on her tears. Exar murdered them, then came after me. He may be in here now, looking for me. Us, I mean. He kept asking about you. Did he now? Druger fingered the amulet he wore at his throat. There is one thing we can do, one way to stop him. Aliatha peered at the dwarf, hopefully, through her sodden mass of hair. What? We must open the gate. Let the titans into the city. You're mad. Aliatha stared at the dwarf, began to edge away from him. No, I am not mad. Druger caught hold of her hand. Listen to me. I was coming to tell you. Look. Look at this. He held up the ale. Where do you think I got this? Aliatha shook her head. You were right, Druger continued. The fog people are not shadows. They are real. If it hadn't been for you, I would have never... never... The dwarf's eyes shimmered. He cleared his throat, frowned in embarrassment. They live in another citadel, like this one. I was there. I saw it. My people, your people, even humans. They live together in a city and they get along. They live, Ruger repeated, his eyes shining. They are alive. My people... I am not the last of my kind. He looked down at the clay bottle with affection. They gave me this to bring back, to prove my words. Another city. Aliatha was following him slowly. You went to another city. Elves and humans. Ale. You brought back ale. 
pretty dresses. Her shaking hand smoothed her own torn gown. Can, can I go there with you, Druga? Can we go now? We'll escape Ixar. Druga, they are alive. We have to open the gate, let the Titans in. They will help us stop Ixar. They'll kill him, said Aliatha in a dull and lifeless voice, her spirit crushed. They'll kill us too, but I guess that doesn't matter. They will not, Bruger said sternly. You must trust me in this. I learned something while I was in the Citadel. It was all a mistake, all a misunderstanding. Where is the Citadel, the Titans kept asking. All we had to say to them was, Here, here is the Citadel. Come inside. Truly? Aliatha looked hopeful, then wary. Show me. Take me to that place. Bruger frowned. Do you want your brother to die? The dwarf's voice grew harsh. Do you want to save Roland? Roland, Aliatha repeated softly, drooping. I love him. I really do love him. I don't know why. He's so, so... She sighed. He told me to run. He jumped in front of me. He saved my life. We will go now, Kruger urged. We will go and see what has happened to them. But we can't leave the maze, Aliatha said, the hysterical edge tinting her voice. Ixar's out there, waiting for us. I know he is. Perhaps he is left, Bruger said. He began walking back up the path. We will see. Aliatha watched him go. She was terrified of following him, but she was even more terrified of being left alone. Gathering her torn skirts, she hastened after the dwarf. Ixar could not go into the maze. The certain runes blocked his entry. He cursed and paced, considered the possibilities... He could blast his way through the hedge, but he'd probably have to burn down the entire maze to find the mench, and charred corpses would not be of much use to him. Patience was what was required of him now. The elf female would have to emerge sometime, Ixar reasoned. She couldn't spend her life in there. Thirst, hunger would drive her out. The other three mench were safely ensconced in the walled room. He could wait here for as long as necessary. Ixar expanded his range of hearing, listened for her. He heard her running and sobbing, heard her fall. Then he heard another voice. Exar smiled. He'd been right. The dwarf. She'd led him to the dwarf. He listened to their conversation and ignored most of it. What an inane story. The dwarf was drunk. That much was obvious. Exar laughed aloud at the suggestion that the Citadel's gates be open to the Titans. Mench were more stupid than he'd thought. I will open the gates, dwarf, Exar said, when you are dead. And you could make friends with the Titans then. The two were emerging from the maze. Ixar was pleased. He hadn't expected them to come out so soon. He strolled over to one of the nearby buildings and hid in the shadows. From here he could see the entrance to the maze, yet remain unobserved. He would allow them to get far enough from the maze so that they could not run back to it for protection. I will kill these two now, he said to himself. Leave their bodies here for the time being. When the others are dead, I will return for the corpses. Begin the preparations to raise them. He could hear the heavy footfalls of the dwarf moving down the path nearing the entrance. The elf female was with him, her footfalls much lighter, barely discernible. But he could plainly hear her frantic whispers. Drucker, don't go out there, please. I know he's there. I know it. Perceptive, these elves. Exar forced himself to wait patiently and was rewarded by the sight of the dwarf's black-bearded face popping out around the corner of the hedgerow. The face vanished again immediately, then, after a pause, reappeared. Exar was careful not to move, was one with the shadow in which he hid. The dwarf advanced a tentative step, hand on an axe he wore at his belt. He looked up the street and down. At length he gestured. Aliatha, come now. It is safe. Lord Exar is nowhere in sight. The elf female crept out. He's here somewhere, Druger. I know he is. Let's run. She caught hold of the dwarf's hand. Together they began running up the street, away from the maze, straight toward Exar. He let them get close. Then he stepped out into the street, directly in front of them. What a pity you had to miss my party, he said to the dwarf. Raising his hand, Exar wove the runes that would slay them both. The sigler shimmered in the air, swept down on the stunned mench in a bright flash, and suddenly began to unravel. What? Furious, Exar started to recast his magic. Then he saw the problem. The dwarf stood in front of the elf female. In his hand he held the amulet with the sartan runes. The amulet was protecting them both. Not for long. Its magic was limited. The dwarf had no idea how to use it beyond this feeble attempt. Exar strengthened his spell. His sigla burned, flared. Their light was blinding and burst upon the dwarf upon his puny amulet with a roar of fire. 
a shattering explosion, a cry of pain, a terrible scream. When the smoke cleared, the dwarf lay on the pavement. The elf female knelt over him, pleading with him to get up. Exar took a step toward her to finish her off. A voice thundered through the air, halted him. You killed my wizard! A dark shadow obliterated the sun. Aliatha looked up, saw the dragon, saw that it was attacking Exar. She didn't understand, but understanding didn't matter. She bent over Druger. Tugging on his beard, she begged him, pleaded with him to wake up to help her. She was so frantic she never noticed that her hands, where they touched the dwarf, were covered with blood. Druger, please! The dwarf's eyes opened. He looked up at the lovely face so near his own, and he smiled at her. Come on, Druger, she urged cheerfully. Stand up. Hurry, the dragon. I'm going to be with my people, Druger told her gently. No, Druger, Aliatha choked. She saw the blood now. Don't leave me. He frowned to quiet her. With his fast-fading strength, he pressed the amulet into her hands. Open the gate. The titans will help. Trust me. You must trust me. He stared up at her, pleading. Aliatha hesitated. The magic thundered around her. The dragon roared in fury. Exar's voice chanted strange words. Aliatha clasped her hands tightly around the dwarfs. I trust you, Druga, she said. His eyes closed. He gasped in pain, yet he smiled. My people. He breathed softly, finally. Druga! Aliatha cried, clutching the amulet in her blood-stained hand. Exar's magic flashed. A tremendous wind, raised by the violent lashing of the dragon's gigantic tail, blew her hair into her face. Aliatha was no longer crying. She was calm now, surprised at her calmness. Nothing mattered any more. Nothing. Holding fast to the amulet, unnoticed by either the wizard or the dragon, the elf kissed the dwarf tenderly on his forehead. Then she rose to her feet and walked with purpose and resolve down the street. Pathan and Roland and Riga stood knee-deep in a vast pile of bricks, fallen timbers, and tumbled blocks of marble. Ah, are any of us hurt? Pathan asked, looking around in dazed confusion. Roland lifted his foot, displacing an enormous mound of bricks that had been covering it. No, he said hesitantly, as if he couldn't believe it himself. No, I'm all right. But don't ask me how. Riga brushed rock dust from her face and out of her eyes. What happened? I'm not sure, Phaethon answered. I remember the man in black asking about his wizard, and then he was a dragon shrieking about his wizard, and then, then... The room sort of exploded, Roland continued. He climbed up and over the rubble until he reached them. The dragon's head bashed through the ceiling, and the room started collapsing, and I remember thinking, this is it, pal, you're finished. But we're not, said Riga, blinking. We're not finished. I wonder how we survived. She gazed around at the terrible destruction. Bright sunlight flooded the room. The dust sparkled in it like myriad tiny jewels. Who cares how we survived, Roland said, heading for a large hole that had been blasted through the wall. We did, and that's enough for me. Let's get the hell out of here. Exar is probably after Eliatha. Helping each other, Peyton and Riga clambered over a pile of bricks and rubble. Before he left, Peyton glanced behind. The circular room with its round table was destroyed. Whatever voices had once spoken in that room would speak no more. The three ran out of a hole in the wall just in time to see a gigantic ball of fire illuminate the sky. Frightened, they fell back, took shelter in a doorway. A boom shook the ground. What is it? Can you see? Roland demanded. Do you see Eliatha? I'm going out there. No, you're not, Pathan caught hold of him. I'm just as worried about her as you are. She's my sister. But you won't help her by getting yourself killed. Wait until we know what's going on. Roland, sweating and ashen-faced, stood trembling. He seemed prepared to race off anyway. The dragon's fighting Exar, Riga whispered, awed. I think you're right, Pathan agreed, pondering. And if the dragon kills Exar, we're probably next. Our only hope is that they kill each other. I'm going to go find Aliatha, Roland ran down the stairs. Roland, don't, you'll be killed, Riga went running after him. There's Aliatha, over there, see ya, Pathan yelled. Thea, we're up here! He dashed down the steps to the street level. Aliatha was at the bottom, walking along the street. She either couldn't hear her brother's shout, or she was ignoring him. She walked swiftly, didn't stop, although now Roland had added his powerful voice to the elf's weaker one. 
Aliatha! Roland raced past Payton. Reaching Aliatha, he grabbed hold of her arm. You're hurt, he cried, seeing blood on the front of her dress. Aliatha stared at him coldly. Let go of me. She spoke so calmly and with such authority that Roland, amazed, let go. Aliatha turned, continued walking down the street. What's the matter with her? Where's she going? Payton asked breathlessly, coming level with Roland. You can see where she's going, Riga gasped. The gate! And she's carrying Druger's amulet. The three caught up with Aliatha. This time Payton stopped her. Thea, he said, his voice shaking. Thea, take it easy. Tell us what happened. Where's Druger? Aliatha looked at him, looked at Roland and Riga, seemed at last to know who these people were. Druger's dead, she said faintly. He died saving me. She held fast to the amulet. Thea, I'm sorry. It must have been terrible for you. Come on now, back to the Citadel. It's not safe out here. Aliatha pulled away from her brother. No, she said with that strange calm. No, I'm not going back. I know what I have to do. Druger told me to do it. They're real, you see. Their city is real. And their dresses are very beautiful. Turning, she started off again. The city gate was in plain sight now. The starlight beamed out from the star chamber. The odd humming vibrated in the air. Explosions and crashes shook the citadel from inside. Outside the walls, the titans stood in a hypnotic trance. Thea! Payton called desperately. The three leapt to catch her. Aliatha whipped around, held the amulet up before her as she had seen Druger hold it up before Ixar. Startled, the others fell back. Either the magic of the amulet stopped them, or else it was Aliatha's commanding presence. You don't understand, she said. That's what this whole thing has been all along. A misunderstanding. Druger told me. The Titans will save us. She looked at the gate. We just didn't understand. Aliatha. Druger tried to kill us once, Riga cried. You can't trust him, he's a dwarf, Payton shouted. Aliatha gave him a pitying glance. Sweeping her tattered skirts up in her hand, she walked over to the gate, placed the amulet in the center. She's gone mad, Riga whispered, frantic. She's going to get us all killed. What does it matter, Roland asked suddenly with a reckless laugh. The dragon, the wizard, the titans, one of them's bound to kill us. What the devil does it matter which... Payton tried to move, but his body seemed extremely tired, unwilling to support him. Thea, what are you doing? he cried, anguished. I'm going to let the Titans in, Aliatha replied. The amulet flared. The gate swung open. Chapter 42 Aubrey, the Labyrinth Escorted by Vasu, Haplo and his companions walked through the giant iron gates that led into the streets of Aubrey. No other patrons guarded them. The headman had taken this responsibility on himself. He told Kari and her people to go to their homes, rest after their labors. But the patrons gathered, at a respectful distance, to view the strangers. Word spread swiftly, and soon the streets were crowded with men, women, and children, more curious than hostile. Of course, Haplow thought grimly, the lack of guards doesn't mean they trust us. After all, we're trapped inside a walled city with only one way out. Rune-guarded, man-guarded gates. No, Vasu's not taking much of a chance. Aubrey was, as its name meant, a shelter of rock. The buildings were all made of stone. The streets were dirt, little more than wide tracks, hard packed by long use. But the roads were smooth and level, well suited to the wagons and handcarts that trundled up and down. The buildings were utilitarian, with square corners and small windows that could be sealed up swiftly when the city was under attack. And, in case of dire necessity, there were caves in the mountains to which the population could flee for protection. No wonder the labyrinth had found it difficult to destroy Aubrey and its people. Haplow shook his head. And yet it's still a prison. How can you choose to stay here, Hedman? Why don't you try to escape? You were a runner, I am told, Haplow. Haplow glanced at Marit on the other side of Vasu. Marit kept her eyes forward, her chin jutted out. She was cold and impenetrable, solid and forbidding as the stone walls. Yes, Haplow replied. I was a runner. And you succeeded in escaping. You reached the final gate. Haplow nodded, unwilling to talk about it. The memory was not a pleasant one. And what is the world like beyond the final gate? Vasu inquired. Beautiful, said Haplow, his thoughts going to the nexus. A city, immense, enormous, forests and rolling hills, food in abundance. Peaceful, Vasu asked. No threat, 
No danger? Yes, Hapler was about to respond. Then, remembering, he kept silent. There is a threat, then, Vasu persisted gently. Danger? A very great danger, Hapler replied in a low voice. He was thinking of the dragon snakes. Were you happy there in your nexus, Haplo? Happier there than you were here? Haplo glanced again at Marit. No, he said quietly. She still did not look at him. She didn't need to. She understood his meaning. A flush as of a burning fever rose from her neck, suffused her cheeks. Many of those walking free are in prison, observed Vasu. Haplo met the headman's eyes, was startled, impressed. The eyes were brown, soft as the body, but they were lit from behind by an inner light, intelligence, wisdom. Hapler began to revise his opinion of this man. Ordinarily, the headman in the tribe is chosen because he is the strongest, a survivor. Thus, the headman, or headwoman, is often one of the oldest members of the tribe, hard and tough. This Vasu was young, flabby, and could never have withstood a challenge from another tribal member. Haplo had wondered on first encounter how a weak, soft man like Vasu had managed to retain his hold over a proud, fierce people. He was beginning to understand why. You are right, Hedman, Alfred spoke up. His face was radiant. He was regarding Vasu with awe. And, Haplo noted, the sergeant was actually managing to walk without falling over himself. You are right. I've been keeping myself prisoner for so long. So long. He sighed, shook his head. I must find a way to set myself free. You are a sartum, Basu said, the wonderful eyes turning on Alfred, turning him inside out. One of those who cast us in here, Alfred blushed. Haplo gritted his teeth, expecting stammering apologies, the usual. No, Alfred said, pausing, drawing himself up to his full height. No, I'm not. I mean, yes, I am a sartum. But no, I am not one who cast you in here. My ancestors were responsible, not me. I take responsibility for myself, for my own actions. The blush increased. He looked over sadly at Hugh the Hand. Those are burden enough. An interesting argument, said Vasu. We are not responsible for the crimes of our fathers, only for our own. And we have one here who is an immortal, or so I'm told. Hugh the Hand took the pipe from his mouth. I can die, he said bitterly. I just can't be killed. Another prisoner, Vasu was sympathetic. Speaking of prisons, why did you return to the labyrinth, Haplo? To find my daughter. Your daughter? Vasu raised an eyebrow. The answer had taken him by surprise, though he must have heard as much from Kari. When was the last time you saw her? What tribe was she with? I never saw my child. I have no idea where she is. Her name is Rue. And this is the reason you came back? To find her? Yes, Hedman Vasu. That is the reason. Look around, Haplo, said Vasu softly. Haplo looked. The street in which they stood was filled with children, boys and girls at play and at work, stopping to stare with bright eyes at the strangers, babes riding in harness on a parent's back, toddlers getting underfoot, tumbling down, only to stand up again with the stubborn persistence of the very young. Many are orphans, Vasu said gently, who come to us by way of the beacon fire, and many of them are named Ru. I know my search seems hopeless, Haplo argued, but... Stop it, Marit cried suddenly, angrily. She rounded on him. Stop lying. Tell him the truth. Haplo stared, truly astonished. All of them stopped walking, waited to see what would happen next. Crowds of patrons moved near, watching, listening. At a gesture from Vasu, the patrons moved back at a street distance, but still they waited. Mara turned to face the headman. Have you heard of Ixar, the lord of the Nexus? Yes, said Vasu, we have heard of him. Even here in the center of the labyrinth we have heard of Lord Ixar. Then you know that he is the greatest one of our people ever to have lived. Ixar saved this man's life, Mara pointed at Haplo. Ixar loves this man like a son, and this man has betrayed him. Marit flung back her head, regarded Haplo with scorn. He is a traitor to his own people. He has conspired with the enemy. Her accusatory gaze went to Alfred, and with the mench, her eyes shifted to Hugh the Hand, to destroy Exar, lord of the patrons. Haplo's true reason for coming to the labyrinth is to raise an army. He plans to lead that army from the labyrinth in a war against his lord. Is this true? Vasu asked. No, Haplo replied. 
But why should you believe me? Why indeed, traitor, came a voice from the crowd. Especially since your minion carries an ancient knife of foul magic wrought by the Sartan for our destruction. Astonished Hapo looked to see who had spoken. The voice sounded vaguely familiar, perhaps that of the man who had accompanied Marit on the trail. Oddly, though, Marit herself appeared startled, perhaps even troubled by this latest accusation. She, too, it seemed, was trying to locate the person who had spoken. I had such a weapon. Hugh the Hand took the pipe from his mouth, spoke up boldly. But it was lost, as she well knows. He pointed the pipe stem at Marit. Only it wasn't a pipe. Blessed Sutton, cried Alfred in horror. The assassin held the cursed blade, the iron knife inscribed with Sartan runes of death. Hugh the Hand flung the weapon from him. The knife fell to the ground and lay there, squirming, wriggling like a live thing. The sigla tattooed on Haplo's skin flared to life, as did the runes on Vasu and Marit and every other patron in the vicinity. Pick it up, Alfred said through pale and trembling lips. No, the Hand shook his head vehemently. I won't touch the damn thing. Pick it up. Alfred commanded, his voice rising. It feels threatened quickly. Do it, Haplow said grimly, dragging back the dog, which was trotting over to take a sniff. Reluctantly, gingerly, as if he were preparing to grab a poisonous snake by the back of the head, Hugh the Hand bent down, retrieved the knife. He glared at it. I swear, I didn't know I had it. My pipe. The blade would not let him go, Alfred intervened. The sergeant looked miserable. I wondered at the time when you said it was lost. The blade would find a way to stay with him, and it did so, by changing its form to that of his most valued possession. Hetman Vasu, I would most respectfully suggest that you disperse your people, Haplow said, tense, his gaze on the knife. It was still glowing, although not quite as brightly as before. The danger is very great. And it grows proportionately, Alfred added in a low voice, his face flushed with shame. So much for the crimes of the fathers, with all these people around it. Yes, I sense that, Vasu said grimly. You, return to your homes, take the children indoors. Take the children. One little girl was trying to see, moving near, not understanding the danger. Her face was oval, her chin pointed, not unlike Marit's. The child would be about the right age. A man came to the girl, laid his hand protectively on her shoulder, drew her back. His eyes met Haplow's for a brief instant. Haplow felt his face burn. The man led the child away. The crowd dispersed swiftly, obeying the headman's orders without question. But Haplow could see faces, eyes, watching him balefully, distrustfully from the shadows. He could guess that many hands were on weapons. And whose had been the voice that spoke? And what force had caused the knife to reveal its true nature? Alfred, said Haplow, thinking back. Why didn't the knife change when the tiger men attacked us? Alfred shook his head. I'm not sure. But as you'll recall, Sir Hugh was knocked out by a blow to the head. Or maybe it was the knife itself that had summoned the Tiger Men. Never before in the history of Aubrey, which has been here since the beginning, has one of our own brought such danger to us, Vasu was saying. The brown eyes were hard, stern, and unforgiving. You must imprison them, Hedman, Marat told him. My Lord Exar is coming. He will deal with them. So, Exar is coming, Aplo thought. How long has she known? A lot was beginning to make sense now. I do not want to imprison one of our own kind. Will you, Haplo, wait in Aubrey for Lord Exar? Vasu asked. Will you give me your word of honor that you will not attempt to flee? Haplo hesitated. He could see his own reflection in the headman's brown eyes, so marvelously clear and soft. And in that moment he made his decision. He came to know himself. No, I will not make such a pledge, for I could not keep it. Lord Exar is my lord no longer. He is being guided by evil. His ambition is not to rule, but to enslave. I've seen where such ambition leads. I will no longer follow or obey him. Haplow added quietly, I will do all within my power to thwart him. Marit sucked in a sharp breath. He gave you life. She spat at his feet, turned on her heel, and stalked off. So be it, said Vasu. I have no choice but to deem you and your two companions a danger to the people. You will be held in prison to await the arrival of Lord Exar. We will go peacefully, Hedman, said Haplow. Hugh, put the knife away. Scowling, not at Haplow, but at the cursed blade, the assassin thrust it securely into his belt. I suppose this means I've lost my pipe, he said glumly. 
Vasu made a gesture and several patrons appeared out of the shadows ready to escort the prisoners. No weapons, Vasu commanded. You will not need them. He looked back at Haplow, who saw something in the brown eyes, something perplexing, unfathomable. I will accompany you, Vasu offered, if you don't mind. Haplow shrugged. He wasn't in a position to mind. This way, Vasu was brisk, efficient. He even offered a hand to Alfred, who had slipped on a pebble and was now lying on his back, looking helpless, like an upturned turtle. With the headman's help, Alfred struggled to his feet. His stooped shoulders were bowed, as if once again he had taken on some enormous burden. They walked toward the mountain, their destination probably the caverns deep underground, caverns far below the beacon fire burning its welcome through the grey mists. The dog, crowded against Haplow's leg, looked up at him questioningly with its liquid eyes. Do we go along with this indignity, it asked, or do you want me to put a stop to it? Haplow gave the animal a reassuring pat. With a sigh that said the dog hoped Haplow knew what he was doing, the animal trotted along meekly at its master's side. That strange look in the headman's eyes. What did it mean? Thinking of this, wondering, Haplow remembered Kari saying Vasu had sent her out deliberately to find them, bring them back. How had Vasu known? What did Vasu know? When Merritt had left, she had not gone far, only far enough to take her out of Haplow's sight. Keeping to the shadows of a tall, sheltering oak tree, she waited to see Haplow and the others marched off to prison. She was trembling with what she told herself was outrage. Haplow had admitted his guilt, actually admitted it. And to make such statements to accuse Exar of being guided by evil, it was monstrous. Exar was right about Haplow. He was a traitor, and Marat had done the right thing in obeying Exar's commands, in having Haplow arrested and held prisoner until Exar could come for him, and Exar would come soon, perhaps any moment. She would tell her lord, of course, what Haplow had said, and that would seal Haplow's fate, which was right and just. Haplow was a traitor, a traitor to them all. Then why this gnawing doubt? Marat knew why. She had told no one about the Sartan knife. No one. She watched until the three were well out of sight. Then she suddenly became aware that several fellow patrons were approaching her, eyeing her curiously, probably wanting to discuss this unusual occurrence in their lives. Marit was in no mood to talk. Pretending she didn't see them, she turned and walked away, trying to look as if she knew where she was going. Actually, she didn't. She didn't even see where she was going. She needed to think to try to figure out what was wrong. Her skin itched. The signal on her hands and arms were glowing faintly. Odd. She raised her head swiftly. She had come farther than she'd intended, was near the wall surrounding Aubrey. Danger was everywhere in the labyrinth. She should not be surprised to feel the warning magic. Yet the city had seemed so safe, so secure. A hand closed over her arm. Marit had her dagger out of its sheath before she saw who held her. A fellow patron. She lowered the dagger but kept it in her hand. She could not see the man's face. His hair was long and unkempt and hung over his eyes. The tingling warning signs had not abated. If anything, they were now stronger. Marit drew back, away from the strange patron. As she did so, she noticed that his magic was not reacting to the danger. The tattoos on his skin were not glowing. And then she saw that the runes could not glow. They were not true rune structures, only copies. Marit wasted no time in talk or in wondering who or what this creature might be. Those who waited to ask questions rarely lived long to hear the answer. Certain species in the labyrinth, such as the boggle bow, had the power of shape-shifting. Gripping her dagger, Marit lunged at the impostor. Her weapon vanished, changed to smoke that drifted harmlessly through the air. Ah, you recognize me, said a familiar voice. I thought you might. She hadn't, not really. She had known he wasn't a patron, but she had not recognized him, until he brushed the tangled hair back from his face to reveal the single red eye. Sangrax, she said ungraciously. She should have been pleased to see him, but her unease grew. What do you want? Didn't Lord Exar inform you of my coming? The single red eye blinked. My lord informed me that he was coming, Marit said coldly. Her thoughts went to the hideous sight of the dragon snakes of Chelestra. She didn't like being around Sangrax, wanted to get away from him. Perhaps Exar is here? If so, I will go... My lord has been unfortunately detained, Sangrax interrupted. He has sent me to retrieve Haplo. My lord said he was coming, Marit reiterated, not liking this change, wondering what was going on. He would have told me otherwise if he were not. 
Lord Exar finds it a bit difficult to communicate just at the moment, Sang Drax replied, and though his tone was respectful, it seemed to merit that the dragon snake smirked. If my lord sent you for Haplo, then you had better go and find him, Marit said coldly. What do you want with me? Ah, uh, getting to Haplo is proving rather a problem, Sang Drax said. I managed to have him arrested, but I... You were the one, Marit said. You knew about the knife. I mean no disrespect, but Hedman Vasu was a weak-minded fool. He was prepared to let Haplo and his sartan friend roam the city at will. My Lord Exar would not have liked that. I saw that you were not going to act, sang Drax's red eye glinted, and so I was forced to do what I could. As I was about to say, my goal was to have Haplo placed in a dungeon where he will be rendered helpless, he and his sartan friend... I will be able to capture him quite easily without endangering your people. The dragon snake inclined his head. The red eye slid shut for an instant. But now you can't get to him, Barrett guessed. Too true, Sangrax shrugged, smiled in a deprecating manner. The guards will recognize me immediately as an imposter, but if you were to take me in... Barrett gritted her teeth. It took a physical effort to remain standing this close to the dragon snake. Every instinct urged her to kill it or run. We should hurry, Sangrax added, noting her hesitation, before the guards can get organized. I must speak to my lord first, Barrett said, her way clear. This countermands Exar's earlier orders to me. I must make certain this is his will. Sangrax was obviously displeased. My lord may be difficult to reach. He is, shall we say, otherwise occupied... His voice had an ominous tone. Then you will have to wait, Maddock returned. Haplo isn't going anywhere. Do you honestly believe that? Sangrax gave her a pitying look. Do you believe that he will stay meekly in his cell, waiting for Xar to come for him? No, Haplo has some plot in mind. You may count upon it. I repeat, I must capture him now. Maddock didn't know what to believe, but one thing was certain. She didn't believe Sangrax. I will speak to my lord, she said resolutely. When I receive his instructions, I will obey them. Where can I find you? Don't worry, patron, I will find you. Turning, Sangrax left, continuing on his way down the deserted street. Barrett waited until the dragon snake was about twenty paces from her, then keeping to the shadow of the wall, she followed him. What was he really after? Barrett didn't believe Exar had sent him, nor did she believe Sangrax's implications that Exar was in some sort of trouble. She would see where Sangrax went, discover what he was up to. The dragon snake, maintaining his patron form, rounded a corner of a building. He was taking care, Marat noticed, to keep to the shadows himself, taking care to avoid any true patron. He didn't run into many. This part of the city near the wall was mostly deserted. The buildings here were older, probably dating to a time before the wall had been constructed, and had probably been left behind as another line of defense, a perfect place for the dragon snake to hide. But how had Sangrax entered the city? Patrons manned the walls and the gate. Their magic would keep out all but the most powerful intruder. Yet Sangrax was here, and he had obviously remained unobserved. Otherwise the city would be in an uproar. Doubt began to edge its sharp point into Marit's mind. How powerful was the dragon snake? She had always assumed that he was less powerful than she. The patrons are the strongest force in the universe, aren't we? Isn't that what Exar said time and again? Guided by evil, Haplo had said. Marit put Haplo out of her mind. Sangrax turned into an alley with no way out. Marit paused at the entrance, not wanting to find herself trapped. The dragon snake continued down the alley, moving at a leisurely pace. Marit crossed to the opposite side of the alley and entered a doorway from which she could watch unobserved. The dragon snake glanced behind him occasionally, but never more than a glance, and an uninterested one at that. He was about halfway down the alley when he stopped, looked more carefully up and down. Then he stepped into a shadowed doorway and disappeared. Marat waited tensely, not wanting to move closer until she was certain he wasn't going to re-emerge. Nothing happened. Nothing stirred. The alley was empty. But she could hear voices, low and indistinct, coming from the building Sangrax had entered. Marat traced a series of sigla in the air. Tendrils of fog began to swirl down the alley. She waited patiently, worked the magic slowly. The sudden appearance of a thick fog bank would look extremely suspicious. When she could no longer see the squat, square shape of the building across from her, Marit walked across the alley using the enveloping cloud as cover. She had already marked her destination, a window in the building's side on a wall that ran perpendicular to the alley. Sangrax would have had to be standing in the alley itself, watching for her to have seen her. 
and he was nowhere in sight. As it was, she would be only a vague shape, made visible by the faint warning glow of the runes on her bare hands and arms. Reaching the window, she flattened herself against the wall, then risked a look inside. The room was small, bare. Former nomads, patrons didn't have much use for furniture in their dwellings, no such things as tables and chairs. Mats for sitting and pallets for sleeping were all the furnishings considered necessary. Sangrax stood in the middle of the empty room, talking to four other patrons, who were not patrons, Marit quickly determined. She couldn't see the rune markings clearly. The fog outside had caused the interior of the building to grow quite dark. But the very fact that the room was dark was the determining factor. A true patron Sigler would have been glowing, even as Marit's were. More dragon snakes disguised as patrons. They spoke the patron language well, all of them. Marit found this disturbing. Sangrax spoke her language, but then he had spent a great deal of time with Ixar. How long had these other snakes had her people under observation? A proceeding. Our people are massed at the final gate. We wait only for your signal, one of the dragon snakes was saying. Excellent, Sangrax replied. My signal will not be long in coming. The armies of the labyrinth are gathering. At what passes for dawn in this land, we will attack this city and destroy it. When the city is leveled, I will allow a handful of survivors to flee, to spread their tale of destruction, stir up terror at our coming. You will not permit Alfred the Sarton to survive, asked another in a hissing voice. Of course not, Sangrax replied harshly. The serpent mage will die here, as will Haplo the patron. Both are far too dangerous to us, now that Lord Exar knows about the seventh gate. It is only a matter of time before either Haplo or the Serpent Mage figures out that he has been there. Curse that fool Clytus for telling Exar in the first place. We must find a way to deal with the laser, observed one dragon snake. All in good time, Sangrax returned. When this is finished, we will return to Aberach, take care of the laser, then deal with Exar himself. First, however, we will conquer and control the labyrinth. When we seal shut the final gate... The evil trapped in this place will grow a hundredfold, and our power along with it. Our kind will thrive and multiply here, safe from interference, assured of a continual source of nourishment. Fear, hatred, chaos will be our harvest. What was that? A dragon snake turned its head toward the window. A spy? Barrett had made no sound, although what she had overheard very nearly caused her to sink weak knee to the ground. Sangrax was walking toward the window. Silent, soft-footed, Marit glided into the thick fog, ran swiftly down the alley. Did she hear? the dragon snake asked. Sangrax dispelled the fog with a wave of his hand. She heard, he replied with satisfaction. Chapter 43 The Citadel Priam The starlight shone brightly from the Citadel's tower. The faint humming sound, whose words could be heard but not distinguished, vibrated through the streets. Outside the walls, the titans stood in their trance. Inside, Aliatha was holding the amulet on the gate. We'd better run for it, advised Pathan, licking dry lips. I'm not leaving without Aliatha, said Roland. I'm not going without Roland, said Riga, standing next to her brother. Pathan regarded them both with exasperation and despairing fondness. I won't go anywhere without you two. Bracing himself, he added, I guess this means we're all going to die. At least we'll be together. Rika said softly, reaching out one hand to hold Pathans while her other took her brother's. We'll be safe as long as the light keeps shining, Roland was considering the matter. Pathan, you and I will run to the gate, grab Aliatha, and then head for the citadel. Then, at that moment, the gates swung open, and the starlight suddenly went off. The titans outside the walls began to stir about. Pathan tensed, waiting for the titans to surge inside and start bashing them into the ground. He waited and waited. The titans remained unmoving, sightless heads turned toward the open gate. Aliatha stood before them just inside the gate. Please, she said with the gracious gesture of an elf queen, please come inside. Pathan groaned. He exchanged glances with Roland. The two made ready to dash forward. Stop, Riga ordered, awed. Look. Quietly, humbly, reverently, the titans dropped their tree-sized clubs to the ground and began to file peacefully up the hill to the gate. The first titan to reach the gate stopped and turned its sightless head toward Aliatha. Where is the citadel? What must we do? 
Payton shut his eyes. He couldn't look. Next to him, Roland moaned in anguish. Here is the citadel, Aliatha said simply. You are home. Wounded and exhausted, Xar sought refuge inside the library. He managed to make his way that far before he collapsed onto the floor. For long moments he lay there, his body bleeding and broken, too weak to heal himself. The Lord of the Nexus had fought many powerful opponents in his long lifetime. He'd fought many dragons, but never one as strong in magic as this wingless beast of fury. But the Lord had given as good as he'd got. Light-headed, dazed with pain and loss of blood, Xar had no very clear idea what had happened to the dragon. Had he killed it? Wounded it so severely it had been forced to withdraw? He didn't know, and at this moment he didn't particularly care. The beast had disappeared. Xar must heal himself quickly before those fool mensch found him in this weakened state. The Lord of the Nexus clasped his hands together, closed the circle of his being. Warmth spread through him, sending him into the restorative sleep that would return him fully to strength and health. He very nearly succumbed to it, but an urgent voice calling to him woke him up. Swiftly he shook off the drowsiness. There was no time for sleep. In all probability the dragon was lurking somewhere, healing itself. Marit, you come to me in good time. Have you obeyed my commands? Are Haplo and the Sartan in prison? Yes, Lord, but I fear you've... you've made a terrible mistake. I've made a mistake. Exar was upright, rigid, lethal. What do you mean, daughter? I've made a mistake. Sangrax is a traitor. I overheard him plotting. He and the others of his kind are going to attack this city and destroy it. Then they plan to seal shut the final gate. Our people will be trapped. You must come. I will come, Exar said, barely able to contain his anger. I will come and deal with Haplo and this Sartan, who have obviously subverted you to their foul cause. No, Lord, I beg of you, you must believe me. Exar silenced her voice as he would silence the woman herself when he next encountered her. She was probably attempting to invade his thoughts, spy on him. This is one of Haplo's tricks, trying to lure me back into the labyrinth with these foolish tales. I will return to the labyrinth, Exar said grimly, rising to his feet, his strength renewed, far more than if he'd slept a fortnight. And both of you, my children, will be sorry to see me. But first he needed to find the mensch, particularly that elf woman who had run off with the dwarf's amulet. Exar listened, magically extending his hearing, listened for the bickering voices of the mensch, the hideous growl of the dragon. He had a difficult time hearing either at first. The irritating humming from the top of the citadel seemed louder than ever. Then, fortunately, the humming ceased. The light shut off. And then he heard the mensch, and what he heard amazed and appalled him. They were opening the gates to the titans. The idiots, the fools, the... Words failed him. Exar strode over to the solid stone wall, drew a sigil on the marble. A window appeared, as if one had existed in that wall all along. Exar was able to see the gate now, could see the mensch huddled together like the stupid sheep they were. He watched the gate open, saw the titans marching inside. Exar waited, with a certain grim anticipation, for the titans to beat the mensch to a bloody pulp. It would only serve them right though their deaths in such a manner considerably upset his plans. Still, he might be able to take advantage of the Titan's momentary distraction to make good his escape. To Exar's astonishment, the Titans walked past the four mench, not quite oblivious to them. One Titan actually picked up the human male and moved him from its path with a gentle hand, but neither paying them much attention. The giant's eyeless heads tilted upward. The light of the citadel came back on, beamed down on them, illuminated them, made them almost beautiful. The Titans were heading in Exar's direction. Their destination was the Citadel. The seven chairs, giants who could not see, who would not be affected by the mind-shattering light. The Titans were coming back to the Citadel to fulfill their destiny, whatever that might be. But most important, the gates stood open. The Titans were distracted. The dragon was nowhere around. This was Exar's chance. He left the library, moved swiftly through the building, exiting from the back, just as the Titans were entering at the front. Keeping to the side streets, Exar hastily made his way to the gate. Once it was in sight, he stopped to reconnoiter. Only seven Titans had entered the citadel. The rest remained outside, but on their faces was the same beatific expression worn by those within. The three mensch stood just inside the gate, staring in bug-eyed astonishment at the Titans. The fourth mensch, the elf woman, stood directly in Exar's path blocking the gate. His gaze focused eagerly on the blood-stained amulet she held in her hands. 
The amulet would get him past the Sartan runes onto the Sartan ship. Apparently he no longer had to worry about the Titans. The seven Titans were walking slowly and steadily, two abreast toward the Citadel. Exar took a chance, stepped out in plain sight. The Titans walked past, never noticing him. Excellent, he thought, rubbing his hands. He walked swiftly to the gate. Of course, the sight of him threw the mensch into an uproar. The human woman shrieked. The elven male yammered. The human male dashed forward to do Exar bodily harm. The Lord tossed a sigil at them as he might have tossed a bone to a pack of ravening wolves. The sigil struck them, and the mensch went very quiet, stood very still. The elven female had turned to face him. Her eyes were wide and frightened. Exar approached her, his hand outstretched. Give me the amulet, my dear, he said to her softly, and no harm will come to you. The elf's mouth opened, but no words came out. Then, drawing a deep breath, she shook her head. No. She hid the amulet behind her back. This was Druger's. I... I don't care what you do to me. You can't have it. Without it, I can't travel to the other city. Nonsense, all of it. Exar had no idea what she was talking about, didn't care. He was about to suck her dry, leave her a pile of dust, with the amulet resting safely on top, when one of the titans stepped through the gate and came to stand in front of Aliatha. You will not harm her. The voice resounded in Exar's head. She is under our protection. Certain magic, crude but immensely powerful, shone from the titan as the starlight shone from the top of the citadel. Exar could have fought the magic, but he was weak from his battle with the dragon, and besides, a fight wasn't necessary. The Lord simply chose the possibility that he was standing behind the elf woman instead of in front. She had the amulet clutched in her hands, safely, so she thought, behind her back. Exar switched places, reached out, plucked the amulet from her fingers, and hastened out the gate. Behind him he could hear the elf woman crying in dismay. The Titans paid no heed to Exar as he ran past them on his way into the jungle, on his way to the ship, and from there to the labyrinth. Poor Druger, said Riga softly. She brushed her hand across her eyes. I wish... I wish I'd been nicer to him. He was so alone. Aliatha knelt beside the body of the dwarf, holding his cold hand in her own. I feel rotten, said Peyton. But who knew? I thought he wanted to be by himself. Which of us bothered to ask, Roland said quietly, too busy thinking about ourselves. Or some machine, Pathan added beneath his breath. He cast a surreptitious glance in the direction of the star chamber. The Titans were up there now, probably sitting in those huge chairs. Doing what? The machine was dark. The starlight hadn't come on for a long time now. Yet the air quivered with tension, a good tension, a suppressed excitement. Pathan wanted more than anything to go up there and see for himself. And he would go. He wasn't afraid of the Titans any more. But he owed this to Druger. He owed a lot to Druger. And it seemed the only way he could repay him was to stand over the dwarf's body and feel wretched. He looks happy, Riga ventured. Happier than he was here with us, Pathan muttered. Come on, Aliatha, Roland said, helping her to stand. There's no need for you to cry. You were kind to him. I, I have to say I admire you for that. Aliatha turned, looked at him in astonishment. You too? So do I, Aliatha, said Riga timidly. I used to not like you very much. I thought you were weak and silly, but you're the strongest one of all of us. I want... I really want to be your friend. You're the only one of us with any eyes, Pathan added ruefully. The rest of us were as blind as the Titans. You saw Exar for what he was, and you saw Druger for what he was. Lonely, Aliatha murmured. She stared down at the dwarf. So very lonely. Aliatha, I love you, Roland said. Reaching out, he took hold of her shoulders, drew her near. And what's more, I like you. You like me? Aliatha repeated, amazed. Yes, I do, Roland flushed, uncomfortable. I didn't used to. I loved you, but I didn't like you. You were so beautiful, he said the word with contempt. Then his eyes grew warm. He smiled. Now you're... Beautiful. Aliatha was confused. She touched her hair, which was filthy, unkempt, straggling over her thin shoulders. Her face was streaked with dirt, stained with tears, her nose swollen, her eyes red. He loved her, but he hadn't liked her. Yes, she could understand that. No one had ever liked her, not even herself. 
No more games, Aletha, Roland said softly, his grip on her tightening. His gaze went to the body of the dwarf. We never know when the game's going to come to an end. No more games, Roland, she said, and rested her head against his chest. What do we do about Druger? Peyton asked after a moment's silence. His voice was husky. I don't know anything about dwarven burial customs. Take him to his people, came a titan's voice. Take him to his people, Aliatha repeated. Peyton shook his head. That'd be fine if we knew where they were, or even if they were still alive. I know, said Aliatha. Don't I? Who are you talking to, Thea? Peyton looked a little frightened. You know, came the answer. But I don't have the amulet, she said. You don't need it. Wait until the starlight shines. This way, said Aliatha confidently. Come with me. Taking off her shawl, she laid it reverently over the dwarf's body. Roland and Pathan lifted Druger. Riga went to walk at Aliatha's side. Together they entered the maze. Can I stand up now? came a peevish voice. Yes, sir, but you must hurry. The others might be back at any moment. The pile of bricks began to move. A few on top slid down, clattered to the floor. Please be quiet, sir, intoned the dragon. You could give me a hand, muttered the peevish voice, or a claw, whatever you've got available at the moment. The dragon, with a long-suffering sigh, began to sift through the rubble with a green-scaled forearm. Snagging the old man by the collar of his mouse-gray robes, now brick-reddish robes, the dragon hauled the old man up out of the ruin. You dropped that wall on me on purpose, the old man said, shaking his clenched fist. I had to, sir, the dragon answered gloomily. You were breathing. Well, of course I was breathing, the old man cried in high dudgeon. A fellow can only hold his breath so long, you know. I suppose you expected me to turn blue and pass out. A bright and happy gleam lit the dragon's eyes. Then it sighed as over something lost, gone forever. I meant, sir, that you were being obvious about your breathing. Your chest was rising and falling. At one point you even made a sound. Not a very corpse-like thing to do. Beard flew up my nose, the old man muttered. I thought I was going to sneeze. Yes, sir, said the dragon. That was when I dropped the wall on you, sir. And now, sir, if you're quite ready... Are they all right? The old man asked, peering up the hole in the wall. Will they be safe? Yes, sir. The titans are inside the citadel. The seven chosen will take their places in the seven chairs. They will begin to channel the energy up from the well, use their mental powers to beam it out into Priam and eventually through Death's Gate. The two humans and the two elves will be able to communicate with others of their kind in the other citadels. And now that the titans are back under control, the humans and the elves will be able to venture forth into the jungle. They will find others of their races and the dwarven race as well. They will lead them to safety inside these walls. And they'll live happily ever after, the old man concluded, beaming. I wouldn't go that far, sir, said the dragon, but they'll live as happily as can reasonably be expected. They will have plenty to keep them busy, particularly after they've made contact with their people on the other worlds of Arianus and Cholestra. That should give them quite a bit to think about. I'd like to stay and see that, said the old man wistfully. I'd like to see people happy, working together, building their lives in peace. I don't know why, he frowned, but I think it would help me get over these terrible dreams I have sometimes. He began to tremble. You know the dreams I mean. Horrible dreams. Dreadful fires and buildings falling and the dying. I can't help the dying. Yes, you can, Mr. Bond, said the dragon gently. He passed a clawed hand over the old man's head. You are Her Majesty's finest secret agent. Or perhaps you would rather be a certain befuddled wizard today. You were always rather fond of that one. The old man pursed his lips. Nope, no wizards. I don't want to get typecast. Very good, Mr. Bond. I think Money Penny is trying to get hold of you. She's always trying to get hold of me, the old man said with a cackle. Well, off we go. Let's be quick about it. Mustn't keep Q waiting. I believe the initial is M, sir. Whatever, the old man snapped. The two began to fade into the air, became one with the dust. The table built by the sartan lay shattered beneath the bricks and the fallen stone. Many cycles later, when Peyton, along with his wife, Riga, had become rulers of the city named Druger, the elf commanded that this chamber be sealed off. Aliatha claimed she could hear voices inside it, sad voices, talking a strange language. No one else could hear them, but since Aliatha was now high priestess of the Titans, 
and her husband was High Priest Roland, no one questioned her wisdom. The chamber was made into a memorial for a rather daft old wizard who had twice given his life for them, and whose body, so far as any of them knew, lay buried beneath the rubble. Chapter 44 Aubrey, the Labyrinth Excuse me, Haplo. Alfred's whisper drew Haplo away from an internal struggle. He looked over at the sergeant, not sorry to put his mental weapons down, turn his dark thoughts to something else, probably equally dark. Yes, what is it? Alfred cast a fearful glance at their guards, marching at their side, edged his way closer to Haplo. I, oh, dear me, where did that come from? Haplo caught hold of Alfred, kept him from walking straight into a solid rock wall. The mountain's been here a long time, Haplo said, and steered Alfred into the cavern entrance. He kept fast hold of the sarton, whose fumbling feet discovered every loose rock, every crack and fissure. The guards, after a long, frowning scrutiny, apparently decided Alfred was harmless, for they left him alone. Most of their attention was centered on Hugh the Hand. Thank you, Alfred murmured. What, what I wanted to ask, and this may sound like a stupid question, coming from you, Haplo was amused. Alfred smiled, embarrassed. What I was wondering is about this prison. I didn't think your people did that sort of thing to each other. I didn't think we did, Haplo said pointedly. Vasu, who had been walking alongside, as silent and preoccupied as Haplo himself, looked up. Only in cases of dire necessity, the headman replied gravely. Mainly for the prisoner's own good. Some of our people suffer from what we call labyrinth sickness. In the lands out beyond the walls, the sickness usually leads to death. Out beyond these walls, Haplo added grimly, a person with labyrinth sickness puts his or her entire tribe in danger. What happens to them? What do they do? Alfred asked. Haplo shrugged. Usually they go crazy and jump off a cliff, or charge a pack of wolfen alone, or drown themselves in the river. Alfred shuddered. But we have discovered that with time and patience these people can be helped, Vasu said. We keep them in a place where they are safe, where they can do no harm to themselves or to others. And that's where you're going to be putting us, Haplo said. Essentially, it's where you're putting yourselves, Vasu replied. Isn't that true? If you wanted to leave, you could do so. And bring destruction on my own people? I didn't come here to do that, Haplo replied. You could leave this human and the knife he carries behind. Haplo shook his head. No, it's my responsibility. I brought the knife in here, unknowingly, but I brought it. Between the three of us, he took in Alfred and Hugh the Hand... Maybe we can figure out how to destroy it. Vasu nodded in understanding and agreement. Hapla was silent a moment. Then he said quietly, But I won't let Ixar take me. Vasu's expression hardened. He will not take you without my consent. That I promise you. I will hear what he has to say and make my judgment accordingly. Hapla almost laughed out loud. Struggling, he maintained a straight face. You've never met Ixar, Hedman Vasu. My lord takes what he wants. He's not accustomed to being denied anything. Vasu smiled indulgently, meaning that I won't have any say in the matter. He patted his round stomach complacently. I may look soft, Haplo, but don't underestimate me. Haplo remained unconvinced that arguing would not have been polite. When the time came, he alone would have to deal with Ixar. Haplo went back to his dark inner struggle. I can't help but wonder, Hedman Vasu, this was Alfred, how exactly do you keep people imprisoned? Considering that our magic is based on possibilities, and with the vast range of possibilities for escape available... Not that I plan to try to escape, he added hastily. And if you'd prefer not to tell me, I understand. It is really quite simple, Vasu answered gravely. In the realm of possibility, there is always the possibility that there are no possibilities. Alfred's eyes glazed over. The dog nipped him on the ankle, saved him from falling into a hole. No possibilities, Alfred repeated, thinking. He shook his head, baffled. Vasu smiled. I will be happy to explain. As you must surmise, the reduction of all possibilities to no possibilities is an extremely difficult and complex spell to cast. We place the person in a small enclosed area, such as a prison cell or a dungeon. The need for such an enclosure is due to the nature of the spell, which requires that, within this area, time itself must be stopped. For only by stopping time can one stop the possibility of things occurring within time. 
it would be neither feasible nor advisable to stop time for the entire population of Aubrey. Thus we have constructed what is known as a well, a small chamber deep inside the cavern where time literally comes to a halt. A person exists within a frozen second, and during that second, so long as the magic is operative, there exists no possibility of escape. A person within the cell continues to live, but, if held for a long period, would not physically change, would not age. People suffering from labyrinth sickness are never kept in here long, just long enough for us to counsel and heal them. How ingenious, Alfred was admiring. Isn't it? Haplow remarked dryly. End of side nine. To continue, turn the cassette over. Worried and alone, Marat roamed the city streets until long after the labyrinth's grayness had darkened to night. Numerous patrons offered her hospitality, but Marat refused, regarded them warily, suspiciously. She didn't trust them, couldn't trust her own people any more. The knowledge grieved her. She felt more alone than ever. I should go to Vaso, she thought, warn him, but of what? My story sounds wild, implausible. Snakes disguised as patrons, an attack on the city, sealing shut the final gate... And why should I trust Vasu? she asked herself. Perhaps he's in league with them. I must wait for my lord. Those are my orders. And yet, and yet, guided by evil. Haplow would believe her. He was the one person who would, the one person who would know what to do. Yet to take this to him was to betray Exar's trust. I came to find my daughter. And what about that daughter, that baby she'd given up so long ago? What would happen to her, to all the daughters and the sons of the patrons, if the final gate was sealed shut? Was it possible Haplow had been telling the truth? Marit turned her steps toward the mountain dungeon. The streets were dark and silent. The patrons holed up in their dwellings to keep themselves and their families safe from the insidious evil of the labyrinth, evil whose strength increased at night. She passed the houses, the lighted windows, heard voices from inside. Families together, safe for the moment. Her steps quickened, driven by fear. Aubrey had started inside the mountain, but no patrons lived there now. The need to lurk in caves like hunted animals was over for them. Entrances into the mountain had been sealed up, a patron told her in answer to her question. Closed off, used only in time of emergency. One entrance remained open, the entrance that led to the dungeons. Marit headed for it, rehearsing what she would say to the guards, figuring how to convince them to let her see Haplow. It was only when she noticed that her arm was itching, burning, that she realized she wasn't the only one intent on entering the cavern. Marit could see the cavern entrance, a black hole against the grayer, softer darkness of night. Two patrons stood guarding it, except that they weren't patrons. No runes glowed on their skin. Marit blessed the magic for its warning. Otherwise, she would have walked right into their arms. Hiding in the shadows, she watched and listened. Four shapes converged on the cavern, the voices of the guards, soft and hissing, slid through the night. You can approach safely. No one has been around. Are the prisoners alone in there? Marit recognized Sangrax's voice. Alone and trapped in a time well, was the report. A marvelous irony, said Sangrax. By imprisoning the only people who could save them, these fool patrons will be responsible for their own destruction. We four will enter. You two stay here. Make certain we are not disturbed. I don't suppose you know where they are being held. No, we could not very well accompany them, could we? We would have been recognized. Sangrax shrugged. No matter. I will find them. I can smell the scent of warm blood even now. The false patrons laughed. Will you be long at your task? One asked. They deserve to die slowly, said another. Especially the serpent mage who murdered our king. I must make their deaths quick, unfortunately, Sangrax replied. The armies are gathering, and I need to be on hand to organize them. And you must hasten to the final gate, but do not be disappointed. We will feast on blood tomorrow, and once the final gate is sealed for all eternity. Marit reached for her dagger. The single red eye swiveled, glanced over at her. She cowered into the darkness. The red eye mesmerized her, conjured up images of death, terrible, tortured... She wanted to run and hide. Her hand fell, nerveless, from the dagger's hilt. The red eye laughed, passed on. Helpless, Marit watched the four dragon snakes enter the cave. The other two took up their positions outside. Once Sangrax had disappeared, Marit recovered. 
She had to get inside the cavern, had to get inside that magical room to warn Haplo, to free him if possible. The thought of Exar came fleetingly to her mind. If my lord were here, she reasoned, if he heard the dragon snakes as I have heard them, he would do the very same thing. Mallet lifted the sharpened stick she carried with her. The throw would be easy from this distance. As she held the crude spear in her hand, she remembered the terrible dragon snake she had seen in the waters of Chalestra. What if she only wounded one? Would it change back to its original form? She imagined the gigantic serpents wounded and thrashing about, wreaking havoc on her people. And even though I might kill both of them, how can I reach Haplo ahead of Sangrax? She was wasting time. Leave the dragon snakes for now. Her magic would take her to Haplo, as it had once before on Arianus. She drew the sigla in the air, imagined herself with Haplo. Nothing. The magic failed. Of course, she cursed bitterly. He is in a prison. He can't get out. I can't get in. Vasu, she said to herself, I must find him. He holds the key. He can take me there. And if the headman proved reluctant? Marit fingered her dagger. She'd force him to obey her. But now she had to find out where he lived, and quickly. Marit ran into the street, searching for some wakeful patron who could give her information. She hadn't gone far when she stumbled into a man, muffled in a cloak, who stepped out of the shadows. Startled, nervous, Marit fell back a pace. I must find Hedman Vasu, she said, eyeing the cloaked figure suspiciously. Don't come near me. Just tell me where he lives. You have found him, Marit, said Vasu, throwing back the hood of his cloak. She could see her glowing skin reflected in his eyes, and she saw beneath his cloak the sigla on his skin glowing. Marit clutched at him gratefully, never stopping to wonder how he came to be here. Hedman, you must take me to Haplo, right now. Certainly. Basu said. He took a step toward the cavern. No, Hedman, Marit dragged him back. We must use the magic. Haplo is in dire peril. Don't ask me to explain. You mean from the intruders? Vasu asked coolly. Marit gaped at him. I have been aware of them ever since they came. We have kept them under surveillance. I am pleased to know, he added with more gravity, the brown eyes intent on her, that you are not in league with them. Of course not. They are hideous, evil, Marit shivered. And Haplo and the others? No, Hedman, no. Haplo warned me. He warned Exar. Marit fell silent. And what of Lord Exar? Vasu asked her gently, guided by evil. Marit shook her head. Please, Hedman, there is no time. The dragon snakes are in the cave right now. They are going to kill Haplo. They will have to find him first, Vasu said. And they may discover that task more difficult than they imagine. But you are right. We should make haste. The headman gestured, and the streets Marit had thought slumbered so peacefully were suddenly alive with patrons. No wonder she hadn't seen them. They were all cloaked to hide the glowing, warning runes on their bodies. At a sign from Vasu, the patrons left their posts and began gliding stealthily toward the cavern. Vasu took hold of Marit's arm, swiftly traced a series of runes with his hand. The signal surrounded them, blue and red, and then there was darkness. Haplo lay on a pallet on the floor, gazing up into the shadows. Like the walls of the small, squarish cavern, the ceiling was covered with sigla, gleaming faintly, red and blue. That and four small burning cresset stones placed in the corners of the chamber gave the only light. Relax, boy, he said to the dog. The animal was restive and unhappy. It had been pacing about the small chamber until it began to make Haplo himself nervous. He ordered it again to settle down. The dog obeyed, relapsing by his side. But though it lay still, it kept its head up, ears pricking the sounds only it could hear. Occasionally, it would growl deep in its throat. Haplo soothed it as best he could, patting it on the head and telling it that all was fine. He wished someone would pat him on the head, tell him the same thing. Neither of his companions was much comfort. Alfred was enthralled by the chamber, by the sigla on the walls, by the spell that reduced all possibilities to a single possibility that there were no possibilities. He asked questions, gabbled on about how brilliant it all was, until Hepler wished for just one other possibility, and that was a window out of which he could throw Alfred. Eventually, thankfully, the Sartan fell asleep, and was now sprawled on his pallet, snoring softly. Hugh the Hand had not said a word. He sat bolt upright as far from the glowing wall as he could get. His left hand clasped and unclasped. Occasionally he would absent-mindedly lift his hand to his mouth as if he held his pipe. Then, remembering, he would scowl and lower his hand back to his leg where it lay clasping and unclasping. You could use the pipe, Haplow advised him. It would be a real pipe so long as nothing threatens you. 
Hugh the Hand shook his head, glowered. Never. I know what it is. If I put it in my mouth, I could taste the blood on it. Curse the day I ever saw it. Haplow lay back on his pallet. Stranded in time, he was trapped within this chamber, but his thoughts were free to roam beyond it. Not that they were doing much good. His thoughts kept traveling in the same circle, going nowhere, coming back to the beginning. Marat had betrayed him. She was going to turn him over to Exar. Haplow should have expected as much. After all, she had been sent to kill him. But if so, why hadn't she tried to kill him when she had the chance? They were even. She had saved his life. The law was satisfied, if she had ever cared about the law. Perhaps that had just been an excuse. Why the change? And Exar was coming for him now. Exar wanted him. Why? Or did it matter? Marat had betrayed him. He looked up to find Marat standing over him. Haplo, she gasped in relief. You're safe, you're safe. Haplo was on his feet, staring at her. And suddenly she was in his arms, and he was in her arms, neither with any clear idea of how it happened. The dog, not to be left out, crowded between them. He held her tightly. The questions didn't matter. None of it mattered. Not the betrayal, not whatever danger had brought her here. At that moment, Haplo could have blessed it, and he could have wished this moment frozen in time with no possibility of its ending. The signal on the walls flared and went dark. Vasu stood in the center of the room, the spell broken. Sangrax, Mallard said, and that was all she needed to say. He's here. He's coming to kill you. What? What? What's going on? Alfred was sitting up, blinking sleepily at them like an aging owl. Hugh the Hand was on his feet, poised, ready for trouble. Sangrax. Suddenly, Haplo felt extremely tired. The wound over his heart began to throb painfully. He was the one who knew about the cursed knife. Yes, Marit answered, her fingers digging into his arms. And oh, Haplo, I heard Sangrax and the other dragon snakes talking. They're going to attack the city and... Attack? Aubrey? Alfred repeated, startled. Who is Sangrax? He is one of the dragon snakes of Chalestra, Haplo said grimly. Alfred went ashen, staggered backward against the wall. How... How did those monsters get here? They entered Death's Gate, courtesy of Sama. They're in every world now, spreading chaos and evil. And they're here now, too, apparently. And preparing to attack Aubrey. Vasu couldn't believe it. He shrugged. Many have tried. Sangrax spoke of armies, Marat said urgently. They be thousands, Snogs, Kaird, and Wolfen, all our enemies, coming together, organized. They're going to attack at dawn. But first he's going to kill you, Haplo, and someone called the Serpent Mage who killed the King Dragonsnake. Haplo looked at Alfred. That wasn't me, Alfred protested. He had gone so pale he seemed almost translucent. It wasn't me. No, said Haplo. It was Corrin. Alfred shuddered, stared down miserably at his feet. His shoes appeared to be doing strange things on their own, shuffling in and out, toes and heels clattering on the stone floor. How did you find out all this? Vasu demanded. I recognized Sangrax, Marit said, uncomfortable. I knew him from someplace else. He asked me to take him to Haplo. He claimed Xar sent him to bring Haplo back. I didn't believe him. I refused to do so. And when he left me, I followed him. I overheard him talking to the others. They didn't know I was listening. Oh, yes, they did, Haplo interrupted. He had no need to use you to get to me. They wanted you to know their plans. They want our fear. They've got it, Alfred whispered unhappily. Haplo, they're on their way here, Marit said desperately. They're going to kill you. We've got to get out. Yes, said Vasu. Time for questions later. He obviously had a great many questions. I will take you. No, I don't think you will, came a hiss from the darkness. Sangrax, still in patron form, and three of his fellows appeared in the chamber walking through a wall. This will be simple, like shooting rats in a barrel. A pity I don't have time to make it more fun. I would so like to see you suffer, especially you, serpent mage. The red eye focused on Alfred, glowing malevolently. I think you have the wrong person, Alfred said meekly. I think we don't. Your disguise is as easy to penetrate as my own. Sangrax whipped around to face Vasu. Try if you like, Hetman. You won't find that your magic does you much good. Vasu stared in astonishment at the signal he had cast, burning in the air. The runes were coming unraveled, their magic dying, dwindling to meaningless wisps of smoke. 
Oh, dear, said Alfred, and slid gracefully to the floor. The dragon snakes moved in. The dog, snarling and yapping, crouched in front of Haplo and Marrot. She held her spears in her hand. Haplo had her dagger. Not that the weapons would do them much good. Weapon. Weapon. The Tatrans were moving nearer and nearer. Sangrax had chosen Haplo. The snake's hand was outstretched, reaching for the heart rune. I will finish what I began, he said. Haplo fell back, pulling Marrot and the snarling dog with him. He came up against Hugh the Hand. The sodden knife, Haplo whispered. Use it. Hugh the Hand drew forth the cursed blade, jumped in front of Haplo. Sangrax laughed, preparing to slaughter the human, then finish off the patrons. Sangrax found himself confronting a titan, wielding a tree branch for a club. Roaring, the giant struck savagely at the dragon snake. Sangrax ducked, fell back. The other snakes fought the titan, hurling spears and magic, but their magic did nothing to stop the cursed blade. Retreat, Sangrax called. He grinned wickedly at Haplo. A clever ploy, but now what will you do? Come, friends, let their own weapon finish them. The dragon snakes vanished. Hugh, call it off, Haplo cried. But in the presence of its ancient enemy, the cursed blade continued to try to kill. The titan raged around the chamber, bashing its club into walls, its sightless head sniffing them out. Sigler burned again in the air, but almost immediately dwindled and died. I feared as much, Vasu swore in frustration. The snakes have cast some type of spell in this chamber. My magic won't work. The titan rounded on them, its head swiveling in response to Vasu's voice. Don't attack, Haplo halted Marit, who was prepared to hurl her spear. If it doesn't feel threatened, perhaps it will leave us alone. I think so long as any patron remains alive, it will feel threatened, Hugh the Hand said grimly. The titan approached. Hugh the Hand ran in front of the titan, shouting at it, hoping to distract it. Haplo grabbed hold of the comatose Alfred, who was in danger of being trampled by the monster's lumbering feet, and pulled him into a corner. Vasu and Marat tried circling around the giant, planning to attack it from behind. But the titan sensed their movement. It whirled, struck. The tree branch whistled horribly, crashed into the wall behind Marit. If she had not thrown herself flat, the blow would have crushed her skull. Haplo slapped Alfred across the face. Wake up! Damn it, wake up! I need you! The dog added its help, covered Alfred's cheeks with sloppy wet licks. The titan's huge stamping feet shook the cavern. Hugh the Hand stood protectively in front of Haplo. Vasu was attempting to cast another spell and not having much success. Alfred! Haplo shook the sergeant until his teeth rattled. Alfred opened his eyes, took one terrified look at the howling titan, and, with a gentle groan, shut his eyes. No, you don't! Haplo gripped the sartan by the neck, forced him to sit upright. That's not a real titan. It's the sartan knife. There must be some sort of magic you can use to stop it. Think, damn it, or it's going to kill us all! Magic, Alfred repeated, as if this were a new and original concept. Sartan magic. Why, you're right. I believe there might be a way. He clambered unsteadily to his feet. The titan paid no attention to him. Its sightless head was fixed on the patrons. A massive hand reached down, brushed Hugh the hand to one side. The titan headed for Haplo. Alfred stepped in front of the giant. Solemnly, a comic figure in his shabby finery, his wispy hair trailing down from the bald spot on his head. He raised a trembling hand and, in a shaking voice, said, Stop! The titan vanished. On the cavern floor at Hugh's feet was the cursed blade. It quivered an instant, its sigla gleaming. Its light flared, then went out. Is it safe now? Haplow asked, staring hard at the knife. Yes, said Alfred. So long as nothing threatens Sir Hugh again. Haplow glared at him. Do you mean to tell me that you could have done that all along? Just say stop in Sarton? I suppose so. It didn't occur to me until you mentioned it. And I wasn't really certain it would work. But once I thought about it, it seemed logical to me that the knife's sartan maker would have provided the user with some means of control. And it would have, in all probability, been something simple that could be taught easily to mench. Yeah, yeah, Haplo said wearily. Save the explanation. Just teach the damn word to Hugh, will you? What does all this mean? The assassin was in no great hurry to retrieve his weapon. It means that from now on you can control the knife. It won't attack anything you don't want it to. Alfred will teach you the magic you need to know. We can leave, said Vasu, staring around the chamber. Whatever spell those creatures cast has ended. But I've never faced such power. It's far greater than my own. Who are they? What are they? Who created them? 
The Sutton? Alfred blanched. I'm afraid so. Sammer told me that he once asked the creatures that very question. Who created you? You did, Sutton, they said. Odd, remarked Haplow quietly. That's the very same answer they gave me when I asked who created you. You did, they said. What does it matter who created them? Merritt cried impatiently. They're here and they're going to attack the city. And then when it's destroyed... She shook her head, arguing with herself. I can't believe it. Surely Sangrax was bluffing. What else did they say? Haplow asked. Sangrax said he was going to seal shut the final gate. Chapter 45 Aubrey, the Labyrinth Vasu made ready to leave the caverns to prepare his people to face a dawn attack. He offered to take Hugh the hand and Alfred with him. Not that they could be of much help, but the headman wanted to keep watch on both of them. And the cursed knife. Marit should have gone with them. She could be of help. But when the headman looked in her direction, she was intently looking somewhere else and refused to catch his eye. Vasu glanced at Haplow, who was playing with the dog, also keeping his gaze averted. The headman smiled and, taking Hugh and Alfred with him, departed. Haplow and Marit were alone, not counting the dog. It flopped on its belly on the floor, hiding what might have been a grin with its nose in its paws. Marit, suddenly uneasy, seemed astonished to find that they were the only two people in the room. I guess we should go. There's a lot of work. Haplow took her in his arms. Thank you, he said, for saving my life. I did it for our people, Marit said, stiff in his grasp, still not looking at him. You know the truth about Sangrax. You're the only one. Exar, she paused, horrified. What had she been about to say? Yes, said Haplow, his grip on her tightening. I know the truth about Sangrax, and Exar does not. Is that what you were going to say, Marit? It's not his fault, she protested. Against her will and inclination, she found herself relaxing in Haplow's strong arms. They flatter him, beguile him. They don't let him see their true shape. I used to tell myself that, Haplow said softly, but I stopped believing it. Exar knows the truth. He knows they are evil. He listens to their flattery because he enjoys it. He thinks he controls them. But the more he thinks that, the more they control him. Exar's sigil burned into Marit's skin. Her hand started to touch it, rub it as one rubs a bruise to rub out the pain. She caught herself. The thought of Haplow seeing that mark turned her stomach to water. And yet she asked herself angrily, why shouldn't he see it? Why should I be ashamed? It is an honor, a great honor. He is wrong about Exar. Once my lord knows the truth about the dragon snakes. Exar is coming, she said stubbornly. Perhaps he will arrive during the battle. He will save us, his people, fight for us, as he has always fought for us. And then he will understand. He will see Sangrax for what he is. Marit pushed Haplow away, turned her back on him. She put her hand to her forehead, scratched the mark hidden beneath her thick hair. I think we should help with the defenses. Vasu will be needing us. Marit, said Haplow. I love you. The sigil on her forehead was like an iron band around her skull, tightening, constricting. Her temples throbbed. Patrons don't love, Marit said thickly, not turning around. No, we only hate, Haplow replied. Maybe if I had loved more and hated less, I wouldn't have lost you. I wouldn't have lost our child. You'll never find her, you know. Yes, I will. I have, in fact. I found her today. Marit turned, stared at him. What? How could you be certain? Haplow shrugged. I'm not. In fact, I don't suppose it was her, but it could have been. And it's because of her we'll fight, and we'll win because of her. And somehow, for her sake, we'll keep Sangrax from shutting the final gate. Marit was in his arms again, holding him fast. The circles of their beings joined to form one circle, unbroken, never-ending. Seeing that no one was likely to need a dog for a while, the animal sighed contentedly, rolled over, and went to sleep. Outside the caverns, walking the streets of Aubrey, Vasu made his preparations for war. Surrounded by a hostile environment, continually under threat if not attack, the city walls were reinforced with magic. The very roofs of the dwelling places were marked with protective runes. Very few of the labyrinth's creatures attempted to attack Aubrey. They lurked beyond the walls in the forests, waiting to ambush groups of farmers, pick off the herders. Occasionally, one of the winged beasts, dragons, griffins, the like, would take it into its head to raid within the city walls. But such an occurrence was rare. 
It was this talk of armies that worried Vasu. As Haplow had said, the monsters in the labyrinth had up until now remained largely unorganized. The Caerdon often attacked Wolfen. Wolfen were continually defending their territory against roving tiger men. Marauding dragons killed whatever looked fit to eat. But Vasu wasn't deluding himself. Such minor rivalries and disputes would be fast forgotten if a chance came to band together and invade the fortress city that had stood against them for so long. Vasu sounded the alarm, gathered the people together in the large central meeting place, and told them of their danger. The patrons took the dire news calmly, if grimly. Their silence spoke their support. Dispersed, they went about their tasks sufficiently with a minimum of talk. Weapons had to be gathered, their magic strengthened. Families parted, said goodbye briefly, without tears. Adults took up duty on the walls. Older children led younger ones into the mountain caverns, which were unsealed to receive them. Scouting parties, shrouded in black to hide the rooms that now glowed ominously, slipped out of the iron gate, ranged along the river, reinforcing the magic on the bridges, attempting to gauge the strength and disposition of the enemy. What about that damn fire? Hugh the Hand squinted up at the beacon flame. You say there are dragons around here. That will draw them like moths. It has never been doused, said Vasu. Not since the beginning. He glanced down at the gleaming sigler on his skin. I don't think it will make much difference, he added dryly. The moths are already swarming. Hugh the Hand shook his head, unconvinced. Mind if I take a look around at the rest of your defenses? I've had some experience in this sort of thing. Vasu appeared dubious. The cursed blade will be safe enough now, Alfred assured him. And Sir Hugh knows how to control it. Tomorrow, though, if there is fighting... Hugh the Hand winked. I've got an idea about that. Don't worry. Alfred sighed, gazed bleakly around the city. Well, we have done all we can, Vasu said, echoing Alfred's sigh. I, for one, am hungry. Would you like to come to my house? I am certain you are in need of food and drink. Alfred was pleased, astonished. I would be honored. As they walked through the city, Alfred noticed that no matter how busy or preoccupied, every patron they met accorded Vasu some show of respect, even if it was nothing more than a slight inclination of the head or a gesture of a hand, drawing a swift ritual friendship sigil in the air. Vasu unfailingly returned the sign with one of his own. His home was no different from any of the other patron dwellings, except that it appeared older than most and stood apart. Braced against the mountain, it was like a stalwart guard who plants his back against a secure surface to take on his foes. Vasu entered first. Alfred followed, tripping over the doorstep, but managing to catch himself before he fell face first on the floor. The dwelling was clean and neatly kept, and, like all patron homes, almost devoid of furniture. You are not mere, uh, joined? Alfred asked, seating himself awkwardly on the floor, his long legs folding beneath him with difficulty. Vasu was taking bread from a basket suspended from the ceiling. Rows of sausages, also hanging from the ceiling, brought Alfred a fond memory of Haplow's dog. No, I live alone for now, Vasu replied, adding some type of unrecognizable fruit to the simple meal. I haven't been headman very long. I inherited the position from my father, who only recently died. I am sorry for your loss, Alfred said politely. His life was one well lived, Vasu returned. We celebrate such lives, not mourn them. He placed the food on the floor, between them sat down himself. Our family has held this position for generations. Of course, any man or woman has the right to challenge us, but no one ever has. My father worked hard to govern well, govern justly. I strive as best I can to emulate his good example. It seems you are succeeding. I hope so. Fosu's troubled gaze shifted to the small window, out into the darkness. My people have never faced so great a challenge, so grave a threat. What about the final gate? Alfred asked timidly, aware that such matters were really none of his business, that he knew very little about it. Shouldn't someone be sent to warn somebody? Fosu sighed softly. The final gate is far, far from here. They would never reach it in time or alive. Alfred looked at the food, but he had very little appetite. But enough dismal talk, Vasu returned to the meal with a cheerful smile. We need the strength food offers us, and who knows when we may have time to eat again. Shall I offer the blessing, or will you? Oh, you, please, Alfred said hastily, blushing. He had no idea what a patron might consider a proper blessing. 
Vasu extended his hands, began to speak. Alfred joined in the words unconsciously, repeating them without thinking, until it occurred to him that Vasu was speaking the blessing in Sartan. Alfred's breath caught in his throat, making such a strange, half-strangled clicking noise that it caught the headman's attention. Vasu ceased the blessing in the middle, looked up. Are you all right? he asked, worried. Alfred stared wildly and confusedly at Vasu's glowing, tattooed skin. You're not. Are you? You can't be. Sartan. About half, Vasu said imperturbably. He held up his arms, gazed at the sigla with pride. Our family has adapted over the centuries. In the beginning we wore the tattoos only for disguise. Not to delude the patrons, mind you. We only wanted to fit in. Since then, through intermarriage, we have come to be able to use the magic, although not as well as a full-blooded patron. But what we lack, we compensate for by using certain magic. Intermarriage? But the hatred? Alfred thought back to the river of anger. Surely you must have been persecuted? No, said Vasu quietly. They knew why we were sent here. The vortex? Yes. We came from beneath the mountain, where we were sent because of our heretical beliefs. My ancestors opposed the sundering. They opposed the building of this prison. They were a danger, a threat to the established order. Like yourself, or so I must imagine. Although you are the first certain to arrive in the vortex in many long ages, I had hoped that things had changed. You are still here, aren't you? Alfred said quietly, pushing his food around with trembling fingers. Vasu regarded him for a long moment in silence. I suppose explanations would be too long, too complex. Not really, Alfred sighed. We sat and locked ourselves in our own prison, just as surely as we locked you in yours. Our prison walls were pride. Our iron bars were fear. Escape was impossible, for that would have meant tearing down the walls, opening up the barred gates. We dare not do that. Our prison not only kept us in, you see, it kept them out. We stayed inside and shut our eyes and went to sleep. And we've been asleep all these years. When we woke, everything had changed except us. And now our prison is the only place we know. But not you, said Vasu. Alfred blushed. I can take no credit for it, he smiled faintly. I met a man with a dog. Vasu was nodding. It would have been easy for our people, when we were first sent here, to give up and die. It was the patrons who kept us alive. They took us in, accepted us, protected us from harm until we grew strong enough to protect ourselves. Alfred was beginning to understand. And it must have been a certain idea to build this city. I think perhaps it was. Somewhere back in long-forgotten times. It would be natural for the Sartan who came from cities and liked to live in large groups. We could see the advantages gained by banding together, dwelling in one place, working to make it strong. Even back in the ancient world, the patrons were nomads, tended to be loners. The family unit was, and still is, important to them. But in the labyrinth, many families were wiped out. The patrons had to adapt or cease to survive. They did so by expanding the family unit into the tribe. The patrons learned the importance of banding together for mutual defense from the Sartan, and the Sartan learned the importance of family from the patron. The worst in both our peoples brought us to this end, Alfred spoke with emotion. The worst perpetuated it. You have taken the best and used it to build stability, find peace in the midst of chaos and terror. Let us hope, said Vasu somberly, that this is not the end. Alfred sighed, shook his head. Vasu observed him closely. The intruders called you the Serpent Mage. Now Alfred smiled, his hands fluttered. I know. I have been called that before. I don't know what it means. I do, said Vasu unexpectedly. Alfred looked up, astonished. Tell me what happened to earn you this title, Vasu said. Why, that's just it. I don't know. You think I'm being evasive, or that I don't want to help. I do. I would give anything. Let me try to explain. To make a long story short, I woke from my sleep to find myself alone. My companions had all died. I was on the air world of Arianus, a world populated by Mensch. He paused, looked at Vasu to see if he understood. Apparently he did, though he said nothing. His attentive silence encouraged Alfred to proceed. 
I was terrified. All this magical power... Alfred stared at his hands. And I was alone and afraid. If anyone discovered what I could do, they might try to take advantage. I could imagine the coercion, the pleadings, the urgings, the threats. Yet I wanted to live among the men, to be of service to them. Not that I was much help. Alfred sighed again. Anyway, I developed a most unfortunate habit. Whenever danger threatens, I faint. Vasu looked amazed. It was either that or use my magic, you see. Alfred continued, his face red. But that's not the worst. Apparently I have worked some very remarkable magic. Quite remarkable, in fact. And I don't remember doing it. I must have been fully conscious at the time, but when it's all over I haven't the slightest memory of it. Well, I guess I do. Deep inside. Alfred laid his hand on his heart. Because I feel uncomfortable whenever the matter comes up. But I swear to you, he gazed earnestly at Vasu, I can't consciously remember. What sort of magic? Vasu asked. Alfred swallowed, licked dry lips. Necromancy, he said in a low, anguished voice, barely audible. The human, Hugh the Hand, he was dead. I brought him back to life. Vasu drew in a deep breath, let it out slowly. And what else? I was told that I... I changed into a serpent, a dragon, to be exact. Haplo was in danger on Chalestra, and there were children. The dragon snakes were going to kill them. Alfred shuddered. They needed my help, but as usual I fainted. At least that's what I thought I did. Haplo tells me that I didn't. I don't know. Alfred shook his head. I just don't know. What happened? A magnificent dragon, green and gold, appeared out of nowhere and fought the snakes. The dragon destroyed the king snake. Haplo and the children were saved. The only thing I remember was waking up on the beach. Indeed, a serpent mage, Vasu said. What is a serpent mage, Hedman? Does it have anything to do with these dragon snakes? If so, how is that possible? They were unknown to the Sartan at the time of the Sundering, at least so far as I can determine. It seems odd that you, a purebred Sartan, don't know. Vasu responded, regarding Alfred with some misgiving, and that I, a half-breed, do. Not so strange, Alfred said, smiling bleakly. You have kept the fire of memory and tradition burning brightly. In our obsession with trying to put back together what we destroyed, we let our fire go out. And then I was very young when I went to sleep, and very old when I woke up. Vasu considered this in silence. Then, relaxing, he smiled. The serpent mage has nothing to do with those you call dragon snakes, although it is my guess that they have been around far longer than you credit them. Serpent mage is a title denoting ability, nothing more. At the time of the Sundering there was a hierarchy of magi among the Sartan, denoted by animal names, lynx, coyote, deer. It was very involved, complicated. Vasu's remarkable eyes were fixed on Alfred. Serpent was near the top, extraordinarily powerful. I see. Alfred was uncomfortable. I suppose there was training involved. Years of study. Of course. With that much power comes responsibility. The one thing I've never been very good at. You could be of immense help to my people, Alfred. If I don't pass out, Alfred said bitterly. But then again, you might be happier if I did. I could bring more danger to you than I'm worth. The labyrinth seems to be able to turn my magic against me. Because you're not in control of your magic, or of yourself. Take control, Alfred. Be the hero of your own life. Don't let someone else play that role. Be the hero of my own life, Alfred repeated softly. He almost laughed. It was so very ludicrous. The two men sat together in companionable silence. Outside, the black began to soften to grey. Dawn and battle approached. You are two people, Alfred, said Vasu at length. An inner person and an outer. A chasm exists between the two. Somehow you must bridge it. The two of you must meet. Alfred Montbank. Middle-aged, balding, clumsy, a coward. Corin, life-giver, a creature of power, strength, courage, the chosen. These two could never come together. They had been apart far too long. Alfred sat dejected. I think I would only fall off the bridge, he said miserably. A horn sounded, a call of warning. Vasa was on his feet. 
Will you come with me? Alfred attempted to look brave. Squaring his shoulders, he stood up and tripped over the corner of the rug. One of us will come, he said, and picked himself up with a sigh. Chapter 46 Aubrey, the Labyrinth By the grey light of dawn, it seemed to the patrons that every enemy in the labyrinth was ranged against them. Until that moment, when they looked out over the walls and stared in horrified awe, some had doubted, not believed the warnings. They thought the headman's fears exaggerated. There had been intruders in the city, but they had done no harm. A few packs of wolfen might attack, or perhaps even a legion of the hard-to-kill Caoden. Footnote. Insect-like creatures, the Caoden have a hard outer shell that is extremely difficult to penetrate even with magical weapons. A Caoden must be struck directly, die instantly, or else an attacker will find himself facing two where one stood before. End of footnote. How could such vast forces as the headman spoke of gather unobserved? The forest and the surrounding lands had been no more dangerous than normal. Now the land crawled with death. Wolfen, Caerdon, Tigermen, Snogs, and hosts of other monsters born and bred by the evil magic of the labyrinth were massed along the riverbank, their ranks rippling with activity, until it seemed that they formed another river of anger. The forest concealed the numbers hidden within, but the patrons could see the tops of the trees swaying, stirred by the movement of armies below. Dust rose from where giant trees were being felled to serve as bridges and battering rams were being made into ladders to scale the walls. And beyond the forest, the grass plains that lay fallow, ready for the planting, sprouted a hideous crop, springing up in the night like weeds that thrive on darkness. The ranks of the foe stretched to the horizon. Leading the armies were creatures never before seen in the labyrinth, huge serpents without wings or feet, grey scale, their wrinkled bodies dragging over the ground. They oozed slime that poisoned the land, the water, the air, anything they touched. Their foul smell of rot and decay was like a film of oil on the wind. The patrons could taste it on their tongues and in their throats, feel it coating their arms and hands, obscuring their vision. The red eyes of the serpents burned hot with bloodlust. Their toothless mouths gaped wide, sucking in the terror and the fear the sight of them inspired, gorging on it, growing fat and strong and powerful. One of the serpents, however, had only one eye and it scanned the top of the city walls with evil intent, as if searching for someone in particular. The dawn came, grey light shining from a source never seen, serving only to illuminate, doing little to warm or cheer. But this day the grey was brightened by a halo of blue, an aura of red. The patron's rune magic had never before gleamed so brilliantly, reacting to the powerful forces arrayed against it with power of its own. The signaler flared on the protecting wall, its light so dazzling that many standing on the riverbank, awaiting the signal to attack, were forced to shade their eyes against it. The bodies of the patrons themselves gleamed as if each individual burned with his or her own vibrant flame. Only one person stood in darkness, forlorn, almost suffocating with terror. This is hopeless. Alfred peered over the edge of the battlements. His hands, gripping the wall, shook so that fragments of rock dislodged came down in a rain of gritty dust that covered his shoes. Yes, it is hopeless, answered Haplow beside him. I am sorry I got you into this, my friend. The dog pattered back and forth nervously along the wall, whining because it couldn't see, occasionally alert and growling at the sound of a wolfen's challenging howl or a dragon snake's taunting hiss. Marrick stood next to Haplow. Her hand was twined fast in his. They looked at each other every so often, smiling, finding comfort and courage in each other's eyes. Alfred, watching them, felt that comfort include him. For the first time since he had met Haplow, Alfred saw the patron almost whole, almost at peace. He was not fully whole, not completely. The dog was with him still. Whatever had led Haplow to come back to the labyrinth had led him home, and he was content to stay here, to die here. My friend, he had said, Alfred heard the words dimly above the shrieks of the invading foe. The words kindled a small fire inside him. Am I? he asked Haplow timidly. Are you what? The conversation had moved on, at least between Haplow and Marat and Hugh the Hand. Alfred hadn't been listening to them. He'd been listening to the voice across the chasm. You're... what you said. Friend, Alfred said shyly. Did I say that? Haplow shrugged. I must have been talking to the dog, but he was smiling. You weren't, were you? Alfred said, red with pleasure. Haplow was silent. 
The armies below them hooted and howled, gibbered and cursed. Haplow's silence wrapped around Alfred like a comforting blanket. He couldn't hear the screams of death, only Haplow when he spoke. Yes, Alfred, you are my friend. Haplow held out his hand, the hand that was powerful, tattooed on the back with blue runes. Alfred extended his hand, white, shriveled with knobby wrists and thin bones, its flesh cold and clammy with fear. The two hands met, clasped, gripped each other firmly. Two people reaching across a chasm of hate. At that moment, Alfred looked inward and met himself. And he was no longer afraid. Another shrill blast of the trumpet, and the battle began. The patrons had either destroyed the bridges across the river or set magical traps on them. These obstructions halted the enemy only momentarily, were no more than a minor inconvenience. The narrow rock bridge that had cost Alfred some painful moments exploded in a flash of magic, taking out a host of the enemy who had foolishly ventured onto it. But before the last fragments had fallen down into the raging water, six logs were hauled by tusked behemoths to the river's bank. Dragons, true dragons of the labyrinth, lifted the logs with claw and with magic and dropped them down. Footnote. True dragons of the labyrinth. As opposed to the evil serpents, dragon snakes, or the good dragons of Priam, the labyrinth dragons are descendants of those of ancient earth, pre-sundering. They are hideous reptiles, large with vast wingspan, powerful in magic, and abominably evil. They do not kill a victim outright, but enjoy taking prisoners and will torment their victims for days, allowing them to die slowly. Haplow mentions elsewhere that the dragons of the labyrinth are the one creature he never fought. He ran for his life whenever he feared one was near. So far as Haplow records, Exar, Lord of the Nexus, was the only patron ever to fight a labyrinth dragon and survive. End of footnote. Legions of the dread hosts swarmed across. If any of their numbers slipped and fell into the torrent, which many did, they were abandoned to their fate. Higher up among the cliffs stood permanent bridges of stone. These the patrons left standing, but used the magic of their engraved sigla to confound the enemy, arousing an intense fear in those trying to cross, causing the ones in front to turn and flee in panic, disorganizing and stampeding those in the rear. The patrons guarding the walls were heartened by the sight, assuming that the bulk of the enemy would be unable to reach the city. Their cheering died when the enormous serpents reared up and crashed headlong into the undersection of the bridges, a part left unprotected by magic. The signal on the sides flashed wildly, but cracks spread through it, disrupting the magic, weakening it, in some cases completely destroying it. The enemy commanders rallied their troops with furious shouts. The retreat was halted. The armies of the labyrinth raced across the damaged bridges, which trembled beneath the weight, but held. By mid-morning, the sky above Aubrey was dark with the wings of dragons and griffins, gigantic bats, and leather-winged birds of prey that swooped down on the patrons from above. Hordes of Caoton, Wolfen Packs, and Tiger Men dashed across the no-man's land below. Siege towers were raised, ladders thrust up along the sides of the walls. Battering rams thundered against the iron gates. The patrons rained down magic on their foes. Spears kindled into bolts of flame. Javelins burst overhead in a shower of flesh-consuming sparks. Arrows that could not miss flew directly to the heart of the chosen victim. Smoke and magical fog obscured the sight of the monsters descending from the air. Several crashed headlong into the mountain. The magic of the rune-inscribed walls and buildings of Aubrey repelled invaders. Ladders thrown up against the walls turned from wood to water. Siege towers caught fire and burned. Iron battering rams melted, the molten metal consuming all those who stood near it. Daunted by the force and power of the patron magic, the armies of the enemy faltered and fell back. Alfred, watching from his place on the walls, began to think he'd been wrong. We're winning, he said excitedly to Haplow, who had paused to rest. No, we're not, Haplow said grimly. That was only the first wave, meant to soften us up, force us to expend our weapons. But they're retreating, Alfred protested, regrouping. And this, Haplow held out a spear, is my last. Marit's gone to find more, but she won't be successful. Archers were on their hands and knees, searching for any arrow dropped or spent. They pulled shafts out of the bodies of the dead for use against their killers. On the ground below, those too old to fight, hunched over the few remaining weapons, hastily inscribing them with sigla, replicating them with magic that was already starting to wane. And it still wouldn't be enough to hold back the foes already massing for the next attack. 
All along the battlements the patrons drew knife and sword, prepared to face the assault, which would be fought hand to hand. Marit returned, carrying two javelins and a broken spear. All I could find. May I? Alfred asked, his hand hovering over the weapons. I can replicate them. Haplow shook his head. No, your magic, remember? Who knows what these might turn into? I can't be of any help, Alfred said, discouraged. At least, Haplow observed, you didn't faint. The sergeant looked up, mildly astonished. No, I didn't, did I? Besides, I don't think it will matter at this point, Haplow said dryly. You could make spears from every branch of every tree in the forest and it wouldn't matter. The dragon snakes are leading this attack. Alfred stared over the top of the wall. His knees weakened. He very nearly lost his balance. The dog edged close, bolstering him with an encouraging lick and a wagging tail. The river of anger had frozen, probably from the magic of the serpents. Armies of creatures now marched across its solid black surface. Surrounding the city, the serpents began to fling themselves bodily at the walls. The sigla-inscribed stone shook beneath the blows. Cracks speared through the structure, small at first, then growing larger. Time and again, the serpents attacked the very bones of Aubrey. The cracks spread and began to widen, dividing the runes, weakening the magic. The patrons atop the walls fought the serpents with every weapon, every magical spell they could think to cast. But weapons struck the grey-scaled skin and bounced off harmlessly. Magic burst over the serpents, did no damage. It was afternoon. The armies of the enemy stood on the frozen river and cheered the serpents on, waited for the walls to fall. Hedman Vasu climbed up to where Haplow stood atop the wall. A shuddering blow rocked it beneath his feet. You said you once fought these creatures, Haplow. How can we stop them? Steal, Haplow yelled back. Inscribed with magic. Drive it into the head. Can you find me a sword? That would mean fighting them outside the wall, Vasu shouted. Give me a group of our people skilled with sword and dagger, Haplow urged. We would have to open the gates, Vasu said, his expression dark. Just long enough to let us out, then shut them behind us. Vasu shook his head. No, I can't permit it. You will be trapped out there. If we fail, it won't matter, Haplow returned grimly. Either we die out there or we die in here, and out there we've got a chance. I'll go with you, Marit offered. So will I, said Hugh the Hand, frustrated, eager for action. The assassin had tried fighting, but every spear he threw went wide of its mark. The arrows he shot might have been flowers for all the damage they did. You can't kill, Haplow reminded him. The hand grinned. They don't know that. You've got a point, Haplow admitted. But maybe you should stay here, protect Alfred. No, said Alfred resolutely. Sir Hugh is needed. You will all be needed. I'll be all right. You sure? Haplow regarded him intently. Alfred flushed. Haplow wasn't asking if Alfred was sure he'd be all right, but if he was sure about something else. Haplow had always been able to see through him. Well, friends could do that sort of thing. I'm sure, Alfred said, smiling. Good luck, then, Corin, Haplow said. Accompanied by the dog and Hugh the Hand, the patrons, Haplow and Marrot, left, disappearing into the fog and smoke of battle. Good luck to you, my friend, Alfred said softly. Closing his eyes, he delved into the very depths of his being, a place he had never before visited, consciously at least, and began to search among the clutter and the refuse for the words of a spell. Kari and her band of hunters volunteered to go with Haplow to fight the serpents. They armed themselves with steel, taking the time to inscribe the magic on the blades as Haplow instructed. The head of the serpent is the only vulnerable part that I know of, Haplow told them, between the eyes. No need to add what they could all see, that the serpents were powerful, that the lashing tails could batter them until their own shielding magic gave way. The enormous bodies crushed them, the gaping toothless maws devoured them. Four serpents crawled around the walls, including Sangrax. He's ours, said Haplow, exchanging glances with Marit, who nodded grim agreement. The dog barked in excitement, dashed in circles in front of the gate. The walls continued to hold, but they wouldn't much longer. Cracks spread from base to top now. The flaring light of the runes was starting to dim, and in places had gone out. Hosts of the enemy were taking advantage of the weakness to throw up ladders, begin scaling the walls. The attacking serpents occasionally knocked down their own allies, but paid little heed. Another swarm arrived to take the places of the dead. Haplow and his group stood by the gates. Our blessing on you, Vasu said, and raising his hand he gave the signal. Patrons who were guardians of the gate's magic placed their hands on the runes. The sigla flashed and darkened. The gates began to open. 
Aplow and his people dashed out rapidly, squeezing through the crack. Seeing the breach in the defences, a pack of Wolfen let out a howl and flung themselves at it. The patrons cut them down swiftly. Those few Wolfen who managed to win through were caught between the iron gates as they boomed shut. Haplow and those with him were now locked outside their own city with no way back in. The gates would not, by Haplow's own orders, open again until the serpents were dead. The magic of the patron's swords and their own bodies shone brightly. At Haplow's command, the teams separated, spread out, breaking off into small groups to challenge the serpents individually, prevent them from banding together, draw them away from the walls. The serpents mocked them, turned from their destruction to eliminate these petty nuisances and go back to the task at hand. Only Sangrax understood the danger. He shouted a warning, but it wasn't heeded. One serpent, seeing puny creatures attacking it, dove straight down upon them, intending to seize them in its jaws and fling the bodies back over the walls. Kari, flanked by three of her people, stood fast against the horror descending on her. Gripping her sword, she waited until the terrible head was right above her, then, with all her strength, she plunged the sharp blade, its magic flaming blue and red, into the reptile head. The blade bit deep, blood spurted. The serpent reared up in agony, yanked the sword from Kari's hands. Blinded by the blood that rained down on her, sickened by the foul, poisonous smell, Kari fell to the ground. The serpent's gigantic body rolled to crush her, but her people dragged her out from beneath it. The serpent's tail lashed out, would have smashed them, but its thrashings grew feeble. The serpent head crashed to the ground, just missing the wall, and lay still. The patrons cheered, their enemies cursed. The other serpents, more cautious now that one of their number had been slain, viewed their attackers with respect, making the patrons work far more dangerous. The head of the one-eyed serpent loomed over Haplow. This will be our last meeting, Sangrax, he called. True enough, patron, you have outlived your usefulness to me. Because I'm no longer afraid of you, Haplow retorted. Ah, but you should be, Sangrax returned, his snake head swiveling, trying to see Mallet and Hugh, who lurked on his blind side. As we speak, several of my kind are speeding toward the final gate with orders to seal it shut. You will be trapped here for all eternity. The people of the Nexus will fight them. But they cannot win. You cannot win. How many times have you struck me down, only to see me rise again? Sangrax's head dove for Haplow, but the move was only a feint. The serpent's tail whipped around, struck Haplow from behind. The patron's body magic protected him, or the blow would have broken his spine. The tail knocked him flat, stunned him. His sword flew from his hand. The dog stood protectively over its fallen master, teeth bared, hackles raised. The serpent ignored Haplow, however. He was down and no longer a threat. The red eye found Marit. Sangrax's jaws opened wide, swooped in for the kill. Marit stood waiting, apparently frozen with terror, making no move to defend herself. The jaws were snapping shut when a heavy weight struck the serpent on its blind side. Hugh the Hand had thrown himself bodily onto the serpent's head. Using a rune-covered patron dagger, he tried to stab into the gray scales, but the dagger broke. The hand hung on tenaciously, fingers clutching the empty eye socket. He had hoped that the cursed blade might come to life, attack this foe for him, but perhaps the serpents were controlling the knife now, as they seemed to have done in the past. Hugh could do nothing but hang on, at least hamper the serpent's attack, give Marat and Haplow time to kill it. Sangrax flailed about, shaking his head, trying to break the human's grip. Hugh the hand was strong and hung on with grim determination. Yellow lightning crackled along the serpent's gray skin. The assassin bellowed in pain. An electrical surge jolted through his body, caused him to loosen his hold in agony. He slid to the ground, but he'd bought Marat time enough to move in close. She drove her sword into Sangrax's head. The blade bit into the serpent's jaw and up into the snout, causing pain, but not killing. Mara tried to free her sword, but Sangrax flung his head up, jerked it from her blood-slick grasp. Haplow was on his feet, his sword in hand, but he was staggering, hurt and confused. Mara ran to grab his sword, his hand closed over hers. Behind me, he whispered urgently. Mara understood his plan. She crowded behind him, taking care to keep clear of his sword arm, which now dangled limply at his side. The dog danced in front, jumping into the air, snapping and taunting the serpent with shrill yelps and barks. In hideous pain, seeing his foe weak and wounded, Sangrax plunged down for the kill. Too late, he saw the shining blade lifted to meet him, 
saw the magic flare and a radiance that blinded his one good eye. He could not stop his downward momentum, but he could at least destroy the man who was about to destroy him. Marit stood up. The serpent's plunging head had narrowly missed her. She had been ready to join in the attack, but at the last moment Haplow had shoved her backward. The serpent's head smashed down, impaled itself on Haplow's blade. Gripping his sword with both hands, Haplow plunged the sword deep into Sangrax. Then both he and his dog disappeared without a cry beneath the serpent's flailing head. Around her other battles were raging. One of the serpents had slain the patrons who attacked it and was now assisting its fellow. Kari had gone to the aid of her people, fighting for their lives. Marit spared them only a glance. She could see Haplo covered with blood, his own and the serpent's. He was not moving. She ran to him, tried to lift the heavy head of the dead serpent off him. Hugh the Hand, sitting up, shaking his head muzzily, called out a warning. Marit turned. A wolfen was closing in for the kill. It leapt on her, knocked her down, claws mauling her, fangs tearing at her throat. And then suddenly it was off her. Opening her eyes, Marit had the wild impression that the wolfen was flying away backward when she realized it was being carried upward in the claws of a creature more beautiful and wonderful than anything she had ever seen in her life. A dragon, green-scaled and golden-winged, with a burnished crest that shone like a sun, flew down into the gray of the smoke-filled sky. It caught hold of the wolfen, flung the beast to its death against the sharp rocks of a cliff face. Then the dragon swooped low and snagged the dead serpent, dragged it away from Haplo. The other serpents, alarmed by the sight of this new foe, left off their battle against the patrons, turned to fight the dragon. Marat lifted Haplo in her arms. He was alive. The sigler on his skin gleamed a faint blue. But blood soaked his shirt over the heart rune. His breathing was labored and shallow. The dog, amazingly on its feet and uninjured after being buried by the serpent, trotted over to give its master an anxious lick on the cheek. Haplo opened his eyes, saw Marit. Then he saw, above her, the glistening green and flashing gold wings of the wondrous dragon. Well, well, he whispered, smiling. Alfred! Alfred! Marit gasped in astonishment, stared upward. But a shadow blocked her sight. A figure loomed over her. She couldn't tell what or who it was at first, but see nothing more than a black shape against the bright radiance cast by the dragon. Haplow's breath caught in his throat. He struggled vainly to sit up. And then a voice spoke, and then Marit knew. "'So that is your friend, Alfred,' said Exar, lord of the Nexus, peering upward. "'Truly a very powerful sergeant.' The lord's gaze shifted back down to Marit, to Haplow. "'A good thing for me he is otherwise occupied.' Chapter 47 Aubrey the Labyrinth. Exar found the city of Aubrey by the beacon fire, burning on the top of the mountain, above the smoke and mists, above the shimmer of the magic protecting the city. The beacon fire shone bright, and Exar made directly for it. He had taken his ship into the ruins of the vortex. There are advantages to traveling in a ship with sartan runes, although it had been an uncomfortable journey for the patron. Leaving Priam, he had not had time to reconstruct the sigler on the outside of the ship. He had been cautious about altering those on the inside. He knew he might very well need all his strength for whatever he faced in the labyrinth. Although not easily impressed, Exar had been appalled by the numbers of enemy forces attacking the city. Arriving at the outset of the battle, he had watched from a safe location high in the mountains near the beacon fire and its flame. Exar warmed himself by the fire as he watched the armies of chaos attack his people. He was not surprised to see the dragon snakes. He had admitted to himself that Sangrax would betray him. The seventh gate. It all had to do with the seventh gate. You know that if I find it, I will control you, he told the dragon snakes, whose grey, slime-covered bodies were launching their assault on the city walls. The day Clytus told me of the seventh gate, that was the day when you began to fear me. That was when you became my enemy. It didn't matter to Exar that Haplow had warned him of the dragon snake's treachery all along. Nothing mattered for Exar now except the seventh gate. It loomed large in his vision, blotting out everything else. His task now was to find Haplow among the thousands of patrons battling the foe. Exar was not unduly worried. Knowing men and women as he did, he was fairly certain that wherever he found Marit, and that would be easy since they were joined, he would find Haplow. Exar's only concern was that the meddlesome Sartan Alfred might interfere. The battle was taking a long time. 
The patrons defended themselves well. Exar felt a swelling of pride in his heart, his people. And once he found the seventh gate, he would raise them to glory. But he was fast losing patience. Time wasted here was time that could be used to find that very gate. He placed his hand on the sigil, was about to summon Marit, about to go down and search for Haplo himself, when he saw the city gate open, saw the small band of heroes come forth to drive away the dragon snakes. And, of course, Exar knew without bothering to look, Haplo would be among them. His last battle with Sangrax had ended in a draw. Each had given and taken wounds that would not heal. Haplo would not miss this opportunity to finish off his enemy, despite the odds against him. Of course you won't, Exar said, observing the duel with interest and approval. You are my son. The Lord waited until the battle was ended and Sangrax destroyed, and then Exar called on the rune magic to lift him up and carry him down to the bloody ground below. Marit's first reaction on seeing Exar was one of vast relief. Here was the strong father who would, once again, defend, protect, and succor his children. My Lord, you have come to aid us. Haplo tried to sit up, but he was extremely weak and in pain. Blood soaked his shirt front, and even stained the leather vest he wore over it. He felt the jagged edges of broken bones grind together. Any movement at all was sheer agony. Marit helped him, lending him her strength, her support. She looked up to find Exar's eyes dark on her, but she was too battle-dazed, too elated by his presence to notice the shadow he cast over them. My lord, Haplo's voice was weak. Exar had to kneel beside him to hear him. We can hold our own here. The gravest threat, the greatest danger is at the final gate. The dragon snakes plan to seal it shut. We... He choked, coughed. We will be trapped in this prison house, Lord, Marit continued urgently. Its evil will grow. The dragon snakes will see to that. The labyrinth will become a death chamber without hope, for there will be no way to escape. You are the only one of us who can reach the final gate in time, Lord, Haplo said, every word costing him obvious pain. You are the only one who can stop them. He sank back into Marit's arms. Her face was near his, her anxiety and concern for him obvious. The three paid no heed to the battle raging around them. Exar's magic enclosed them in a cocoon of safety and silence, protected them from death and the turmoil of war. Exar's gaze turned, his eyes searched far, far into the distance, until he could see the final gate from where they stood, which with his magical power was within the realm of possibility. His face grew drawn and grave, the brows came together, the eyes narrowed in anger. He was seeing, Marit guessed, the terrible battle being waged, the people of the Nexus leaving their peaceful homes to defend the only means of escape for their brethren caught inside. Was the battle already taking place, or was Exar seeing the future? His gaze came back, and the eyes were hard and cold and calculating. The final gates will fall, but I will open it again. When I have found the seventh gate, then I will take my revenge. Lord Exar, what do you mean? Marit stared at him, not understanding. Lord, do not worry about us. We will manage here. You must save our people. I intend to do so, wife, Exar said curtly. Marit flinched. Haplo heard the word, felt the quiver run through the arms whose touch was so comforting, so welcome. He opened his eyes, looked up at her. Her face was streaked with blood, his own, her own, the dragon snakes. Her hair was disheveled, and now he could see on her forehead the mark, the entwined sigla, hers and Exar's. Leave him to me, wife, Exar commanded. Marit shook her head, crouched over Haplo protectively. Exar reached down, laid his hand on her shoulder. She cried out and slumped to the ground, her body limp, its rune magic disrupted. Exar turned to Haplo. Don't fight me, my son. Let go, let go of the pain, of the despair, the heartache of this life. The Lord of the Nexus slid his arms beneath Haplo's broken body. Haplo made a feeble attempt to free himself. The dog dashed up, barked at Exar frantically. I know I cannot hurt the animal, Exar said coldly, but I can hurt her. Marit curled up, helpless, moaned and shook her head. The sigil on her forehead blazed like fire. Dog, stop, Haplo whispered through ashen lips. The dog, whining, not understanding but trained to obey fell back. Exar lifted Haplo in his arms as easily and tenderly as if he were a small injured child. Rise, wife, he said to Marit. When I am gone, you will need to defend yourself. The magic that held her paralyzed released her. Weak, Marit stood up. She took a step nearer Exar, nearer Haplo. Where are you taking him, Lord? 
she asked, hope fighting a final struggle in her heart. To the Nexus? The final gate? No, wife. Exar's voice was cold. I returned to Abarach. He looked with satisfaction on Haplo. To the necromancy. How can you let this evil happen to your people, Lord? She cried in anger. Exar's eyes flared. They have suffered all their lives. What is one more day or two or three? When I come back in triumph, when the seventh gate is open, their suffering will end. It will be too late. The words were on her lips, but she looked into Exar's eyes and dared not say them. Catching hold of Haplo's hand, she pressed it against her own heart rune. I love you, she said to him. His eyes opened. Find Alfred. He spoke without a voice, his lips moving, stained with his own blood. Alfred can stop them. Yes, find the Sarton, Exar sneered. I'm certain he will be more than happy to defend the prison his kind built. The Lord spoke the runes, a sigil formed in the air. The flaring rune struck Marit, slashed across her forehead. The pain seared through her as if he'd cut her with a knife. Blood flowed down over her eyes, blinding her. Gasping, dizzy with the agony and the shock, she fell to her knees. Exar, my lord, she cried wildly, wiping the blood from her eyes. Exar ignored her. Bearing Haplo in his arms, the lord walked calmly across the field of battle. A shield of magic surrounded them, protected them. Trotting along behind, unnoticed and forlorn, was the dog. Marit sprang to her feet with some desperate notion of stopping them, attacking Exar from behind, rescuing Haplo. But at that moment, a whirlwind of Sigler spun about them, all three of them, including the dog. And all three were gone. Chapter 48 Aubrey, the Labyrinth The battle came to an end with the evening. The dragon snakes were vanquished, destroyed. They no longer threatened to breach the walls. The wondrous green dragon, the likes of which no one had ever before seen in the labyrinth, joined with the patrons to defeat the serpents. The walls held, their magic swiftly reinforced. The gate stood fast. Hugh the Hand was the last one through before it shut. He bore Kari in his arms. He had found her lying wounded beneath a score of dead Caodon. He carried her inside the gate, gave her into the arms of her people. Where are Haplo and Marit? the Hand demanded. Vasu, directing the renewing of the gate's magic, looked at him in sudden consternation. I thought they were with you. They haven't come in here? No, they haven't, and I've been here the entire time. Open the gate again, Hugh ordered. They must still be out there. Open it, Vasu commanded his people. I will come with you. Hugh the hand, glancing at the pudgy headman, was about to protest, but then remembered that he could not kill. The gate swung open. The two men ran out into a host of the enemy. But with their leaders dead, the lust for battle seemed to have drained from the foe. Many were beating a retreat across the river, and these were creating confusion among the ranks. There! Hugh the hand pointed. Hurt and bewildered, Marit was wandering alone near the base of the wall. A pack of wolfen, drawn by the scent of blood, were tracking her. Vasu began to sing in a deep baritone. Hugh the hand decided the man had gone mad. This was no time for an aria. But suddenly an enormous bush with long spearing thorns thrust up out of the ground surrounded the wolfen. Thorns caught their thick fur, held them fast. Supple branches wrapped around their paws. The wolfen howled and shrieked, but the more they fought to escape, the more entangled they became. Marat did not even notice. Vasu continued singing. The thorns grew deeper, denser. Above, Patrons waited until Marat was safe to finish off the wolfen trapped in the bush. Hugh the hand ran to her, caught hold of her. Where is Haplo? She stared at him from eyes almost gummed shut by clotted blood. Either she couldn't see him clearly, or she didn't recognize him. Alfred, she said to him and Patron, I must find Alfred. Where is Haplo? Hugh repeated in human, frustrated. Alfred, Marit spoke the name over and over. Hugh saw that he would get nothing from her in her dazed condition. He swept her up in his arms and ran back to Vasu. The headman sheltered them in his magic until they had safely reached the gate. When night fell, the beacon fire still burned bright. The magic of the sigla on the walls glimmered and flickered, but their light continued to shine. The last of the foes slunk off into the wilderness, leaving their dead behind. The elders, who had spent the day inscribing the weapons with death-dealing runes, now spent the night restoring life to those injured and dying. Marit's head wound was not life-threatening, but the healers could not heal it completely. Whatever weapon had torn her flesh must have been poisoned, they told Hugh the Hand when they showed him the raw and inflamed mark on her skin. 
but at least Marat was conscious, far too conscious as far as the healers were concerned. They had difficulty keeping her in her bed. She kept demanding to see Vasu, and at last they sent for him, since nothing else would calm her. The headman came, exhausted, grieving. The city of Arbury stood, but many had given their lives, including Kari, including someone Vasu dreaded to name, especially to the woman who watched him draw near her sickbed. Alfred, Marit said immediately, where is he? None of these fools knows or will tell me. I must find him. He can reach the final gate in time to fight the dragon snakes. He can save our people. Patrons could not lie to each other, and Vasu was patron enough to know that she would see through his deceit, no matter how kindly meant. He is a serpent mage. He changed into dragon form. I know all that, Marit snapped impatiently. Surely he has changed back by now. Take me to him. He did not return, Vasu said. The life drained from Marit's eyes. What do you mean? He fell from the skies, perhaps mortally wounded. He'd been fighting a legion of dragons. Perhaps. Marit grabbed the word, clung to it. You didn't see him die. You don't know if he's dead. Marit, we saw him fall. She rose from her bed, shoving aside the restraining hands of the healers. Show me where. You can't go out there, Basu said sternly. It's too dangerous. There are roving bands of wolfen and tiger men, furious at their defeat, waiting to catch one of us alone. The human assassin. Where is he? Here, Marit. Hugh the Hand stood up. He had been watching by her bedside, unseen, unnoticed. I'll go with you. I need to find Alfred myself, he added grimly. He is our only hope, Marit said. Her eyes glimmered with tears for a moment. He is Haplo's only hope. She blinked the tears away and reached for her weapons, which the healers had set aside. Vasu did not ask what she meant. Exar's magic had not blinded the headman's eyes. He had seen the lord of the Nexus had witnessed the meeting of the three. He had seen Exar leave with Haplo and the dog. He had guessed that the lord of the Nexus was not traveling to the battle of the final gate. Let her go, he said to the healers. They stood aside. Vasu led Marat and Hugh the hand to the wall. He pointed out to them where he had seen the dragon, flaming green and gold, fall from the sky. He opened the gate of Arbury and saw them depart into the darkness. Then he stood for long, long hours until the dawn, watching in despair a sullen red glow that lit the horizon in the direction of the final gate. Appendix 1 The Accursed Blade Speculations Footnote Written by Alfred Montbeck sometime during his sojourn in the labyrinth. End of footnote. Of all the unfortunate things my people did just before the sundering, the development of a weapon such as this cursed knife, now in the possession of Sir Hugh, is one of the most deplorable. Here is evidence that we involved innocent people, humans, elves, dwarves, the very people we were supposed to be protecting in our battle against the patrons. That the blade was intended for use by the mensch is beyond doubt. I have examined it, examined the runes inscribed on it, and I am convinced. It was crafted in haste. That much is obvious from its crude design and manufacture, and therefore, most probably, the blades were turned out in large quantities. Were Samer and the council members so terrified of the patrons that they armed entire legions of mensch with these heinous weapons? I can only suppose that the answer is, sadly, yes. Yet nowhere have I read that any wars involving mensch took place in the final days of pre-sundering earth. Such battles as did occur between patron and Sartan were generally fought on an individual basis, terrible tourneys of magic which invariably proved fatal to one or both combatants. But from information about those last days obtained from my dear Orla, I think I can speculate on what happened. Consumed by fear, terrified that the patrons were forming their own armies, this may or may not have been the case, Samer and the council decided to prepare a defense, armed vast numbers of mensch with these magical weapons. I doubt they meant to send the Mensch to war. For one thing, Sama wouldn't trust them. Most likely, the Mensch armies were to be used as cover to fight a delaying action, allowing the Sardan time to enter the Seventh Gate and proceed with the Sundering. Such a battle apparently never took place. Perhaps the Mensch revolted, I hope so. Or perhaps even Sama felt some twinges of conscience over forcing others to fight his battles for him. Apparently, most of the cursed weapons were either destroyed in the Sundering or confiscated by the Sartan before establishing the Mensch on the New Worlds. How did this one escape? It undoubtedly fell into the hands of an unscrupulous elf, 
who, impressed by the weapon's power, decided to keep it for himself. The blade itself would be a willing ally, eager to assist in its own survival. The elf was trained in the blade's use, but due to circumstance, perhaps his untimely death, such information was not passed along to future generations. Only the blade was handed down. The elf could have no idea he was passing on such a deadly legacy. How does the blade work? The following are my speculations based on Hughes and Haplow's accounts of the blade in action, and my own study of the sigler inscribed on the weapon. An interesting point. In enhancing the weapon with rune magic, we Sarton did exactly what we had always claimed we despised the patrons for doing, giving life to that which is not meant to have it. 1. The first action the blade takes is to block the enemy's ability to sense danger. Thus Haplow had no warning that Hugh the Hand was stalking him in the factory, never knew that the assassin was waiting in ambush on the ship. 2. The blade's second action reduces an enemy's possibilities of retaliation. The blade cannot eliminate all possibilities, that would take far greater power than the blade possesses, but it can and does limit the choice of options to those it can easily handle. 3. The blade's third action analyzes both the enemy's strength and weakness, and reacts accordingly. Sometimes this reaction is a very simple one for the blade to perform, as in the unfortunate fight between the two elf brothers. The blade, facing a dueling dagger, had only to turn itself into a sword to kill its foe. When Hugh the Hand first encountered Haplow, the blade changed itself to an axe against Haplow's knife. Notice, however, that when the blade encounters additional opponents, its strength increases. The blade became a bat when attacking both Marat and Haplow. When this attack failed, the blade turned into a titan. Also of interest is the fact that the blade appears to draw on the memories and thoughts of the victims. Haplow says that he does not recall thinking specifically of titans during the brief stop their ship made in Priam. Admittedly, he did have a great deal on his mind. But it seems logical to me that he must have at least had the giants he encountered on that world in his subconscious. And that is all I have been able to determine about the blade so far. As to any further speculations, I would have to see the blade in action, something I'd rather not do, to be able to provide additional information on it. I take this moment to add some information that I have acquired on the cursed blade. Footnote. This last is written in an agitated style, from which we must conclude that Alfred probably recorded this information just before the siege of Arbury. End of footnote. The first bit of information is good. The blade can be controlled by the user. All one has to do is to say the word stop in Sarton. End of side 10. To continue, change side selector switch and turn the cassette over. The second piece of information is very bad. Apparently the blade can also be controlled by outside forces. I have evidence that the dragon snakes are able to wield some sort of influence over it. The weapon was created out of fear, designed to kill, and so it would naturally be drawn to the dragon snakes. They, in turn, appear to be able to control the blade's magic. They cannot, it seems, cause the blade to turn against its user, but the snakes can direct the blade's actions and reactions to suit their own purposes. Haplow thinks now that it was the cursed blade that brought the tiger men down on it, and the blade apparently issued some sort of call to the dragon snakes, alerting them to its presence in Aubrey. There must be some way to destroy this weapon. Unfortunately, I can't think of any at the moment, but then my mind is rather flurried. Perhaps if I had time to reflect and study the matter further. Editor's note. Here the text ends. Appendix 2. The Star Chambers of Priam. Being excerpts from The Book of Stars, as written by Pathan, Lord Master of Druger Citadel, who has edited and amended the text. Footnote. I am indebted to the Titans and to my sister Aliatha for the translation of Sartan runes. End of footnote. May the reader enjoy the enlightenment of the stars. Eye of Suns. Footnote. A phrase peculiar to the Sartan which means a perspective from on high, or in this case, an overview. End of footnote. Priam is a world of power. It keeps the other worlds beyond our own operating. Its heartbeat brings the lifeblood of power, heat, and light to these sundered realms. Without the power of the stars that shine above our home and the strength of our light, worlds beyond our understanding only sleep, half dead from lack of nourishment. 
Prime stationary suns keep all of their life-giving power within the confines of the world's vast interior. The sun's light brings life to the world's inhabitants, yet this important function is but a portion of its true purpose of creation. The light of Priam's suns, which originates from four separate celestial bodies rather than the single sun perceived by us from our distant ground, is transferred either directly or indirectly into the rock that is the foundation of the world. I myself have seen this very rock, and affirm that it does in fact exist. Footnote. Payton adds this for those who live on the high surface of Priam. There the ground consists of the tops of immense trees, whose roots remain unknown to those who are born, live, and die in their boughs. End of footnote. This rock foundation then collects the energy generated by the suns and forests above it, and stores it in ever-increasing amounts deep within its stone. The energy is then collected by the citadel, whose roots sink deep into the foundations of Priam. These roots radiate energy from the citadel and store it in the well, known as the well of the world. Only the cap of the world gem holds this energy in place. Footnote. Well of the world and world gem, in addition to many other fanciful names in the text, are undoubtedly Payton's constructions. While they do reflect his romantic nature, they are not necessarily instructive in terms of the function of the machine itself. The term world gem, however, may be a mensch rendering of the Sartan Aort Batu Rune. Aort signifies life and power, a cross structure in magic that bridged fire and water magics. Batu would refer to the concept of foundation rather than a crystalline stone. If this is the case, then this world gem is the focal point of a life or power wave, probably the emissions from the well. End of footnote. General Structure and Motion The Star Chamber's lower area houses seven thrones, which surround and face the well of the world. These thrones are immense, so the Titans may sit comfortably in them. The presence of the Titans is essential for the operation of the machine. The throne chamber is separated from the chamber above by a framework and the mechanism for the star machine. This second chamber is enclosed by a huge dome formed of several curved panels to resemble the petals of a lotus blossom. Each panel is made up of colored glass mounted in a lattice work of metal. The glass is inscribed with sardin runes, which, according to the Titans, channel the light into the star machine. When the machine is operating, the panels open fully to shine forth its power. The star machine itself has two major parts, the lower clockworks called the stellar clock, and the upper known as the conduit clock. Both sections of the mechanism are suspended by mobile mountings over the seven thrones. The world gem is held at the end of the lift arm, suspended from the stellar clock down into the well of the world, which is located in the floor. The world gem seals the well of the world. A gigantic arching metal arm ending in a metal hand grips the gem and holds it in place while the machine is dormant. This extends downward from a retraction mechanism that pulls the world gem out of the well when conditions merit. Footnote. I am still not sure just what these conditions might be. End of footnote. The arm itself is retracted into a spatial fold, a marvelous magic sphere. The stellar clock is cradled inside two opposing mounted rings, which are in turn set on a massive swivel mount. The retracted world gem and the two rings surrounding it can be positioned in any configuration. The major mounting for the stellar clock is called the alignment rotation ring. Footnote. This is a direct translation of the Sartan rune structure. I'm not sure what it means. I feel like a child examining with wonder the workings of my father's old watch and trying to understand how it operates. End of footnote. This is a rotating mount which can turn the entire lower clockwork around the axis of the well. An alignment clock, which is driven by the primary orientation clock and sequenced independently by Babbage difference engines, turns the alignment rotation ring and with it the stellar clock. Footnote. Babbage difference engines. This again is a direct translation from the runes. End of footnote. Inside the alignment rotation ring is mounted the diffusion ring. An amazing number of gears, rods, and cams are positioned along this arc. They swivel and otherwise adjust the orientation of convex mirrors, prisms, and gems, which all find their focal point on the stellar clock. As with the alignment rotation ring, the diffusion ring can be tilted by the diffusion clock drive, which appears to operate on the same principles as the alignment clock. 
A third ring is mounted inside the diffusion ring and is called the combinant ring. This ring, too, is fitted with a vast number of gears, screws, and clockworks which support concave mirrors, prisms, and gems. It, too, focuses on the stellar clock. Its name implies the combining of force and would seem to act counter to the diffusion ring around it. Perhaps these two, the diffusion ring and the combinant ring, act to cancel each other out and keep forces balanced. Footnote. On the other hand, it could be that the diffusion ring separates the power drawn up from the roots of the world into more basic wave forms and narrower spectra of energy, which would then be recombined selectively through the combinant ring. End of footnote. The upper alignment ring is the foundation mount for the conduit clock. Like the alignment rotation ring, the upper alignment ring also rotates around the axis of the well of the world being driven by the primary orientation clock. Footnote. I find no drive or power mechanism for this clockwork, which normally would have a weight and pendulum arrangement. I surmise that within the mechanism itself is some means of gaining energy from the stream of force coming from the well of the world. In fact, I suspect that this is the purpose of the diffusion field collector shown in the drawing. End of footnote. It is this clockwork which seems to provide the power for the rest of the device as well. The primary orientation clock is mounted on a great curving frame that can be rotated by the upper orientation ring. Near the top of this frame is set the secondary orientation clock, which traverses the upper curve of the frame via a screw device. This primary orientation clock and secondary orientation clock then positions the fork and rings of the conduit clock into alignment with spindles mounted below it. Footnote. According to the Titans, these conduits link the sundered realms to each other. End of footnote. These conduit spindles apparently interact with the power generated in the lower mechanism in order to be transferred to the other realms. The Machine in Motion I have not been present when the machine is in full motion, for the light in the room is so bright as to blind the viewer. Only the Titans can withstand that light, and they cannot give sufficient description. Still, I have witnessed the earlier stages of the process. Energy build-up in the well triggers the mechanism into action. The energy is then carried up the lift arm and sets the machine in motion. This is the beginning of the cycle. As the machine begins to move, the alignment rotation drive turns the alignment rotation ring, the diffusion ring, and the combinant ring. The mirrors of both lower rings and the stellar clock begin to rotate into position. Gems and prisms flash as they orient themselves. The lift arm begins to raise the world gem out of the well and into the stellar clock. A powerful, throbbing light issues from the well of the world as the gem rises higher into the machine. The conduit clock also begins to move, shifting the position of its rings and spindles. I have noticed that this orientation differs each time the motion begins, and is never exactly repeated. During this process, the lotus blossom sections of the dome start to open. It is at this point that the world gem is set into the center of the stellar clock, and the entire chamber is filled with such brilliant light that further observation is impossible. It is this light that we used to believe were the stars. In closing, the Titans now operate the star chamber. Its powerful light radiates from the tallest spire of our city. Darkness, too, still comes to our city regularly in each cycle, yet even through the darkness this light shines. Across the heavens we view the constant light of a thousand stars. The citadel was built by those who are now gone. We see our purpose here as a sacred trust to add our light to those that shine in the sky. Someday, others in far distant worlds may see that light and find their way home. Reader's Note Performance Notes for Kixie Winsy End of Note Set your synthesizer for a dark, sonorous sound. French horns, an octave below their normal range, a contrabass bassoon, or something akin to atmospheres on a Kurzweil until measure 39. The Geg march begins in the left hand. The Wells hymn weaves against it in the upper register. Change the voicing to brighter sounds, such as cello and recorder. Return to the deeper voice you used initially at measure 74 to finish. The special effects are designated by using shaped notes, one to a sound. They appear on specific staff lines and spaces. Wind is always a whole note, often tied to another, on G2, the second G above middle C. The following are descriptions of sounds in the score. Wind. Always crescendo to decrescendo, panning from one speaker to the other. Appears as a whole note, G2. Thunder. 
begins and ends in distance as a rumble, approaches quickly, by measure 13 should be a sharp crack, appears as an oblique diamond on F2 or G2. Rain, hard drops on metal, use hard mallets on a metal bar or heavy box, appears as text below third staff. Metallic moan, protesting shriek, as if a large machine is reluctantly starting, appears as X of five dots on C2. Whistle, shrill, suddenly released, appears as a small S on A1. Whirr, similar to a dentist's drill in the middle range, appears as a comma on F1. Scrape, use a ratchet or a metal file or grater against something hard, appears as an oblique nine on E1, usually held for two beats. Balloon, let air escape from partially stretched neck, more fft than a whistle. Or get someone good at making raspberries or Bronx cheers. If you opt for the latter, stay out of the performer's way. This could get damp. Appears as an elongated O on B1. Clank. Use the type of metal kitchen bowl with an attached metal hanger. It produces a secondary sound. Strike with wooden dowel, a drumstick, or gently with the side of a hammer or hard rubber mallet. Appears as a flower. Ziz. Electricity running up a Jacob's ladder. Appears as a point-down triangle on either D2 or E2. Thump. An occasional unexplainable sound. Should be ominous and hollow, therefore used sparingly. Appears as a square on B1. Hum. Starts in measure 26, continues throughout piece, fading into background at end. Similar to a large electrical generator. Appears as text under third staff. Factory sounds. Some synthesizers come equipped with mechanical background noises. On a Kurzweil, it's called Alien Factory. Use these or come up with your own. Begins in measure 26, along with the hum, and runs for length of piece. Appears as text beneath third staff. Now, get a group together, follow the cues, approximately, and have fun. <laughs>